Tan Tor Audio, a division of recorded books, presents The Emissary, a first contact novel by Michael J. Edwards, narrated by Allison Ewing. 1. The aliens arrived on a Tuesday morning during rush hour. A fireball came hurtling, meteor-like, out of the heavens toward the city, eventually revealing itself to be a stubby-winged space plane, drawing great, swooping arcs in the sky to throw off speed. It soared low over the Great Seawall and the Marina Bay Golf Course, and lowered still over the Bay Bridges before finally plunging into Marina Bay in the middle of Singapore's downtown district, where it disappeared in an eruption of steam and water. A few minutes later, a white ellipsoid object bobbed to the surface and casually made its way to the dock at Singapore's National Stadium Square. All of this Holly witnessed from the balcony of the hotel suite she and her dad were staying in. A window-rattling boom had brought her to her feet, and she had gripped the railing with both hands as the fireball fell toward her. Even when it became obvious that it was a spaceship or a space plane, it still looked like it was going to plow right into the hotel. Then it plunged into the bay a couple of kilometers away. It was a miracle it had come down in the bay. A couple hundred meters in any direction would have caused a lot of damage, not to mention lives. Satellites sometimes fell out of orbit, but this didn't look like a satellite. It looked like a space plane. Only a few nations had space planes, so whose was it? She went inside and said, Room, play SNN. The wall screen lit up with an image of the bay littered with swamped watercraft. Inner Marina Bay was a popular boating place. The view zoomed in on the teardrop-shaped object floating in the water next to the National Stadium. The Chiron scrolling across the bottom of the screen read, SNN Breaking News, Unidentified Spacecraft, Lands in Downtown Singapore. Had she not seen it for herself, Holly would have thought it was a joke or that somebody had hacked the SNN feed, but she had seen it for herself. The familiar voice of SNN senior presenter John Hong said, The unidentified craft plunged into Singapore's Marina Bay just minutes ago, causing a mini-tsunami that swamped watercraft and inundated streets and parks around the bay. As you can see, it is now floating alongside the dock at National Stadium Square. We are getting eyewitness reports claiming it had stubby wings when it came down, though I don't see any. We are also hearing that the two box-like objects and what looks like an antenna appeared after it came to a rest at the dock. Holly rummaged through a suitcase until she found her dad's binoculars and returned to the balcony. It took a moment to find the craft and bring it into focus. Then it sprang large into view. Goosebumps climbed up her arms. It was the size of one of those mega-yachts you could see docked at the New Auckland Yacht Club, the ones that never seemed to go anywhere. Its smooth white surface showed no signs of a fiery ride through the atmosphere. Black, crenellated ridges ran along its sides at the waterline. Holly Margaret Burton, her dad's voice broke into the moment. Do not lean over the railing. You know better than that. He had come out of the bathroom with a towel wrapped around his waist, drying his hair with another. There's a spaceship in the bay, she said. What? He looked at the vid screen. We are getting reports that the Americans and the Chinese both picked up the unidentified craft on radar shortly after it entered the atmosphere, according to... A female voice broke in. John, we have just learned that the Russians and the Australians also tracked it. Nobody seems to know where it came from, but a consensus is forming that it may be from another world. My God, this is really happening. It does seem that way. Gentle persons, we may be looking at a visitor from another world. I... I don't know what to say. Her dad joined her on the balcony. She handed him the binoculars, and he brought them to his eyes. A minute later, he handed them back and returned to the room, 
where he sank onto the couch and stared at the image on the vid screen. John Hong said, We have confirmation from several sources that government authorities are viewing this as a possible alien spacecraft. Holly followed him in and said, Can we go down and see it? His head snapped up. No! I mean, they will be blocking off access to the bay. He walked out onto the deck again and stood there, not looking at anything as far as she could tell. When he turned toward her, his face bore a somber expression. Do you know what this means? he said. Uh, first contact? And us at ground zero to see it? She giggled, which was embarrassing. She sounded like an overexcited fifteen-year-old kid, which, of course, she was, and being the youngest student at the University of New Auckland didn't change that. He took a moment to respond. If it is, in fact, an alien visitor, which we don't know for sure, then yes, we are witnessing first contact with an alien species. And if that is true, it means the fate of the human race will probably be decided in the next few days, maybe the next few hours. She frowned. Whatever she might have expected him to say, that wasn't it. Other than the occasional sci-fi vid, she hadn't thought much about alien visitations. She knew about SETI, of course, and she knew that astronomers had found thousands of exoplanets, some of which were the right size and at the right distance from their sun to support life, and she had always assumed there must be other intelligent life out there. But she had never stopped to ask herself what it would mean for them to actually show up. Now, suddenly, they were here. Is this the beginning of an invasion? she asked. What? No, of course not. He came back into the room and began pacing back and forth. At least, not in the sense you're thinking. I mean, I suppose it could be an invasion. Any species that can travel between the stars is going to be more than capable of conquering us or destroying us or putting us in zoos or anything else they want to do. But that's not what I mean. He pursed his lips, which meant he was about to launch into teaching mode. He said, let's assume, for the sake of discussion, that these really are visitors from another world and that they are benevolent. I say benevolent because if they are not benevolent, there isn't much to talk about. We would just have to wait and see what they decide to do about us. Okay, I'll go with benevolent aliens. Now, in our own history, what happens when a more advanced civilization encounters a less advanced civilization? Yep, teaching mode. He often engaged her in discussions about... Well, just about anything. He was a knowledge omnivore, and was determined to make her one, too. Uh, bad things happen to the less advanced one? Exactly. New Zealand's Maoris are a good example, as are the indigenous peoples of pretty much every place Europeans went. But in this case, we are the less advanced civilization. See the problem? She did now that he had pointed it out. Even if the aliens were benevolent, their appearance would inevitably change everything, and not necessarily in a good way. If this is a first contact scenario, he said, I am encouraged by the unthreatening nature of the spaceship they sent for first contact. It's small and innocuous looking, probably unmanned, much less alarming than, say, a fleet of warships appearing in the skies overhead. He grabbed two bottles of water from the mini-fridge and tossed one to her. Then he sat down again, his elbows resting on his knees, so he could stare at an invisible spot on the carpet. Holly waited. The biggest question is not their reaction to us, but our reaction to them. Humans do not deal well with the unknown, especially if they perceive it as a threat— and the arrival of an alien spaceship is, by its very nature, threatening. It will frighten people, and frightened people are unpredictable people. As if on cue, the balcony slider door rattled as jets thundered overhead. She and her dad returned to the balcony, 
and watched three military jets in formation make a wide sweep around the bay. Missiles hung from their wings. Two military helicopters held position over the bay. They had rocket launchers. Her dad was right. It was not the aliens they had to worry about. It was the humans. The aliens took control of three communication satellites and over the next two days broadcast a message every hour in Chinese, Spanish, and English. It was brief. An invitation is extended to the following leaders to come to Singapore for a meeting between our two species. Nashwan Badu of the African Federation. Danielle Fitzgerald of the Christian Republic of America. Gunther Holstrom of the European Federation. Archie Smythe Robson of Great Britain. Shi Siadong of China. Druve Batra of India. Edward Smith of Australia. Jonathan Wilson of New Zealand. Dmitry Blavatsky of the Russian Federation. Gabriel Firea Rocha of the South American Federation. Nela Gao of the Southeast Asia Confederation. Barack Ben David of Israel. Mario Alvarez of the Republic of Pacifica. At least they were familiar enough with Earth's geopolitics to know there was no single government to talk to. It would have been awkward if they had shown up and said, Take us to your leader. The invited leaders were the current rulers of the thirteen alliances that had emerged after the Great Collapse that catastrophic event that occurred when global warming reached a tipping point and plunged the world into an ecological collapse that brought civilization to its knees. Six and a half billion people died in the next decade from famine, disease, and war. Fifty-four enclaves of civilization survived. Fifty-four city-states. Fifty-four islands of order in a sea of chaos, poverty, and violence. They eventually formed the Thirteen Alliances. Every one of the alliances was a de facto dictatorship, and every one of the named leaders was a ruthless dictator who remained in power by serving the interests of the elites and the military. There were no democracies, though most of the alliances maintained the trappings of democracy in one form or another. Democratic forms of government had proven singularly inadequate for the challenge of salvaging civilization from the wreckage of the Great Collapse. And there would be no one at the table to speak for the two-thirds of the world's population that lived outside the heavily defended enclaves. They were scattered across vast, inhospitable, unforgiving landscapes. They lived in a post-apocalyptic nightmare, ruled by an ever-changing cast of warlords who fought among themselves for territory and resources in a world ruined by the disaster humankind had brought upon itself. Even if the aliens wanted to include them in the conversation, who would they invite? Warlords? There were hundreds of them. Holly was incredibly lucky to have been born in an enclave. She ate well. She lived well. She was getting an education. She could choose her own future. None of these things were available to the outsiders. Sometimes she felt guilty about that, but mostly she didn't think about it. After all, what could she do? By the morning of the third day, the news feeds were reporting that all the invitees were in Singapore. It wasn't like they could decline the invitation. None of them was going to miss the most important meeting in the world's history. According to SNN, they had agreed among themselves to gather at the National Stadium at noon. That was five hours away when Holly walked into the living room. SNN was on without volume. Her dad was reading something on his tablet. He put the tablet down and said, I'm going down to get something from the breakfast buffet. Want to come? When they stepped off the elevator and into the lobby, the ground was shaking, and the floor-to-ceiling windows facing the street were oscillating with a wump-wump sound. The chandeliers hanging from the high ceiling, like glass stalactites, swayed back and forth. At first, she thought it was an earthquake, but a rumbling sound drew her attention to the street, where a column of tanks and heavy trucks clanked past the hotel. The tanks were huge, 
taking up nearly the entire width of the street. The police had cleared the streets of civilian vehicles the day the alien craft arrived, but a crush of pedestrians stood on either side of the street, watching the convoy make its way down the hill toward the bay. The markings on the vehicles identified them as belonging to the Johor Enclave, on the other side of the channel that separated Singapore from the southern tip of Malaysia. Singapore must have asked for backup from the other enclaves in the Southeast Asia Confederation. Hopefully nobody would get trigger-happy and start an interstellar war. Her dad, having decided it wasn't an earthquake, loaded up a plate from the breakfast buffet and headed down the hall toward the conference room where the Quantum Topology Working Group had been meeting. That's why they were in Singapore. He was a presenter at the mathematics conference and had brought her along for the life experience. He was a big fan of life experience. Holly said, I'm going to hang out here and read for a while. He waved his hand without looking back. Despite his occasional attempts at being the parent, he had given up trying to manage her life. In part, this was because she was in her second year at the University of New Auckland and pretty much ran her own life. But mostly, it was because of the dark years, after her mom died and her dad fell into a deep depression. Her brother Robert had moved, fled, really, to Christchurch, leaving Holly to take care of their dad. Since then, she and her dad had developed something of a peer relationship. She snagged a bagel, a packet of jam, and a carton of chocolate milk. Breakfast of prodigies. The lobby was long and narrow, extending the length of a city block. The shaking had stopped, but the chandeliers still swayed. She avoided walking under them. Opposite the wall of windows stood a massive marble check-in counter a third as long as the lobby. The impeccably dressed staff at the counter were attentive and unfailingly polite. Singapore was a polite city. The staccato of shoes on the shiny tile floor provided a counterpoint to the murmur of voices as people streamed through the lobby. People with places to go and things to do. People going about their business as though there wasn't a foreign military convoy making its way through the business district. As though one of the most momentous events in history wasn't unfolding just a few kilometers away. She settled into an oversized stuffed chair at one end of the lobby, pushed her shoes off, and let them fall to the floor with a satisfying thud. The chair's floral-patterned fabric smelled faintly of pipe tobacco, which was odd since smoking was prohibited in the hotel lobby and probably had been for decades. It brought back memories of warm summer nights on the back porch of their botch, overlooking Oahu Bay her dad's feet propped up on the railing while he puffed cherry-scented clouds into the still night air. That was before her mom died, before her dad's depression, before Robert abandoned them. She pulled her tablet out of her tote bag and brought up the Iliad. No matter what was happening down at the bay, Professor Orson would expect to see an analysis of Homer's epic poem next week. She soon lost herself in the story. After a while, she realized something was wrong. She looked up. The lobby had become quiet, and people were standing or sitting, watching the big screens hanging from the ceiling. The clock above the check-in desk said it was a quarter to twelve. She had lost track of time. The screen showed a close-up of a tall man getting out of a limousine. He wore a suit and tie, and his full head of white hair identified him as the President of the Christian Republic of America. A tight circle of men in black surrounded him, his secret service detail. They were easy to identify because they were the only ones not looking at the president. The view zoomed out to show other vehicles disgorging their occupants and security details. There was enough firepower there to give the Singaporean army a run for its money. The image blurred for a moment as the SNN drone zoomed in on the spaceship. The surrounding water was churning, and the antenna and cubes had disappeared. Wings were extending from the sides near the back end of the craft. Holly? Her dad strolled across the lobby toward her. Do you want to join us in the conference room? We have a big screen there. 
An intense flash of blue-white light filled the lobby, its brightness forcing her to close her eyes. The tiled floor heaved under her, accompanied by a long, low moan that made her skin crawl. She opened her eyes. The floor was undulating like waves on the ocean. Her dad fell backward onto a low glass-top table, which collapsed under him in an explosion of glass. Then the wall of windows shattered, and a blast of hot wind roared into the lobby, sounding like an old diesel locomotive. Someone behind her screamed, and she turned to look. A middle-aged woman was lifted off her feet by the wind and propelled across the lobby where she collided with a pillar and slid to the floor, leaving behind a smear of blood. Chairs and tables were being swept up in a whirlwind, along with potted plants, lamps, books, anything that wasn't tied down. The air was full of glass. People were shouting, crying, screaming. An ominous rumbling sound came from somewhere, getting louder, like some monstrous machine rolling inexorably toward her. It occurred to her she should get under a table or something, but her body wouldn't move. She just sat there, frozen in the moment, her eyes staring without seeing, her mouth open, her mind unable to come up with anything resembling a coherent thought. Her dad staggered toward her, scooped her unceremoniously out of the chair, and ran toward a stairwell leading to the parking garage below. The howling whirlwind chased them, caught them, flung them into the stairwell. Holly tumbled down the stairs and landed hard on her back, with the wind knocked out of her. A screeching came from above and made her look up, just as the stairwell turned to dust and blew away. The ground bounced up and down, tossing her about like a rag doll. The awful moaning she had heard before was closer now and louder, reaching a crescendo as pieces of broken concrete rained down on her. It was quiet when she regained consciousness, deathly quiet. A shaft of dusty light drifted in from somewhere, revealing that she was in a small space under a pile of broken concrete and twisted rebar. The air was hot and heavy with white dust, accompanied by the smell of smoke and something like burned electrical equipment. She looked around and found her dad pinned under a steel girder. His eyes were closed. He wasn't moving. Dad? He didn't answer. Dad? Wake up, Daddy. She crawled over to him and shook his shoulder. He didn't respond, and her hand came away sticky, and the coppery smell of blood joined the other smells. An urge to scream welled up inside her, but she clenched her teeth and put two trembling fingers on the carotid artery along his neck. After a moment, she moved them a bit. She couldn't find a pulse. She put her ear to his chest. He wasn't breathing. She knew CPR, but the unnatural angle of his neck told her it was broken. She sat up as best she could in the cramped space and yelled, Help me! Somebody help me! She sobbed as she attacked the mountain of concrete above her, pushing and pulling at ragged-edged pieces, tears streaming down her face. Pieces of concrete gave way, and broken shards showered down on her. She kept digging and digging and digging. Her fingers were bleeding, but she couldn't stop. She had to get out. An opening appeared, and with more digging and pushing and pulling, she was able to climb out onto the side of a mountain of smoking rubble. She looked around. The gleaming glass towers of Singapore were gone. In their place lay a wasteland of rubble and fire and smoke and wreckage, nothing over one or two stories left standing as far as she could see in every direction. The air was hot and thick with dust and ash and smoke. A ghostly grayness blanketed the world, and a mournful wail floated across the barren landscape, rising and falling like the cries of ten thousand souls snatched away and hurled down to Homer's house of death. Something dragged her unwilling eyes upward toward a mass of angry, black, roiling clouds that had swallowed up the sun and sky. 
A sickening dread settled in the pit of her stomach when she realized what she was looking at. It was a mushroom cloud, the kind that marks the aftermath of a nuclear detonation. In the distance, where the alien spaceship had been, a dark, spindly stalk rose from the center of the devastated city and climbed high into the ash-gray sky, where it merged with the expanding maelstrom. Somebody had nuked the alien ship and took out most of Singapore with it. She didn't see any people, and no one answered when she shouted for help. She wished the wailing would stop. It had gotten inside her head and was eating away at her. Maybe this was what it felt like to lose your mind. She crawled back into the hole, pulled down into the waiting darkness by a painful knot in her chest. She lay beside her dad and draped an arm over him. She stayed there until someone came and took her away. 2. Twelve Years Later A kiss brushed Holly's cheek, followed by a pleasant-sounding male voice. Good morning, beautiful. It was a familiar voice, but she couldn't put a name to it or a face. She had picked him up at New Amsterdam's Café Tice, though she let him think he had picked her up, men having such fragile egos and all. A familiar headache asserted itself, and her stomach did a slow flip-flop, warning her it was thinking about throwing up. She tried to picture the layout of his apartment so she could map out the quickest route to the bathroom, but that part of the previous night seemed to be missing. The man with no name moved closer and spooned her. His morning stubble pressed rough against her bare shoulder, his morning wood pushed insistent against her bare ass. It was not difficult to figure out where this was going. Last night was fun, he said. Want to go one more time? Her memory of the previous night was as vague as her memory of the man she found herself in bed with, so she was unable to form an opinion about how much fun it had been. In any case, she did not want to go one more time. Fortunately, she was an old hand at extricating herself from situations like this. Gotta pee. She rolled out of bed and landed on all fours with a thud. You okay? Yeah. She took a moment to talk her stomach out of doing something rash and wobbled toward his bathroom, wondering not for the first time what she found appealing about this. She closed the door and leaned against it for a while with her eyes closed, then filled his toothbrush cup with cold water and sipped at it while she peed. In one end, out the other. There was a kind of elegant symmetry to it. Well, maybe not elegant. The water calmed her stomach enough for her to swallow four acetaminophen capsules she found in his medicine cabinet. The bathroom was surprisingly clean for a single guy's. At least, she assumed he was single. The bathroom betrayed no hints of female occupancy. She climbed into his shower and let hot water flow over her for a while. Amazing how much grime a hot shower could wash away. The unidentified man in the other room would be disappointed to hear the shower running, because it meant he would have to deal with his problem by himself. She tried to feel guilty about that, but came up empty. Face it, he was a one-night stand. She was glad he enjoyed it. She assumed she did, too. Rain greeted her when she got off the bus near the university. A brisk walk through the law school building and the arboretum brought her to the social sciences building, where she stopped at a restroom for a visual once-over before her first class. She was wearing the same clothes she had worn the day before, and it showed. Her hair was especially disappointing. It was one of her better features, wavy, longish, dark blonde, nicely framing her roundish face. This morning, it had a wild, feral look. She tied it back in a ponytail. There was nothing to be done about the shadows under her eyes, nor the bloodshot look. Her first class was an undergraduate course in first contact scenarios. After the Singapore incident, universities had rushed to add alien contact studies to their curriculum, usually tucked into the Department of Astrobiology if they had one. 
the Free University of Amsterdam took a different approach and put it under their Department of Social and Cultural Anthropology, which made a lot more sense to Holly, because she believed that any interaction between humans and aliens would have more to do with language and culture than with biology. Amundsen, Chapter 4, Friend or Foe, she said as she walked into the classroom. A few students were still finding their seats, and two more followed her in. She had a reputation for being a demanding and unforgiving instructor, which she was. That was fine with her graduate students, not so much with the undergrads. Any takers? A young man with a tattoo of a dragon, winding around one arm, raised his hand. With all due respect, Dr. Burton, you looked like you partied hard last night. This produced a stunned silence, followed by a smattering of laughter. Holly's face warmed. She took in a deep breath and let it out with an audible sigh. Most days, she would have responded with some witty remark and let it go, but this day found her in the grip of a massive hangover that did not lend itself to charitable feelings towards smart-ass undergrads. Mr. Munzer, thank you for that insightful observation, she said. You are an anthropology major? He nodded, still grinning. You graduate at the end of this term, I believe. The grin disappeared. And since this class is required for your major, it would be something of a setback if you had to take it over next year, wouldn't it? Pin-dropping quiet filled the room. One cannot help but wonder about the wisdom of publicly embarrassing the only instructor at this university who teaches the course. The silence that followed must have seemed like an eternity to the young man. He stood and said, I apologize, Dr. Burton. I was trying to be clever and obviously failed badly. It won't happen again. Well, give him credit for that. Thank you, Mr. Munzer. Apology accepted. He sat. Her eyes wandered across the faces of the other students. For the record, she said, I did indeed party hard last night. We xenoanthropologists have a reputation for being a hard-partying bunch, you know. This produced some smiles, at least from those who knew she was the entire xenoanthropology department. The class proceeded without further incident. Afterward, she headed to the green basket and made herself eat some granola and yogurt. Then to the gym for her twice-weekly ass-kicking from Camille, a petite Belgian woman who was a much better kickboxer than Holly, which was why she sparred with her. You learn the most when up against someone better than you. After a strenuous workout and a second shower, she engaged in mortal combat with the ancient vending machine down the hall from the closet that passed for her office. It surrendered an egg salad sandwich, which she took to her office, where she dropped into her chair, unwrapped the sandwich, and brought up her vid mail. A priority message was waiting for her from the dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences, which included social and cultural anthropology. He was, in essence, her boss, and he wanted to see her in his office at four o'clock. The egg salad sandwich suddenly looked less appealing than it had before, not that it had looked all that appealing to begin with. A one-on-one -on -one meeting with the dean was rarely a good thing. If it was good news, he would have put it in the vid mail and skipped the meeting. Bad news, on the other hand, always seemed to require a personal touch. She spent the rest of the day doing research for a paper she was writing for the European Journal of Astrobiology. A little before four o'clock, she walked into the dean's office. Howard Gerstenveer was a tall, thin man, somewhat frail-looking. His gray, thinning hair always looked unkempt. She suspected he intentionally cultivated the look. He had a proper office with a real wood desk and bookcases overflowing with actual books and objects d'art collected over a lifetime in academia. There was even a nice carpet on the floor and real paintings on the wall. Some day she would have an office like this, though she didn't know whether that would be a good thing or a bad thing. Dr. Burton, he began. Holly. 
he amended it. Not a good sign. Thank you for meeting with me on such short notice. As if she had a choice. She couldn't think of anything to say to that, so she said nothing. She was tired and felt like crap, and anyway it was his meeting, so let him carry the water. Another meeting just came up, he said, so let me come right to the point. Your application to renew your postdoctoral position for next year has been declined. She tried not to look too disappointed. Postdocs rarely stayed at one university for more than a couple of years. This was her third year at the Free University, and she liked it here. She had built a comfortable niche for herself. She had hoped they would offer her an assistant professorship. Now she would have to start over at another university. She gave Gersten Veer a polite smile. I admit I am disappointed, but not surprised. I knew it was a long shot. And that was where the conversation should have ended. But it didn't. Instead, he leaned back in his expensive leather chair and gave her what was probably meant to be a fatherly look. I want to be honest with you, Dr. Burton. I feel we owe you that. She dropped the smile. He was under no obligation to offer further explanation. That, and the first person plural, we, told her a second shoe was about to drop. No one questions your academic qualifications, he said, or your innovative research. If that was all there was to it, the committee might have offered you an assistant professorship. It was discussed. But, to be frank, some on the committee expressed concerns about whether you are a good fit for the university. The room had gotten uncomfortably warm. What concerns are we talking about exactly? she said, though she already knew the answer. He let out a breath and sat forward. To put it bluntly, you have a certain reputation. A reputation that some on the committee feel is not compatible with the reputation the university seeks to maintain. Aspirationally, if not always in practice. I only mention this because it represents an impediment to your career. Not just here, but other places as well. My hope is that you will find a way to deal with it before a brilliant career comes to a crashing end. She could not deny that she had a reputation, a reputation for being outspoken, for being short-tempered, for being promiscuous, for being a hard drinker, for being, not to put too fine a point on it, a bitch. A familiar voice that lived in some dark corner of her mind asked the question it always asked at times like this. What do you want, Holly? She had a number of less than satisfying answers to that question. She wanted her mom not to have died. She wanted her dad not to have died. She wanted the aliens not to have come. No, that last part wasn't right. She did want the aliens to have come. She just wished they hadn't gotten nuked for their trouble because what she really wanted, more than anything in the world, was to meet them. She realized Dr. Gerstenfeer was waiting for a response. I appreciate your forthrightness, she said. I'm sure this isn't your favorite part of the job. I suppose I have some decisions to make now. He looked relieved and stood. She accepted his hand and left. It was getting dark when she got off the train one stop short of her usual stop in Amstelveen. There was a market here. She picked up some items and walked the rest of the way home. The clouds had moved off, and it was turning into a pleasant evening. Not quite dark enough to see the stars yet, but dark enough to see Jupiter, sitting high above the horizon, surveying his domain. Of all the planets, only Venus shined brighter in the sky— but the goddess wouldn't put in an appearance until dawn. Even then, she would lie too low on the horizon to be seen, unless you were up high enough to see beyond the forest of high-rises. For now, Jupiter reigned unchallenged in the darkening sky. The aliens were there. They hadn't been heard from since Singapore, but images from telescopes showed structures of some kind on Europa and Ganymede, 
two of Jupiter's moons, so apparently they had settled in. Attempts to make radio contact with them, offering apologies for Singapore, went unanswered. Probes sent out to take a closer look went mysteriously silent before they could gather any useful information. The aliens were watching and waiting. But for what? They were the reason her father was dead. Not that they had done anything except drop in to say hello. That had gotten them nuked, along with her dad. Nobody had ever claimed responsibility for it, but the most popular theory was that someone had used the opportunity to get rid of a dictator so another could take his place. Certainly it had launched power struggles in several of the alliances. In any case, Holly did not blame the aliens for her father's death. Still, if they had chosen a different place for first contact, maybe a less populated place, she stopped herself. She had been down that crazy-making what-if path before, and it never led to a solution to the Gordian knot that tied her anger about her father's death to her dream of meeting the aliens. Anger and awe, curiosity and fear. They swirled around in her head in a dance of contradictions whenever she let herself dwell on it. If she could just talk to them. The elevator was out of order again, so she climbed the six flights of stairs to her apartment. She lived in a thicket of low-rent apartment buildings, crowded against the eastern section of the wall that kept the outsiders out of the Amsterdam-Rotterdam enclave. From her apartment, she could see two of the guard towers, placed at thousand-meter intervals along the wall, as well as the minefield on the other side. Every once in a while, the dull boom of a mine exploding would break through the walls she had constructed in her mind to keep thoughts of the outsiders out. She could think of no moral justification for the walls, neither the ones outside nor the ones inside. Yet here she was, surrounded by walls that kept her safe and walls that kept her sane. This was not the way it was supposed to be. She put away the items she had gotten at the shop, sat down at the table, and allowed herself a good cry. When she was done with that, she made stir-fry for dinner which she ate at the only table in the space that doubled as dining room and living room, separated from the tiny kitchen by a countertop. Add a bedroom and a bathroom, and you had the place she called home. She lived alone and rarely had company, so she was fine with the size. Besides, it was all she could afford on her meager salary. Now she was going to have to find another job, which would probably require her to move to another enclave. Just thinking about it was exhausting. She had missed a call from her brother. She played the vid. His hair was beginning to gray around the edges, which made him look like the successful attorney he was. Hey, sis. Just checking in to see how you've been lately. Call me when you get a chance. After her dad's death, Robert had moved back to Auckland and became her legal guardian. It took a while for her to get over being mad at him for abandoning their dad and her, but they worked through it. He was married now, with three children. The house AI announced, You have an incoming call from Theo Dreyfus Peters. Theo? She hadn't heard from him in a long time. House, except call. Audio only. He didn't need to see she had been crying. Hello, Theo, she said aware of the wariness in her voice. And hello to you, Dr. Burton. Somehow he always managed to sound cheery. Having trouble facing the world today, are we? Hearing Theo's voice set off a cascade of memories and emotions, some good, some not so good. He had been her only long-term relationship, nine months being long-term for her. It might have lasted longer if he hadn't suggested she move in with him. That was a bridge too far. She couldn't let him, or anyone, past the emotional walls she had so carefully constructed around herself. She had broken off the relationship. She knew then, and she knew now that it was the worst decision she had ever made, which was saying a lot, because she had made a lot of bad decisions in her twenty-seven years. She activated the video, 
His receding hairline encroached a little more on his silvery gray hair than she remembered, but other than that, he had not changed. Wireframe glasses, blue eyes, square jaw, graying reddish-blonde mustache and stubble beard, immaculate black suit, white shirt and tie, and that perpetual hint of laughter in his eyes and the slight quirk of the mouth, as though he had just thought of something hilarious. Her breathing picked up, and she realized she was smiling. Damn him. Even after all this time, he could still make her heart sing. Why are you calling, Theo? A ripple of disappointment flowed across his face. He took a deep breath and let it out with a sigh. Do you know Sinta Alejandre? Everybody knew who Sinta Alejandre was, the most well-known talk show host in Europe. Her late-night show pulled two hundred million viewers from around the world. A spot on her show was guaranteed to skyrocket you to fame. I know who she is. She will be in New Amsterdam tomorrow morning to interview you. The wheels in her mind lost traction for a moment. If she had made a hundred guesses about what he was going to say about Sinta Alejandre, this would not have been on the list. She waited for the punchline. I'm sorry I did not check with you first, he said, but I knew what you would say, so I went ahead and scheduled it. You know, easier to seek forgiveness than get permission. Apparently, he was serious. It did not surprise her that he could arrange an interview with Sinta Alejandre. He had been with Belgium's diplomatic corps for most of his adult life and was currently Belgium's senator to the European Federation's governing council. He had made a lot of contacts and collected a lot of favors over the years, so pulling strings to get an interview with Alejandre was not as far-fetched as it might seem. But why? She took a deep breath and let it out slowly. You set me up for an interview with Sinta Alejandre. He nodded. Without asking me. He nodded again. What the hell, Theo? What makes you think I want to be interviewed by Sinta Alejandre? For that matter, why would she want to interview me? And what gives you the right to do that anyway? Call her back. Tell her I'm not interested. It's about the aliens. The aliens. It had been a while since anyone had asked her about the aliens, mainly because she always dismissed them with a curt no comment. She had nothing to say about them that she hadn't already said a thousand times. Apart from having had a front-row seat at the destruction of the alien spaceship in Singapore, and despite having made herself the world's foremost expert on alien first contact protocols, she didn't know any more about the aliens than anybody else did. You know I don't talk about that anymore. In a few days you will have no choice. Why? What's happening in a few days? You just published your second book, didn't you? What's it called again? He was being disingenuous. He knew very well what it was called. She said nothing. Another bestseller, I'll bet. Now he was just being mean. She was an academic, writing for other academics. She didn't expect to make money off her books, though protocols for first contact had made a minor splash when it came out and was used at a lot of universities. It brought in a small royalty check each quarter. You haven't given me a reason for doing the interview yet. An interview with Sinta might net some free advertising for both books. If nothing else, it would raise your professional profile, which can never hurt. She snorted. The Venn diagram of Sinta Alejandre's audience and my audience is two circles that don't intersect. It will at least make you known to a larger audience, and who knows, it might open up opportunities not currently on your radar. She tilted her head to one side and gave him an expression intended to ask, What are you smoking, and can I have some of it? Just trust me on this, okay? The interview will get you on the right side of a big story that is about to blow wide open. A story that might change the trajectory of your life, which God knows needs changing. It's my life, Theo, but out. The hint of a smile disappeared. Holly, 
You are one of the most intelligent people I have ever met, but you are also one of the most underachieving. Isn't it time you crawled out of your shell and took charge of your life? You are incredibly gifted, but you have to do something with it, or it's just a waste. You need to figure out who you are supposed to be and be that person. His vehemence surprised her. There had been a time when she dreamed of changing the world. Then the aliens came, and her dad died, and it all went sideways. Changing the world wasn't on her bucket list anymore. Hell, she didn't even have a bucket list anymore. Just do the interview, he said. What harm can it do? She sighed. When and where? That night, in the twilight zone between being awake and being asleep, she heard her dad's voice again. What are you doing, Holly? She still didn't have an answer to that question. 3. Hotel 21 was one of New Amsterdam's more expensive hotels, and Sinta Alejandre's suite was almost decadently luxurious. Not that Holly blamed her. If she made the kind of money Alejandre made, she would probably stay in the best hotels, too, when she traveled. So, no judgment, only a little envy. There were two people in the suite's living area when she got there, neither of them seen to Alejandre. The woman sat Holly on a tall, low-back chair, shined two bright lights at her, and studied her face for several seconds. "'I am Lucia,' she said, as she tied an apron around Holly's neck. I make you beautiful for the camera. She had a Spanish accent. Is that necessary? The camera does not forgive. It finds all wrinkles and blemishes and shows them to the world. I hide them for you. She worked fast with quick little strokes, switching brushes several times. After a few minutes, she held up a hand mirror so Holly could see the result and said, You are now beautiful for the camera. Holly was astonished by what she saw. The makeup had been applied sparingly, but made her face light up in a way she hadn't realized was possible. She had probably never looked so good. That's... well, it's... amazing, she said. The woman directed her to a padded chair on one side of a scallop-edged, rectangular coffee table. An identical chair waited on the other side of the table, presumably for Alejandre. While Lucia had been working her magic, the man had been setting up a camera so that it would peer over Alejandre's shoulder and into Holly's face. He added a light and a reflector. Having a camera staring at her that close was intimidating. He moved to her side of the table and set up another camera that would peer over her shoulder at Alejandre. It was obvious he had done this before. Cinta Alejandre swept into the room like the force of nature she was renowned to be. Her makeup had already been done, and it made her look years younger. If Holly had not known the woman was nearly forty, she would have guessed late twenties or early thirties. She wore a low-cut, full-length red dress, which nicely set off her long, flowing black hair. Holly felt underdressed. Dr. Burton, she said. I am so pleased that you agreed to do this interview. Holly accepted the extended hand and said, Theo can be persuasive. He can, can't he? I tell you what, you call me Cinta, and I will call you Holly, okay? Okay. Tension drained from Holly's body. She was getting the famous Alejandra treatment, though she wasn't sure how the woman did it. So, this is how it will go she said as she settled into her chair. You and I, we are having a pleasant chat in which I ask you some questions and you answer them. She was one of those people who wave their hands around when they talk. If you do not like a question, just say so. It will be edited out later. Also, if you dislike how you answered a question and want to do it over, we can do that. Everything will be edited from the cameras to make a single vid that moves seamlessly back and forth between us, and any minor hiccups will magically be gone. Holly occasionally watched Sinta's show and had seen what Sinta was describing. 
a live show with pre-recorded reports or interviews woven in seamlessly. When will this air? Tonight. Holly must have looked puzzled, because she added, I fly back to Madrid right after this. Do you do that a lot? You mean fly around doing interviews during the day and then back to Madrid for the night's program? Not usually, no. The novelty of jetting around the world and living out of hotels gets old quickly. But Theo told me I would be lucky to get you for an interview at all, let alone persuade you to come to Madrid. She shrugged. So, I am here. Did you fly here just for this interview? Sinta hesitated. Yes. And we're going to be talking about the aliens. She hesitated again. Among other things. Between Sinta's hesitations and Theo's evasions, it was obvious that more was going on than met the eye. Theo told me we would be talking about the aliens, she said with more force than she had intended. He also said I would have a chance to plug my books, which, to be perfectly honest, is the only reason I agreed to do this. But obviously there is something more to it. So, what didn't he tell me? Sinta grinned and said, He warned me that you can be quite forthright. How well do you know him? Well enough to let him twist my arm to give you this interview. You flew here from Madrid to get an interview that will occupy maybe ten minutes of airtime. That's a lot of arm twisting. Let's just say he called in some IOUs. Why? Sinta looked at her for what seemed like a long time. Long enough to start feeling awkward. She said, There are some things happening that have to do with the aliens. I will break the story tonight. Theo somehow caught wind of it and suggested I bring in the world's foremost expert on the subject. That would be you. Holly replayed this in her mind to be sure she had heard it right. Sinta was about to break a big story about the aliens. Theo had persuaded her to bring Holly in as an expert on all things alien. Theo had also said it was something that might change her life. Sinta continued, I am curious, though. How does one become an expert on aliens when nobody has ever seen one, aside from the people who claim they were abducted by them? You're right, Holly said. Apart from the Singapore incident, we don't know anything about aliens. But if we assume that the same laws of physics and molecular chemistry that govern our world also govern other worlds, we can make some reasonable guesses about what is likely and what is not likely for alien life forms. Can you give me an example? Sure. Any alien species that visits our world will almost certainly come from a planet not too dissimilar from ours. Sinta looked surprised. Why is that? There are several reasons. First, they will almost certainly be a carbon-based species like us, simply because carbon is by far the easiest element to build life around. Silicon is the next best element in the periodic table to base life on, but it would be very difficult for complex life to develop around silicon because it lacks many of the properties that make carbon an excellent foundation for biological life. Beyond that, there really aren't any other options. So it will be a carbon second? Holly held up a hand to stop her. They will almost certainly come from a planet with a nitrogen-oxygen atmosphere, similar to ours. While it is theoretically possible for life to emerge on a planet with, say, a chlorine-based atmosphere, it would be almost impossible for a technological species to evolve there. The reason is that you can't have fire in a chlorine atmosphere, and that puts almost all technology out of reach. Metallurgy, for example. So... You might get life on a chlorine world, maybe even intelligent life, but it would be a technological dead end, locked forever in the Stone Age. Nobody from that world is going to show up on our doorstep in a spaceship. The same is true for other hypothetical atmospheres, like ammonia or sulfur. Life is theoretically possible on such worlds, but they will never produce a race capable of interstellar flight. Third, they will... Sinta threw her hands up in mock surrender. You convinced me. 
Any aliens out there probably come from a world more or less like ours. But I still do not understand how we can know anything about them without having met them. Well, we can't know anything about them, not with certainty. But if we assume the laws of physics are the same everywhere, we can again make some educated guess about what they might be like. Tall, spindly creatures from a low-gravity world, for example? Or short, thick creatures from a high-gravity world? We can be pretty sure they won't be insectoid, because exoskeletons limit how big a creature can get, which limits how big its brain can get, which limits how intelligent it can be. Space-faring insects is a highly unlikely scenario. So, no giant insects. Or giant amoebas, or dolphins. Why not dolphins? They're pretty smart, aren't they? A species that lives underwater and never migrated to land probably lives there because it's a water world with little or no land. For much the same reasons we should not expect to run into someone from a world with a chlorine atmosphere, we should not expect to meet fish in space. Though dolphins in our oceans show that intelligent life on such a planet is possible, it will never produce the technology required for spaceflight. Sinta seemed to think about that for a few moments, then said, In your book, Understanding Alien Cultures, you claim that any aliens we meet will be psychologically and sociologically similar to us. But I'm wondering... That's not quite right, Holly said. I offer a number of educated guesses about how an alien species might be organized psychologically and socially, and then extrapolate from there. But that doesn't mean I have thought of all the possibilities, nor that an alien visitor will match any of the possibilities I have thought of. In my book, Protocols for First Contact, I point out that we have to set aside our preconceived notions about what an alien species might or might not be like, because they may well be unlike anything we have ever imagined. I know that sounds odd, coming from someone who claims to know a lot about aliens, but it really is true that the best we can do is extrapolate from what we know and hope we aren't too far off base. Let's change gears, Sinta said. What do you know about a secret collaborative effort between the European, Chinese, and Indian space agencies to build a spaceship to carry a team of astronauts to Jupiter to establish contact with the aliens? What? You can't be serious. Why not? I'm sorry, but I hope you haven't bought into somebody's wild-eyed conspiracy theory. I've not heard that one before, but I can tell you right away that it doesn't even pass the initial sniff test. No one would take it seriously. She realized she was about to insult the woman's intelligence. Sorry, I don't mean to offend. No worries. I have been insulted by some world-class insulters in my time. You will have to work harder than that if you want to offend me. But humor me for a moment and tell me what makes it unbelievable. I don't even know where to start. She stared at the ceiling for a few moments while she sorted through a mental inventory of objections. To begin with, it is beyond our current technological capabilities. We are already in space. Sure, but it is one thing to put a few space stations in orbit and a mining base on the moon. It is an entirely different matter to send a manned mission to Jupiter and bring them back alive. Jupiter is a very long way away. Even with the most favorable alignment of planets, which is right about now and won't happen again for at least ten years, the journey would take upwards of five years. That's one way, so ten years for a round trip. So it's a long trip. Exactly, and that's the problem. Apart from the social and psychological challenges that would arise from living together in the cramped quarters of a space capsule for ten years— the cost of carrying fuel and supplies for a journey that long would be prohibitive. Then there's the radiation their bodies would absorb from the sun and from cosmic radiation. Even if they somehow made it back alive, they would battle cancerous tumors for the rest of their lives. Then there's muscle atrophy and loss of bone density from extended time in microgravity. 
That's just the most obvious problems off the top of my head. I haven't even touched on the technical requirements for building a spaceship that can make the journey. Okay, Sinta said. It's dangerous and it's hard to do. But it could be done, couldn't it? No. From what I know about our space programs, we aren't anywhere near being able to send humans to Jupiter and back. I'm sure we will go to Jupiter someday, if the aliens let us, but this is not that day. Sinta looked at her for several long moments and said, According to my sources, just such a program has been underway for the last two years, and the spaceship is expected to leave Earth sometime in the next few months. Holly would have laughed outright if Sinta's expression had not been dead serious. Then something clicked in the back of her mind. Theo had said that something big was coming down the road, and that he thought Sinta Alejandre knew about it. Theo was nobody's fool. Neither was Sinta. He had also said that it might change the trajectory of Holly's life. A mission to Jupiter would certainly do that if she was on it, but that was such an unlikely scenario that she couldn't bring herself to take it seriously. She couldn't even get her head wrapped around the idea that such an improbable mission was being considered. Holly? I'm sorry, what was the question? I am wondering, what would bring three space agencies and their funding governments together for such a project, and why would they keep it a closely guarded secret? Well, she paused for a moment. This was not something she had thought about before, but it was a fair enough question, even if the premise was improbable to the point of absurdity. It would have to be something big. Game-changing big. Like, the aliens suddenly started talking to us, or some activity on their part forced a high-priority push in our space programs, or an impending mega-disaster that we can't deal with on our own. I'm just casting around in the dark here. Would a rogue planet headed for Earth qualify? Two things happened at this point. First, Holly's jaw dropped open as she realized that a rogue planet headed for Earth was the big story, not a secret space program. Second, she noticed the green light on the camera peering over Sinta's shoulder. She didn't know how long it had been on. Sinta noticed she had spotted the light. Yes, we are doing the interview. Please don't be offended. I wanted to get authentic reactions from you, and that required an element of surprise. You are doing great. Better than I hoped. What if I change the line of questioning to something more in your area of expertise? Like what? The aliens hanging out around Jupiter? Holly wasn't buying it. Clearly she was being used as the foil for Sinta's revelations to lend scientific credibility to some crackpot rumors or conspiracy theories. Theo had some explaining to do, assuming she deigned ever to talk to him again. Right now, she needed to extricate herself from this interview as quickly as she could. Her two books lay on the coffee table between them. She had brought copies of her own, but they were still in her tote bag, so Sinta evidently planned to bring them up. Maybe she could salvage something from this debacle before she bailed. She pursed her lips and nodded for Sinta to continue. Speaking hypothetically, Sinta said carefully, if there was a rogue planet coming our way... She paused. What is a rogue planet, anyway? Is it like an asteroid? No, not an asteroid. Asteroids are relatively small, though a few are large enough to do considerable damage if they actually hit us, like the one that probably wiped out the dinosaurs 66 million years ago, along with 90% of all life on the planet. Something the size of a planet would completely destroy the Earth if it hit us. If it's a big planet, even a near miss might wipe out all life and leave our world uninhabitable for millions of years and there would be no way to stop it. We don't have the technology to destroy or deflect something that massive. Why is it called a rogue planet? 
Sinta asked. Holly sighed. She was not happy with the direction the interview had taken. Planets form as a normal part of a star's birth, she said. Some of them get kicked out of their solar system, for various reasons, and end up roaming the vast spaces between the stars. There are probably more rogue planets than planets orbiting stars. They are difficult to detect, which is why astronomers have discovered only a handful of them. But we know they are out there. So, Sinta said, if a rogue planet was coming our way, and if the leaders of the world's governments believed it was going to destroy our world, and if they could not find a way to stop it or deflect it, and if they exhausted every other option they could think of, like underground bunkers or colonies on the moon or on Mars? If all these things were true, and I admit it is a lot of ifs, wouldn't a rush project to reach out to the aliens for help be a reasonable course of action? And might not that explain why they would keep the endeavor secret, since they might not be ready to announce the end of the world? Holly took a moment to unpack the run-on sentence. Assuming all those ifs are true, then yes. Trying to re-establish contact with the aliens would be a reasonable thing to do. And yes, knowing a rogue planet was coming our way would be something they would want to keep quiet for as long as possible, because people are apt to panic if they think the end of the world is nigh. Sinta's eyes sparkled as she opened her mouth to say something. But, Holly said, stopping her with a raised hand, keeping two enormous secrets like that under wraps for two years is a real stretch. There are thousands of astronomers around the world, professional and amateur, studying the skies all the time. Some of them would have noticed a rogue planet on a collision course with Earth. And then there is the difficulty of keeping a space program secret when thousands of people would have to be involved in it. It's nearly impossible to keep anything secret for very long if more than a handful of people know about it. Something this big? Someone would leak it. To the media? Sure. To someone like me? Yes, to someone like you. Let's talk about something more in line with your expertise, Sinta said. What sort of reception could the crew of this hypothetical spaceship expect when they reached Jupiter? After all, our last contact with them did not go well. Holly snorted. No kidding. We nuked him. A great way to introduce ourselves to a space-faring civilization about which we know almost nothing and which is almost certainly far more advanced than we are in every way that matters. Yet, they haven't retaliated, Sinta said. No, they haven't. And I find that encouraging. Maybe they are not as aggressive a species as we are. Maybe they recognize we are a young, immature race, given to doing foolish things without considering or even being aware of the consequences. Sinta said, Or maybe they have retaliated. It took Holly a moment to see what she was getting at. You mean the rogue planet? Yes. Well, let's think about that. She took another sip of water. Capturing a rogue planet that happens to already be headed more or less in our direction, which would be a requirement, and then nudging its trajectory so it will be caught in our sun's gravity well and pass close enough to Earth to wreak havoc or even destroy our world, a sufficiently advanced race might be able to pull that off, but I don't know why they would. Any civilization that can throw planets at us could surely find any number of easier ways to kill us. I don't think the aliens have anything to do with this hypothetical rogue planet. A different question, then. Assuming the aliens don't want to destroy us, why would they want to help us? The answer to that came right out of her first book. The same thing that motivated them to come to our solar system in the first place. The same thing that motivated them to initiate first contact the same thing that has motivated them to leave us alone for the last twelve years. In a word, curiosity. Curiosity? Yes, 
I believe we are going to find that they are every bit as curious about us as we are about them. After all, they came a long way to meet us. That is a commonality we can build on. Sinta picked up one of her books and looked into the camera behind Holly. If you want to explore this further, I recommend Dr. Burton's book, Understanding Alien Cultures. She held the book up so the cover would be clearly visible. Dr. Burton is the world's leading expert in this field, having devoted her entire adult life to it. This is an academic work written for use at the university level, but I read it, and I think I understood most of it, so it can't be that hard. She flashed her thousand-watt smile at the camera and held up the other book. Protocols for First Contact is the definitive text about first contact with alien civilizations. Dr. Burton was in Singapore twelve years ago when our first contact with the aliens went bad, so she has a personal as well as professional interest in the subject. I tried to read it, but frankly, it was too technical for me, especially the deep dives into linguistic theory. I think it is a book best left for people with a scholarly inclination, or at least an acquaintance with the field. And just like that, Holly had gotten the recommendation of a lifetime, not only for her books, but also for herself as a scholar and expert. Once this story broke, which apparently would happen that very night, she was going to be in demand on the newsfeed circuit, with everyone and his grandmother trying to book her for interviews. It might even change her circumstances at the university. Sinta was smiling at her. One more question, Dr. Burton. If you were asked to be on this hypothetical mission to Jupiter, would you go? She didn't have to think about that. In a heartbeat, she said. 4. Twenty-seven years before the end of the world. The next morning, Holly woke to a world in crisis. The image of Gerard Blumenthal appeared when she brought up the Euro One feed. For those of you who have just dropped in, the big story for the day is In a Heartbeat. That's right. As incredible as it sounds, this headline has gone globally viral, beating out the other two major stories— End of the World, and Mission to Jupiter. The screen behind him showed a collage of shifting images from various feeds, all carrying the In a Heartbeat headline, most with a picture of Holly staring into the camera with an intensity she had not been aware of at the time. Gerard's co-anchor, Viera Petra, said, Euro One has verified that the two blockbuster stories seen to Alejandre broke on her show last night are true. Astronomers have detected a rogue planet headed for Earth. It is twenty-seven years away, but when it gets here, it will destroy all life on the planet. In response, the world's three largest space agencies are constructing a spaceship to carry a crew of six to Jupiter to contact the aliens and seek their help. The European Space Agency, the Chinese Space Agency, and the Indian Space Agency— We'll make coordinated public statements later today, but the story that has gone viral is the answer given by Dr. Holly Burton when seen to Alejandre asked her if she would join the Jupiter mission if asked. Her answer, in a heartbeat, rather than either of the other headlines, is the one that has grabbed the world's attention. How do you explain that, Gerard? Well, Vieira... Ms. Alejandra's revelation gave the world two conflicting messages, doom and hope. People around the world have latched onto the second message, hope. It was the absolute certainty and enthusiasm in Dr. Burton's embrace of the Jupiter mission that did it. I can't imagine anyone else who could have had that impact with those words. She was, you may remember, present at the Singapore incident— and is the world's leading expert on alien first contact. Vieira said, So the world now knows it is facing an extinction-level event, but it also knows there is hope, thanks to an obscure academic at the Free University of Amsterdam. I think this is... Holly's house AI interrupted. You have an incoming call from Theo Dreyfus-Peters. 
Holly switched the vid screen to the caller, and Theo's face appeared. Congratulations, Dr. Burton. You are an international phenomenon. As if to confirm this, the house AI said, You have thirty-seven unseen vid messages and one hundred four unheard voice messages. What? How could she have a hundred and four voice messages and thirty-seven vid messages? She didn't even know that many people, at least not well enough to take a call from them. Then she realized the obvious. She probably didn't know any of them. They were media people, trying to get an interview. She told Theo to hold while she got a cup of tea steeping and some toast toasting. She plopped herself in her one easy chair and tried to wrap her mind around what had happened. Cinta had framed her twin revelations as a thought experiment, a hypothetical, which had somehow kept Holly from fully embracing them. She had gone to bed thinking the whole thing would be debunked the next day. Well, the next day had arrived, and far from being debunked, the stories had been confirmed. An extinction-level event really was heading their way, and a manned mission to Jupiter really was in the works. It was like a story right off one of the tabloid feeds, or the storyline for a sci-fi vid, except it was true. Earth to Holly, Theo said. She had forgotten about him. I have to drop off now, but a word of advice. Sign nothing until you have talked with my attorney. Holly's in a heartbeat line may have been the story everyone latched onto at first, but it was the rogue planet story the world reacted to over the next few weeks. Astronomers gave the planet a technical designation, but the rest of the world took to calling it the Death Bringer. Global financial markets crashed. There were runs on the banks and riots in the streets. Governments fell, and then fell again. Both crime and religious attendance skyrocketed. Many countries declared martial law, which wasn't that big a step, since they were all de facto dictatorships anyway. Worldwide chaos ensued for two and a half months, and then something strange happened. Everything calmed down. It was as though the whole world took a collective step back and asked, Now what? Yes, a rogue planet was coming to wipe out the human race, but that was twenty-seven years away, and humans weren't made to live in permanent crisis mode. It was just too exhausting. So people responded to the coming apocalypse with a kind of pragmatic denial. Life went on. People married, had children, buried their dead. As one man in a person on the street interview said, What else can we do? The financial markets made a recovery of sorts, as did the consumer and manufacturing sectors. Economies found new ways of doing business. Black markets filled the gaps in the system, and governments mostly left them alone, because they served an essential role in keeping their economies going. About three months into the new normal, Holly received a call from Otto Jürgen, general director of the European Space Agency. She had met him once at a conference. Dr. Jürgen, she said, this is an unexpected surprise. How are you? I am well, thank you. I hope you are too? I am. It turns out both my books have become bestsellers, so I'm keeping busy doing talks and interviews and so on. Who would have thought? I am pleased to hear that. Let me come directly to the point, if I may. Four days ago, two members of our Jupiter mission team died in an automobile accident. Oh, I am so sorry. I didn't see anything on the feeds. We haven't announced it yet. One of them was Kako Hayadoshi, the team's first contact specialist. I know Kako. I mean, I knew Kako. She was an excellent choice for the mission. My condolences to you and the team. Thank you, he said. We would like you to take her place. Holly's mind stopped working for a few seconds. Don't you have a backup? Barak Yildiz is Kako's backup, but... He contracted a particularly virulent coronavirus soon to Zinda Hospital. 
with the launch seventeen days away, we cannot count on him. We need a replacement. And I happen to be number three on your list, she said. It came out sounding snarky, which she hadn't intended. I'm sorry, that didn't come out right. I meant, I am surprised to be on your list at all. I have no astronaut training, and I doubt I'm going to pick it up in seventeen days. He said, When the decision was made to attempt the Jupiter mission, your name was at the top of the list for first contact specialist. However, you have a reputation for being a difficult person to work with, and there are reports of a drinking problem, and, how to put this, a somewhat promiscuous lifestyle, which presents a public relations problem for us. These factors eliminated you from consideration. I'm sure you can understand why. Her face grew warm. She wanted to object to his characterization and tell him to take his precious Jupiter mission and shove it. But she really did want to go on that mission. Besides, he wasn't wrong. She was a difficult person, and she had an alcohol dependency, and she slept around. She settled for nodding, not trusting herself to say anything. Obviously, things have changed now, he said. Call it whatever you want, but we need you on this mission, Dr. Burton. The world needs you on this mission. It took more than a heartbeat for her to answer, but only a little more. Five. Twenty-two years before the end of the world. Holly dreamed she was floating on a still, mist-shrouded sea, at peace with herself and the world. After a while, a question emerged from the tendrils of mist and forced itself into the forefront. Where am I? She batted it away, but it came back, insistent. Where am I? Space. Yes, she was in space. A drift in space without a care. No, that wasn't right. She was on a spaceship. The Asimov. Why? Oh. The aliens. She was on her way to Jupiter to find the aliens. A frisson of excitement bloomed in her chest, and she opened her eyes. The lid of the stasis pod slid quietly into the wall, leaving her staring at the metal-gray ceiling of the hibernation room. Welcome back, Dr. Burton, the A.I. said in its usual baritone voice. How are you feeling? It took her a moment to remember that she had to move her lips to speak. You tell me, Albert. She congratulated herself on pulling the A.I.'s name from her still foggy mind. Your physiological metrics are nominal. You have suffered minor physical damage related to radiation and microgravity, all within acceptable parameters. Within acceptable parameters. Such an innocuous-sounding euphemism. Despite Asimov's state-of-the-art shielding, their bodies would, over the course of their journey, receive a cumulative dose of radiation that would be considered deadly back home. Earth had an ozone layer to protect it from most of the radiation found in space. Asimov did not. Also, the inevitable loss of bone density from time spent in microgravity would require years of physical therapy to recover from. Though that would be a good thing, because it would mean they had gotten back. Something not to be taken for granted. None of them thought for a moment that this was anything other than a high-risk venture. Notwithstanding Albert's upbeat appraisal, she felt like crap. Her head felt like a balloon pumps full of air to the bursting point. Her mouth felt like she had been sucking on a dirty sock for the last five years. And she was thirsty. Really thirsty. On the other hand, it was not as bad as some hangovers she had known. Holly did not like deep sleep. Nobody did. The sleeping part wasn't the problem. That was a dreamless state. And as bad as waking up was, it wasn't nearly as bad as the going-to-sleep part. The pod sedated her first, of course, but the fire still burned through her veins as a chemical cocktail replaced her blood, 
to hold her in a state of stasis, hovering between life and death. But even that wasn't the worst part. The worst part had nothing to do with the physiological and everything to do with the psychological. Surrendering herself into the hands of an artificial intelligence for five long years, that terrified her. She did not trust AIs, never had. You just never knew when one might arrive at a perfectly logical and completely wrong conclusion, with potentially disastrous results. Life was an analog affair. AIs were digital and notoriously poor at solving analog problems. Most of the time, an AI's misunderstandings of human situations were just a nuisance, maybe an inconvenience, sometimes downright hilarious. Like the time she told the house AI she didn't want to listen to the current playlist anymore, so the AI deleted it from her music archive. It had taken her an hour to reconstruct it. An inconvenience, to be sure, but hardly the end of the world. However, an AI's misunderstanding while she was in stasis was an entirely different matter. That could get her killed. But she was alive. Albert hadn't managed to inadvertently kill her. Not this time, anyway. Stasis was a new field, and far from perfect. It had a five-year outer limit for its reliability, and each of them had a 92% chance of waking up with no major problems. That meant an 8% chance of waking up with major problems, or not waking up at all. And that was just the outbound trip. They got to roll the dice again for the return trip, assuming there was a return trip. When she pulled herself into a sitting position, a stench came swirling up around her. Holy crap, she said. I stink. She had been told to expect excessive body odor when she woke up, but that had not prepared her for this gag-inducing olfactory assault. Kari was sitting up in the pod next to hers, staring at nothing in particular. Gina was disappearing down the well to the deck below. Wang Li emerged from one of the two showers and followed her. Tolia and Benny would already be on the command deck. Albert had a specific order for waking the crew. Kari and Holly were last in the queue because they were considered the least essential personnel in the event of an emergency. It was always good to know where you stood in the pecking order. Hey, Kari said. Hey yourself. Kari rubbed her eyes with the heels of her hands. You'd think, after five years of sleep, I'd be up feeling, um... Bright, and, uh, I feel like shit. She looked like it, too, but Holly kept that observation to herself. She probably looked just as bad. Kari got her eyes focused on Holly. Albert says I'm fine, but what does he know? Same here. Holly stretched her arms over her head and yawned. Appar apparently my internal organs are still functioning, None of my limbs have fallen off, and I have not become a mental vegetable. She pulled the IVs out of her hands and unzipped the stim suit. Let's get showered and dressed. We'll both feel better. You go ahead. I need a few minutes. Are you sure? Yeah. If there was anyone on the Asimov Holly could call a friend, it would be Karishma Patil. She'd had two weeks to integrate into a team that had been training together for more than a year. Except Benny. He joined the team at the same time she did, because the Asimov's pilot died in the same crash that killed Kako. And Benny was his backup. Since he had been on the backup team to begin with, he'd had at least some interactions with the rest of the crew, but it wasn't the same. Both of them, she and Benny, were outsiders trying to break into a closed group. Everybody understood the psychology of it, of course, and worked to overcome it. But understanding human nature and controlling it were two different things. She wriggled out of the stim suit, which remained attached to the pod, grabbed the handholds above her head, and pulled herself free. A gentle push with her feet against the wall sent her gliding toward the showers. A shower was a necessity after deep sleep, 
to wash away the layers of dead skin that collected on the body, not to mention the unpleasant odor. She had not gotten to use the shower in training or on the ship, but had been told it would be an adventure, and it was. First came the wash cycle, which consisted of being slimed from head to foot with green goop that claimed to be soap. It smelled like iodine. The rinse cycle followed, which got rid of the green goop by pummeling her body with high-pressure jets of water coming from several directions at once. Finally, the drying cycle, a severe buffeting with warm air that she imagined must be what it was like inside a tornado. She had been told that the only way to survive the experience without bruises and a possible concussion was to grab the handholds on either side and hang on for dear life, which she did. Despite the assault and battery aspect, it wasn't as bad as she had been led to believe, and when the shower was done with her, she felt tingly, alive, wide awake. Kari had found her way into the other shower by the time Holly pulled herself out. She glided to the pole in the middle of the room and pulled herself down through the well to the crew deck below. Not that there was any up or down in zero-g, but with the hibernation deck being furthest forward and engineering furthest aft, everyone thought of moving from hibernation toward engineering as down, which would be true if the nuclear thermal thrusters were firing. The crew deck was composed of a walkway around the well and a circle of seven sliding doors. Six of them were private crew quarters, and the seventh was the head. She placed her palm on the door with Burton on its nameplate, and it slid open. A narrow bed took up most of the space, the rest being taken up by a small desk and two upright lockers. There was no chair because the phrase, sit down and take a load off your feet, made no sense in the absence of gravity. The desk did, however, have a foot bar that she could hook her feet under to keep from drifting. Everything drifted in space, at least everything that wasn't secured. If you left something just sitting around, it would not be there when you came back, and there was no telling where it would turn up. In your shoe, under your bed, on the ceiling, in someone else's cabin. From a locker, she selected a utilitarian jumper from a collection of identical utilitarian jumpers. No fashion statements on this trip, and went through the contortions required to get into it in zero-g. A look in the mirror on the locker door revealed that her hair looked like it had been through a tornado, which, in a manner of speaking, it had. She brushed it out as best she could and tied it back in a ponytail. Attached to the wall next to the desk were two holographs, one of Robert, Janet, and their three children, the other of Theo. She touched each image to watch its fifteen-second vid loop. She caught up with Wang Li on the common deck, he held a water bottle in one hand and an energy bar in the other, alternating between the two. From her perspective, he was hanging upside down with one foot jammed into a handhold. He had that faraway stare people got when in a virtual reality. VR implants were still experimental, and only Lee had one. It was difficult to be fully present in virtual reality and physical reality at the same time. The human mind objected to interpreting two overlapping worlds and insisted on choosing one or the other. The solution was to focus on one and let the other fade into the background. People who spent a lot of time in virtual realities claimed they could do both at the same time, but really they had just gotten good at switching back and forth. She gave Wang Li a wave and said, Hey. He did not acknowledge her, though she was sure he knew she was there. Early in her mission training, such as it was, she thought he was just socially inept. That was true enough, but she eventually decided he really just didn't like people very much. She didn't either, so she could live with that. She got herself a bottle of water from the dispenser and drained it in several large gulps. The sleep pods kept their bodies hydrated and provided essential nutrients, but now that she was awake, her body wanted a lot more of both. She was reaching for an energy bar when Tolia's baritone Russian-accented voice sounded over the speaker. 
All crew, report to the command deck. Wang Li came back to reality. Physical reality, that is. He finished his water bottle in one long swig, grabbed another one, and said, Let's go, princess. Sounds like something interesting has come up. He grinned and disappeared down the well. Everyone was there except Kari. Holly floated to her station at the left end of the semicircle that allowed all of them to see the main viewer and each other. She strapped herself in, both because it was standard procedure and because it was the best way to ensure she didn't float away at some inconvenient moment. A control panel and two small viewers slid out of the armrests and dropped into place over her lap. On the main viewer, Europa occupied the bottom third of the view, with Jupiter rising above the horizon. The gas giant looked about three times larger than Earth's moon seen from Earth. The apparent rising of the gas giant was an illusion. Europa was gravitationally locked with Jupiter, so the same side always faced the planet, just as Earth's moon always presented the same face to Earth. It was Asimov that was moving as it orbited Europa. Were she standing on the surface of Europa, Jupiter would appear stationary in the sky. As you can see, Tolia said, we are not in orbit around Europa. 6. Holly turned her gaze away from the banded gas giant and back to the surface of the moon. Tolia was right. It wasn't Europa. It had way too many craters, craters within craters. Europa's dynamic geology ensured a slow but continuous resurfacing, so you just didn't get craters like that. Kari chose that moment to drift in. Wow, she said, looking at the image on the main viewer. That's an incredible view. But I don't think that's Europa. We noticed, Gina said. Elbert, where are we? Tolia said. We are in a more or less stable geostationary orbit around Ganymede, the seventh of the eight regular moons of the planet Jupiter. It is the largest moon in the solar system by size, but is not... Elbert, why are we orbiting Ganymede instead of Europa? A course correction was entered into the navigational computer, altering our trajectory to bring us into orbit around Ganymede. Elbert, who made the course change? That information is not in my logs. A shocked silence followed. That couldn't be right. Everything that happened on the Asimov was recorded in Albert's logs. Supposedly they couldn't be altered, not even by Albert. Explain, Tolia said. I have no explanation, Commander. I am performing diagnostic tests on the navigational and event-logging subsystems and will inform you when those tests are complete. Albert, when was the course change made? Approximately thirty-one months, sixteen days, four hours, twelve minutes ago. Two and a half years ago, at the midpoint of their journey. They were somewhere in the asteroid belt when the course change was made. Sabotage. Benny said. That's a big leap, Gina said. Let's not jump to conclusions without evidence. What other explanation is there? Lee said. The hypothesis that one of us changed Asimov's course is a possibility. There are others. For example, it is possible there is a Trojan buried in Albert's code. It would have to have been inserted before we left Earth, Kari said. Why is that? Gina said. Because they encrypted and locked down the code base before we launched? It is a security provision, in case the Asimov fell into alien hands. Holly laughed. Like the aliens would have any trouble getting through our best encryption. Quantum encryption. They would have to be very good to defeat it. Albert, Tolia said, were any of us revived from deep sleep prior to reaching the Jovian system? No, Commander. At least not according to the logs, Benny said. But whoever did it would still have to overcome the encryption, Kari said. None of us has the key, Gina said. So, someone back home put a Trojan into the system before the code base was encrypted. 
still jumping to conclusions, Lee said. We don't know it was a Trojan. That's just one hypothesis. You have a better one? The aliens, Holly said. Everyone looked at her. Occam's razor. The simplest explanation is often the best explanation. Entering a course change into our navigation system and leaving no trace behind would be child's play for the aliens. No one spoke for several seconds. Albert broke the silence. Commander, I have detected an object in geostationary orbit a little higher than ours. We will pass beneath it in forty-seven minutes. Albert, show us. A yellow arrow appeared near the horizon, pointing to a bright star. The viewer zoomed in on it, and a fat disk came into view. Above it was an asteroid attached to the disk by several supporting structures. Holly brought it up on one of her screens and magnified it further. Something was hanging beneath it as well. Elbert, how big is it? Tolia asked. It has a diameter of 250 meters, Commander. Two football stadiums end to end, Lee said. A hell of a big spaceship, said Gina. I don't think it's a spaceship, said Carrie. Carrie's right, Holly said. It's a space station. And not just a space station. It's the upper terminus of a space elevator. You can see the tether emerging from its underside. There was more silence. I believe you are correct, Lee said. The asteroid sitting on top is the counterweight for the tether, which weighs a lot, because it has to reach all the way to the moon's surface. For a geostationary orbit, that would be, let's see, around 46,000 kilometers, further out than on Earth, because Ganymede rotates so slowly. I don't know what material the tether is made of, but that much of anything must weigh tens of thousands of tons. It's an amazing feat of engineering. We're nowhere near being able to— Bright lights suddenly lit up a section on the edge of the disk, revealing a familiar structure. Holly started laughing. What's so funny? Benny asked. It's a docking ring, she said. They turned on the lights for us. Benny zoomed the main viewer in on it. It looks like the docking ring at Tiangong Station. Can you dock with it? Tulia asked. Sure, if it's the same as at Tiangong, even if it's only close. Any trouble matching orbit with it? Benny did some calculations. You guys aren't going to believe this, or maybe you will after what we've seen so far. All I have to do is move us up into the space station's orbit and our velocity will exactly match its velocity. This provoked another silence. Holly said, I think we now know who altered the Asimov's course. Back in the asteroid belt, the aliens changed our trajectory to one that would put us right here. Benny, take us in, Tolia said. With all due respect, Commander, Gina said, I'm not sure we should do that. Why not? If it is the aliens who rerouted us to Ganymede, it's still an act of sabotage. We're supposed to be at Europa. The mission has been compromised. I'm with Gina, Benny said. By overriding our systems, they have committed a hostile act. What do you propose we do? Lee asked. Go to Europa. Do we have enough fuel for that? Benny did some calculations. Yes, but we won't have enough fuel left to escape Jupiter's gravity well. He did some more calculations. On the other hand, by rerouting us to Ganymede, the aliens have ensured we don't have enough fuel to get home anyway. A few moments passed. Gina said, They've killed us. It doesn't matter, Holly said. Gina gave her an incredulous look. It doesn't matter because investigating Europa was never our mission. Our mission is to establish contact with the aliens and find out if they will help us deal with the Deathbringer. The original mission brief assumed Europa was the most likely place for a meeting with them because we knew they had a substantial presence there. But the aliens brought us to Ganymede instead. We should accept their choice of meeting site. If that means we never get home... 
So be it. It was never about us anyway. That convinced Tulia. Take us in, Benny. Yes, sir. Nobody said a word while Benny used the maneuvering thrusters to bring the Asimov alongside the space station. He inched them toward the docking ring until two huge mechanical arms reached out, grabbed the ship, and pulled it in, leaving the ship rocking back and forth until Benny shut down the maneuvering thrusters. A few moments later, they felt a bump as the station's docking bridge attached itself to the Asimov's hull at its airlock. Holly could hardly believe this was happening, that she was on a spaceship docked at an alien space station three-quarters of a billion kilometers from Earth, that she was about to meet an alien species face to face. She swallowed hard to keep the lump in her throat from bursting out. Apart from the quiet hum of the air conditioning system and the random beeps from various other systems, the command deck was still. Tolia broke the silence. I think that qualifies as a first for humankind. He turned to Holly. Dr. Burton, you are a resident expert on alien first contact. I would like to hear your assessment of the aliens' actions up to this point and your recommendations for how we proceed from here. Well, crap. She was so excited about the prospect of meeting the aliens that she had forgotten that this was where she was supposed to step up and offer words of wisdom. An assessment. Did she have an assessment? They hadn't even met any aliens yet, so she had nothing to go on. Or maybe she did. Well, um, I think there are a few obvious things to begin with. Her voice sounded tentative, even shaky. She took a deep breath and tried to sound more confident. First, there was the Bracewell probe. They looked puzzled. Back in the mid-twentieth century, an Australian astronomer named Ronald Bracewell proposed the use of autonomous space probes to explore our interstellar neighborhood and potentially make contact with other intelligent species. The idea didn't get much traction because of the time spans involved. Space is really, really big. It would take tens of millennia for the probe to reach our nearest neighbor, Alpha Centauri, hundreds of millennia to explore the immediate neighborhood. It's hard to get excited about a project with that kind of timeline. But the underlying concept of an autonomous probe with a smart AI caught on as a way to make first contact if we ever did encounter an intelligent alien species. Say we one day developed faster-than-light propulsion and find a planet with intelligent life. The thinking is that a Bracewell probe would be a good way to make first contact with them because it would put physical and psychological distance between our two species, reducing the possibility of miscommunication and misunderstanding until we got to know each other better. Nobody knew if an alien species might do the same thing when initiating first contact with us until one showed up in Singapore 17 years ago. Unfortunately, we nuked it, and that was the end of that. The good news is that it suggests a spacefaring civilization that wants to make contact with us and wants to do it cautiously, giving us time and space to get used to the idea that we are not alone in the universe. In that sense, you could say their Bracewell probe was a success. We've had twelve years to get used to their presence in our solar system before we decided to reciprocate. We also know they do not want us at Europa but that doesn't mean they don't want us here at all. They could have sent us spinning off into deep space with no chance of getting back. Instead, they redirected us to Ganymede. They went out of their way to put us on a course that would bring us right to this space station. And they provided a docking ring that's compatible with ours. They even turned the lights on for us. All of which leads me to the conclusion that they want to meet us every bit as much as we want to meet them. And Ganymede is where they want it to happen. She paused and looked around. Gina said, You have interpreted everything in the most optimistic light possible, but that's not the only interpretation. This supposed Bracewell probe, for example, 
might not have been a friendly introduction at all. It might have been a warning that they are in our system and not to be messed with. I know the official conclusion was that we nuked the probe, but there are people who don't buy that theory. After all, it killed 13 world leaders and destroyed the Singapore enclave. There's nothing friendly about that. She started to object, but Gina stopped her with a raised hand. It is also significant that we have heard nothing from them since then. If they are so eager to make contact with us, why have they not tried again? Finally, they knew our destination was Europa, but they hijacked our computer system to put us in orbit around Ganymede instead, demonstrating that they are the ones in control, not us. That is not what I would call a friendly gesture, Holly said. We don't know that they would see— Tolia interrupted. I am not looking for a debate here. I asked for Dr. Burton's professional assessment of the aliens' actions to date, and she has given that to us. We are all familiar with this argument, which has been bouncing around ever since the Singapore incident. We don't need to rehash it here. We simply need to decide what to do next. Taking a page from Dr. Burton's book, Protocols for First Contact, the assumption of peaceful intent on the part of the aliens is the only assumption that holds out any hope of a good outcome. The opposite assumption, that they are hostile, leaves us with a doomed mission from the start, and we might as well not have come. Holly was surprised he had read her book. From this point forward, he said, we will operate on the assumption that the aliens were extending a hand of friendship in Singapore— and are extending it again now. I need to know that each of you can move forward with that assumption, whether you fully agree with it or not. He looked at each crew member and waited until they nodded their assent. His gaze returned to Holly. How should we proceed? She had been holding her breath and now let it out with a puff of her cheeks. There are so many unknowns and we have to take it one step at a time. But taking another page from my book, there are some guidelines we can follow. First, we present as non-threatening a profile as possible. I recommend three of us debark to the space station, while the others remain on Asimov. Second, we are on their turf, so we let them call the shots. However they want this to unfold is how we want it to unfold. Third, there will be opportunities for linguistic and cultural misunderstandings. Under no circumstances do we become defensive or belligerent, no matter what the seeming provocation. Finally, let's remember that we are not what's important here. What's important is that this goes well for Earth. Everything else is secondary, including our survival. Toya waited until he was sure she was finished, then looked around the room and grinned. All right, then. Let's go find us some aliens to talk to. 7. Holly, Tolia, and Gina made their way to the engineering deck and into the airlock changing room, where they stripped down to their underwear and helped each other with a laborious process of getting into the skin-tight inner suit and then into the bulky environment suit. This had been a relatively straightforward exercise back on Earth, where they had gravity to work with. It was ridiculously difficult without gravity. They checked each other's suits to make sure everything was properly sealed. Albert, open the inner airlock hatch, Tolia said. It swung open, and they pulled themselves in. Albert, close inner airlock hatch. Holly examined a readout that showed atmospheric conditions in the docking tunnel on the other side of the outer hatch. 14.7 PSI, she said. Just like home. Just be sure it's something we can breathe without dying a hideous and painful death, Gina said in a light-hearted way, but there was an undertone of worry there. Nitrogen, 78%. Oxygen, 21%. Traces of argon. Carbon dioxide. Water vapor. We may not be in Kansas, but the air is the same. Albert, open the outer airlock hatch, Tolia said. 
the hatch swung open into the docking tunnel connecting the Asimov's airlock with the space station's airlock. The tunnel was about ten meters long, with a smooth off-white surface that glowed enough to illuminate the tunnel. He examined the interface between the tunnel and the Asimov. Earth's space programs had long ago settled on a standard mechanical structure that allowed anybody's docking tunnel to attach to anybody else's. The alien's docking tunnel matched that standard. These guys don't miss much, Gina said, peering around. Tolia used the frame around the hatch to propel himself through the tunnel to the other side. Holly was next. A wave of panic passed through her as she realized that whatever the tunnel was made of, it was the only thing between them and the emptiness of space. Life was a precarious thing. One minute you were alive, the next you could be dead from some random event you didn't even see coming. Life in outer space was especially precarious, because you were always surrounded by opportunities to die. Space was a hostile environment, an unforgiving place, an alien place, a place humans did not belong. She launched herself down the tunnel, grabbing a handhold to bring herself to a stop next to Tolia. Gina closed Asimov's airlock behind them and followed. The space station's airlock hatch was the same size and shape as Asimov's, but was round. Gina pointed to a small panel next to it. Tolia touched it, and it popped open to reveal what looked like a common light switch. It was in the down position. Wang Li's voice came through their helmet speakers. Gosh, I wonder what that does. Carrie, Benny, and he were watching through cameras attached to the left shoulder of each of the environment suits. You know, if there is a vacuum on the other side of that hatch, it's going to suck you right out of the tunnel and into space. And your suggestion is? Tolia asked. Open the hatch, he said cheerfully. I'm just pointing out yet another way the aliens could kill us if they wanted to. Thanks for that. He flipped the switch to the up position. A tiny aperture appeared in the center of the hatch and spiraled open, revealing an airlock about twice the size of the Asimov's. There was an identical hatch on the other side. Holly let out the breath she had been holding. She had half expected to find a delegation of aliens waiting for them in the airlock, but of course it was more likely they would find the aliens on the other side of the inner airlock hatch. They pulled themselves in and closed the outer hatch. Benny, audio okay? Tolia asked. Affirmative, Commander. Visual? Affirmative. Okay, then. Here goes nothing. He flipped the switch for the inner hatch, and it spiraled open. Holly was disappointed to find no alien delegation behind that door, either. They stepped out onto a catwalk, overlooking the cavernous interior of the space station, which was easily big enough to hold two football stadiums. The catwalk followed the curve of the station in both directions, and looked like it went all the way around. Metal beams crisscrossed the vast open space, forming a seemingly random three-dimensional web. A few monorail-like vehicles were parked here and there, but none were in motion. In the middle, a large sphere sat atop a stanchion some ten meters wide. That would be the terminus of the space elevator. Materials mined from deep within the moon below would be brought up the space elevator to the station and then transferred to cargo ships that would carry them to other locations in the Jovian system or elsewhere. I don't see anything happening, Tolia said. Maybe it's automated, Holly said, though that doesn't explain why nothing is moving. Tolia reached out and touched a transparent wall separating them from the interior. This was just as well, since it was a long drop to the bottom. Not that they could fall in zero-g, but knowing that didn't keep a feeling of vertigo from sweeping over Holly as she looked down. Solid, he said, wrapping his knuckle against it. It looks like glass, but I'll bet it's some material we've never heard of, and couldn't replicate if our lives depended on it. Gina chuckled. And I'll bet we're going to see a lot of that before we leave this place. If it's any consolation, Holly said, the air is still from Kansas. 
she unsealed her helmet's faceplate and pushed it up and back over her head. The air was room temperature. She took a deep breath and exhaled. There was a scent in the air, like the smell just before a thunderstorm. Definitely breathable, she said. Tolia flipped his faceplate back as well. Gina said, Maybe we should keep our suit sealed, just in case the next door leads to a vacuum or something toxic? Tolia and Holly stared at her. Or not. She flipped her faceplate back. Benny's voice sounded in Holly's ear. Commander. Go ahead, Benny. Something's happening out here. Talk to me. Lee was using the external cameras to examine the outside of the station when another spaceship arrived and docked a ways down from us. Lee's voice took over. It's about a third as long as Asimov, narrower. Uniformly gray, rounded ends, like a giant cigar. I don't see any openings or markings. There is a single rocket thruster at the other end. Wait. Yes, it has maneuvering thrusters as well, fore and aft. How far from you? Forty, maybe fifty meters. What a coincidence, Gina said, pointing down the catwalk. A diaphragm had opened onto the catwalk, about fifty meters from where they were standing. A silver sphere the size of a soccer ball emerged and hurtled toward them at an alarming speed, stopping with a whoosh of air in front of Holly, who happened to be standing closest. Ah! She threw her hands out in front of her in an instinctive defensive gesture. It appears I have startled you, it said. My apologies. The voice was male, with a New Zealand accent. Holly gaped at it for several seconds, unable to formulate anything resembling coherent speech. Whatever she had expected the alien's first words to be, that was not it. Of course, she had not expected them to look like silver spheres, either. It has an Australian accent, Gina whispered. Kiwi, Holly said automatically, which seemed to get her brain and mouth reconnected. Without taking her eyes off the sphere, she said, Commander? Tolia calmly said, I believe this is why we brought you along, Dr. Burton. Thanks a lot. She addressed the sphere. Um, yes. You startled us. She couldn't quite suppress a nervous laugh. Scared me half to death, actually. Oh, I think not, the sphere said. Your vital signs are well within normal parameters for your species, with slight increases that are adequately explained as a fight-or-flight response, or simply a reaction to a novel situation. There is no need to be alarmed. I intend no harm. Holly dug around in her memory for an appropriate approach to the situation. After all, this was the event she had spent her entire adult life preparing for. She glanced back at Tolia and Gina, who looked like they were more than happy to let her show off her expertise. My name is Dr. Holly Burton, she said to the sphere. Doctor is a status identifier that in this case refers to my level of education. Holly is the name my parents, the sphere interrupted her. Perhaps I can save us all some awkwardness and time by assuring you that I already know who you are including the three crew members who remained on your spaceship. According to your book, Protocols for First Contact, self-designations may provide information helpful in furthering understanding between two species that have not met before. Logically, you will next ask for my name. It had read her book? This must be what Alice felt like when she stepped through the looking-glass and found herself in a world where the old rules no longer applied, and she had no idea what the new rules were. Um, okay. How would you like us to address you? Sphere will do. I wonder if we might postpone further questions. Jupiter's radiation is harmful to your species, and this station is not as well shielded as your spaceship. If you don't mind, I would like you to accompany me to a base beneath the surface of Ganymede. On the space elevator? Gina said. The space elevator would be an inappropriate mode of transportation for beings such as yourselves. 
The time required for transit would leave you exposed to radiation for many hours. Also, it would not be compatible with your psychological experience of time. I have provided a transport vehicle, what you might call a shuttle. With that, the sphere floated off at a leisurely pace in the direction from which it had come. They stared after it. Gina said, I think it just told us we can't use the elevator because if the radiation didn't kill us, the boredom would. That's my take on it, said Tolia. Benny, are you getting all this? We are, Commander. We're going to take the aliens up on their invitation. If it takes you very far beneath the surface, we might lose radio contact. A chance we will take. Yes, sir. They followed the sphere along the catwalk and through the open hatch, which opened onto a docking tunnel. There was no airlock on either end. They passed through it and found themselves at the rear of a passenger cabin with six seats, three on one side of the aisle and three on the other. The sphere floated to the front of the transport and settled into an indentation in an alcove. Please sit and secure yourselves with the safety harnesses, it said. You may put your helmets back on if you wish, but it is unnecessary. Holly grappled with a six-point harness that could have been lifted straight out of Earth's space programs. A few minutes later, she felt a jolt, followed by a thumping sound, followed by silence. I think we just left the station, Tolia said. An image appeared on a vid screen at the front of the shuttle, showing the massive hull of the space station on their right and Asimov docked in front of them. Stars dominated the rest of the view. Asimov and the station drifted out of sight as the shuttle adjusted its angle of departure. Then they accelerated away from the station. The view was now mostly stars leaping out from the black of space with astonishing clarity. At the bottom of the view, the gentle arc of Ganymede came into view. The moon had an atmosphere, but it was too thin to be visible. They were in a steeply descending orbit, which he guessed would take them to the surface in a single circumnavigation of the moon. Jupiter abruptly rose over the moon's horizon, dominating the view. At the same time, Ganymede expanded to occupy more of the view. Just as abruptly as it had appeared, Jupiter rolled out of sight, and their view was dominated by the heavily cratered surface of the moon toward which they were plummeting. Details of the pockmarked ice that covered its surface flashed by. A mountain range abruptly rose up and rushed toward them. Holly gripped the armrests and stifled an urge to scream. Gina gasped. Tolia grunted. Then the viewer went dark. They had flown into the mouth of a cave and were hurtling through a pitch-black tunnel at a frightening speed. The shuttle rapidly decelerated, and after a while came to a stop. Everything was quiet. Holly became aware of gravity. 8. The hatch at the rear of the shuttle spiraled open, allowing bright light to stream into the dimly lit cabin. Several seconds passed before Gina asked the obvious question. Now what? She and Tolia looked at Holly as though she should know. Sphere, she said. Should we disembark? Please do. It showed no signs of moving from its place in the alcove at the forward end of the shuttle. Tolia took the opportunity to call the ship. Esimov, this is Fedorov. Are you still receiving us? Benny's voice fought through the static. We are... Der, but it's stat... Vid. Tolia frowned. Esimov, we are deep underground... That may be why the signal is breaking up. See if Albert can clean it up. We're going to look around. They exited the shuttle and found themselves in a room about ten meters long and five meters across. It reminded her of an underground train platform. Diffused white light from the ceiling illuminated beige walls that lacked any features except a door at one end of the room. There was something off about the door— and she had to stare at it for several seconds before she figured out what it was. She laughed, which drew the attention of Tolia and Gina. 
You know what's odd about that door? She didn't wait for an answer. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. It looks like a perfectly normal door you would find on Earth. If that's not odd, I don't know what is. Damn, Tolia said. You're right. He walked up to the door and ran his fingers over the smooth surface. It looks like wood. Mahogany, I'd say. He put his face close and sniffed. Yep, definitely mahogany. And it has a brass doorknob. These guys are sticklers for— He jumped back as the door opened and a man stepped into the room. A human man. Holy shit, Gina said. A tall man— he had a narrow face, brown eyes, dark hair cut short with a part down the left side, and light brown eyebrows turned slightly up on each side. He wore blue jeans, a pale blue shirt, and sneakers, and could have strolled down the streets of New Auckland without drawing a second look from anyone. But what was someone from Earth doing here? Welcome to Ganymede, he said, offering his hand to Tolia. Commander Tolia Fedorov, I believe. Tolia hesitated and shook the offered hand. He released Tolia's hand and turned to Gina. Dr. Virginia Walker, it is a pleasure to meet you. Uh, yes. Gina started to accept his hand, but then pulled it back. She looked like she might bolt. He seemed to take this in stride and turned to Holly. Dr. Holly Burton. I am pleased to meet you again. His eyes were a deep liquid brown that seemed to pull her into them. She accepted his hand. It was warm. His grip was firm. Then she realized what he had said. We... Have we met before? In a manner of speaking. You were in Singapore when I first attempted to make contact with your species. You were fifteen at the time. I am sorry for the loss of your father. How? She stopped. The alien knew she was in Singapore when the aliens first came. He knew she was fifteen at the time. He knew her father had died there. All of this was public information. There was nothing mysterious about it. He had simply done his homework. You look human. Are you? No, I am not. This physical manifestation is an avatar. What you, Dr. Burton, describe in your books as an alien-human interface. But please, all of you, come with me. I will try to answer all your questions. As he disappeared through the doorway, he said, Can I interest anyone in a cuppa? They looked at each other. Tolia seemed to have trouble getting his mouth working, but finally blurted, Did he just offer us tea? Come into my parlor, my dearies, quipped Gina. They followed him through a short entry hall into a circular room at least fifteen meters across. A burgundy carpet with random blue swirls covered the floor, and in the middle sat a low-set, round table, surrounded by seven cushioned chairs. The scent of wood smoke hung in the air. A brick fireplace occupied one side of the room, complete with a crackling fire. On another side of the room hung a large wall screen, displaying a spectacular image of the planet Jupiter, as it might appear from the surface of one of its many moons, like Ganymede. Four open arches were placed equidistant around the room, one of them being the entry hall they had just come through. It wasn't clear where the others led. "'Please, sit,' their host said. "'I will make tea.' He disappeared through an arch." I wonder if that's a real-time image, Tolia said, standing in front of the image of Jupiter. Gina ran her hand over the brickwork of the fireplace. This can't be real brick, but it's a damn good imitation. The fire puts out heat and looks like it's burning real wood. There's even smoke, and it smells like a wood fire. The Avatar returned, carrying a tray, which he placed on the table. English breakfast, he said, with milk and sugar on the side. I hope this is acceptable. There was a slight upward emphasis at the end of some of his sentences, a not uncommon Kiwi trait. Tolia and Gina looked at her, waiting for guidance from their resident expert on alien etiquette.
Neither of her books mentioned tea parties. When in Rome. She settled into a chair, which startled her by molding itself to her body. That's creepy. Would you prefer that it not do that? The Avatar asked. I can disable the feature. No, that's all right. It surprised me is all. She took one of the teacups. It looked and felt like real china, cream-colored with a red floral pattern. The contents looked and smelled like tea, and when she took a sip, she was pleasantly surprised to discover it tasted like tea. She added a little milk and sugar and stirred it with a small silver spoon. She didn't believe for a second that the sugar and milk, or the teacup and the silver spoon, were the real thing. But they sure seemed like it. This whole setup was the most elaborate and convincing simulacrum she had ever imagined. Even knowing this, her second sip of tea put a smile on her face. She shrugged at Tolia and Gina. It looks like tea, smells like tea, tastes like tea. I think we might as well accept it as tea. They helped themselves. An excellent cup of tea, she said to their host. Thank you. I am pleased you find it acceptable. The automaton we met on the space station told us to call it Sphere. What should we call you? No doubt this seems like a simple question, one that ought to have a simple answer. Unfortunately, it presupposes a conception of being that is not applicable to me. Which is to say, it is the wrong question to ask. As I am sure you know, if you ask a wrong question, you will probably get a wrong answer. Your question is literally nonsense. No offense intended. Okay, that was interesting. Apparently the aliens had no use for names because... Well, she didn't know why. However, he continued, I understand your predicament. I have no use for a name. But perhaps... Fragment would be as useful a designation as any, though it obscures as much as it reveals. Thank God, she got a name out of it, even if it did obscure as much as it revealed, whatever that meant. Thank you, Fragment. Please bear with, uh, be patient with our limited understanding of your species. We want to understand. She needed to avoid figures of speech, which were notoriously culture-specific. There was no way to know how an alien might interpret them. That was in her book, too. She took a moment to reflect on what she had learned from this little exercise in introductions. Apparently, they did not use self-designations to differentiate themselves from others of their kind. But what did that mean? Were they some kind of hive species— in which individual members define themselves only in relation to the collective? That was a chilling thought, though she immediately realized that her reaction was colloquial at best and probably downright xenophobic. She had also learned it was willing to accommodate their limited understanding of its species, shown by the fact that it offered her a name even though it had no use for one itself. He waved his hand expansively. I created this environment to be as familiar to you as possible. He pointed to the arch he had brought the tea from. Through there is a kitchen. More an automated kitchenette, really. You will find a variety of foods and beverages that I assure you are nutritious and safe. I have attempted to imitate the flavors and scents of human foods, though I cannot guarantee I have gotten all of it right. You will have to be the judge of that. He pointed to another arch. Through there, you will find private sleeping quarters, one for each of you, each with its own bathroom, which includes a shower. The three of them exchanged glances. It seemed their host expected them to stay for an extended period of time. He continued without seeming to notice, though Holly doubted he missed anything. I have also made clothing for you. I did not know what your stylistic preferences would be, so I provided a variety using... Wait a minute, Gina said. You made clothes for us? How long do you expect us to stay? Holly stared hard at her, willing her to shut up. The last thing they wanted to do was offend their host. Gina either didn't notice or chose to ignore her. 
Their host turned his head toward her. Do you wish to leave already? No, Tolia said quickly, giving Gina a glare of his own. We have come a long way to meet you, and it is my hope that we have a great deal to talk about. He looked at Holly and then back at their host. But perhaps this is a good time to ensure that we have the same expectations for this visit. For example, if we did wish to leave now, would that pose any difficulties? I understand your concern, he said. Please be assured that you are not prisoners in any sense of the word, and are free to leave whenever you wish. I can instruct the shuttle to return you to the space station, where you will be free to board your ship and depart. I will even refuel your ship, since you do not have enough fuel to get back home. Gina relaxed visibly, as did Holly. The aliens really were going out of their way to establish a cordial relationship. Tolia said, You have an impressive operation here. A space station, a space elevator, presumably a mining operation. You are correct, Commander, their host said. This is a mining base, though it has not been used in a long time. Materials from deep inside the moon were used to build a base on Europa to support the study of some interesting life forms that live in its oceans. Holy crap! There was life on Europa? Planetary scientists had speculated about the possibility of life in oceans beneath its surface, but the only way to find out was to go there, and the Great Collapse had put a serious crimp in Earth's space programs. Why an avatar? Gina said. Why not show yourself as you are? An excellent question, Dr. Walker. I would if I could, but I can't. I am a trans-dimensional being. Your mental constructs are anchored in your four-dimensional space-time continuum. As a result, you literally cannot see most of me, and if you could, you would likely find the experience disorienting and possibly frightening. Are there more of you? Holly said. Or are you alone here? It's just me, I'm afraid. There are more of my kind, but none of them are currently in this galaxy. We are solitary explorers. I have, however, reported your existence to them, and they are curious about you. Advanced biological entities such as yourselves are rare. Your discovery has stirred up considerable interest. Wait a minute, Gina said. If none of them are in our galaxy, how do you communicate with them? Ah, yes, the problem of communication over large distances. Another excellent question, Dr. Walker, but one not easily answered because, again, you humans lack the mental framework necessary to understand it. Perhaps there will be an opportunity later to pursue it. Holly wanted to pursue it right then, but Tolia waved his arm to take in the entire room. Is this real? By real, I assume you mean physical, as opposed to, say, a hologram or an illusion. Yes, it is real. I constructed it specifically for you and your crew from materials mined here on Ganymede. Obviously you knew we were coming. I have followed your space programs with great interest. Uh, fragment? Gina said. Your command of English is quite good. Excellent, really. And not just English, but a specific variant of English. New Zealand, I believe. I am fluent in most of your world's languages. Really? He tilted his head again and offered an apologetic smile. What can I say? I am a highly intelligent being. My God, Holly thought, he has a sense of humor. Or at least he understands human humor well enough to emulate it convincingly. She faced something of a conundrum now. The field of first contact studies had mainly to do with developing a common basis for communication, hopefully one that avoided anthropomorphic false equivalents, which could lead to dangerous misunderstandings. In the literature, this was called, as the fragment had pointed out, an interface. 
She had always assumed it would be the first and most important hurdle to overcome in any first contact scenario, which was why she was on this mission. But if she took the fragment at its word, this was an impossible task, because their limited little brains were incapable of forming a meaningful concept of the alien. Their host, however, had solved the problem by providing its own interface in the form of the Avatar. What they could not do, he had done for them. All her studies, all her research, all her ideas, all her books and articles, none of it mattered. None of it was of any use. All she had to do was show up, and the alien took care of the rest. She was overtaken by a feeling of humility, of unworthiness, almost as though she was in the presence of a god. How arrogant of her to think she could bring anything of value to an encounter with an advanced alien species. She said, What do you— He interrupted her with a raised hand and said to Tolia, Commander, two of your crew are leaving your ship. He pointed toward the wall screen, which now showed the inside of the docking bridge seen from the space station side. The Asimov's outer airlock hatch was open, and Kari and Lee were pulling themselves through. Or rather, Kari was pulling Lee through. It looked like he was unconscious. When she kicked off to carry them both across the gap between Asimov and the space station, globules of blood trailed behind them. Neither of them wore an environment suit. The color drained from Tolia's face. He stood. Asimov, this is Fedorov. Come in, please. He waited a few moments. Esimov, this is Fedorov. Please respond. Again, nothing. He looked at the fragment. Is our signal reaching them? I have turned a repeater to your frequency to boost the signal. The space station is receiving it clearly, and I can think of no reason your spaceship would not be receiving it as well. Elbert, Tolia said. Ship status. Nothing. Not even static. The ship is attempting to leave the station, the fragment said calmly. I have opened the space station's airlock for Dr. Patil and Dr. Wang, but I do not believe they will reach it in time. In time for what? Gina said. In time to avoid being sucked out of the docking tunnel into space. Nine. Kari's breath caught in her throat as Wang Li's body flew across the room and crumpled into the food dispenser. It tried to bounce back toward the middle of the room, but his left hand had gotten trapped in a handhold, so his body jerked into the dispenser again. Blood from his left nostril formed a darkening blob in front of him, and a cloud of red mist collected around him from a gash on the back of his head where he had hit the corner of a cabinet. Lee, you fucking cretin! Benny screamed. Carrie turned toward him. He was floating upside down from her point of view, his left arm sticking out at an odd angle. He had made the mistake of threatening Lee with a knife. Lee was a practitioner of Aikido, which included extensive use of joint locks. He had used one to disarm Benny and another to break his upper arm with a horrible cracking sound as the bone snapped. Benny howled in pain but used his position against the wall to kick Lee in the face, which sent him tumbling across the room and into the dispenser where he hung unconscious from the collision. Benny retrieved the knife and kicked off from the wall, sailing across the room to Lee, where the knife sank deep into his abdomen. Carrie started crying. Shut up, Benny said, or I'll cut you too. He oriented his body toward hers, his face contorted in pain, or rage, or both. The knife in his hand was red with Lee's blood, and Benny's own blood was seeping through his shirt, which meant the bone had broken through the skin. His eyes were wild, and she knew with panicked certainty that he was going to kill her. But he didn't. Instead, he freed Lee's hand and gave him a shove in Carrie's direction. She caught his body and let his momentum carry them both into a wall so she could take as much of the impact as possible. Pain exploded in her right shoulder when she connected with a handhold. Benny, 
she cried. Stop, please. Why are you doing this? Benny's voice was low and dangerous now. Get out, both of you. Carrie heard the words but couldn't make any sense of them. Her heart thudded against her chest, and she gasped for air. Her vision narrowed down to a space in front of her. Benny was in that space, drifting toward her, knife in hand. His mouth was moving, but she didn't know what he was saying. She started crying again. Stop that, he shouted. He slapped her hard across the face, which pushed her against the wall and set him flying backward. He got himself stopped on the opposite wall and shrieked in pain. Into the airlock, he gasped, and take the great Wang Li with you. What? You have five minutes to get off this ship and onto the space station. Otherwise, I'm going to disengage Asimov from the station and toss you both out the airlock. Carrie was suddenly alert, her head clear. He was giving them a chance. All she had to do was get Lee and herself to the alien space station. She grabbed Lee's body and pulled him down three levels to the engineering deck. Benny followed. She reached for a spacesuit. You won't be needing that, he said. Her hands were shaking, and she thought she might throw up. She had never been so frightened in her life. It seemed to take forever, but she got Lee and herself into the airlock. Benny slammed the hatch shut behind her and secured it. The outer hatch swung open. Blood floated around the airlock in thick, dark blobs. She dragged Lee into the docking tunnel, moving as fast as she could. She was pretty sure Benny was going to disengage the Asimov from the station, and if they were still in the tunnel when he did, they would be blown out into space. She had read somewhere that as Ways to Die went, it was one of the better ones, but she had no desire to find out for herself. She kicked against the airlock door, propelling the two of them down the tunnel toward the space station. Miraculously, its hatch spiraled open. She hit the side of the opening, and Lee's body hit hers. He groaned. Sorry, she said automatically, but she was relieved to know he was still alive. The docking bridge lurched, and she heard the high-pitched screeching sound of air escaping through a tear somewhere. She sobbed as she pushed Lee into the airlock. The screeching gave way to a whooshing sound. Asimov was leaving, and the tunnel was coming apart. She grabbed both sides of the airlock and pulled herself in, only to be pulled back out as the air in the tunnel exploded out into space. Benny took his seat on the command deck and buckled himself in. He punched in the vector he wanted and ordered Albert to execute it. The AI balked. This course will cause the ship to crash into the surface of the moon below. I cannot comply. Benny issued a command override, and Albert complied. The ship pulled away from the station, taking part of the docking bridge with it. Had Kari and Lee made it to the station in time? It didn't matter. They would die either way. They were collateral damage. An unfortunate but unavoidable loss, necessitated by his mission. A mission he had committed to eight years ago. Rain skittered across the water as Ben walked along the path that wandered around the lake. From here, the lodge on the opposite side presented a postcard-perfect picture of an old two-story log building set against a misty green background of Douglas fir and western red cedar. He stopped and inhaled. He loved the smell of the rainforest, the fir needles, the cedar bark, the decomposing detritus that made the ground spongy to walk on. Even the rain had a smell all its own. Having set the Asimov on its course, he removed the detonator from his pocket. He didn't know how the organization he worked for had gotten a nuclear device on board, nor how it had remained undiscovered. Apparently, they had people placed in key positions throughout both the European Space Agency and the Asia-Pacific Space Agency. The deaths of Burak Yildiz and Kako Hayadoshi were no accident. It had been necessary to open up a spot on the Jupiter mission for him. 
A lot of planning had gone into his mission. The lodge had recently been renovated and was not nearly as rustic on the inside as it appeared from the outside. There were five other people in the dining room when he sat down for dinner. A young couple with a child who was not pleased about being made to sit in a booster seat, and an older couple who ate their meal quietly, apparently not requiring any conversation. He ordered the grilled salmon with asparagus and baked potato. The asparagus was overcooked, as it usually was at restaurants, but the salmon and potato were excellent. A glass of Cabernet Sauvignon capped it off. Supposedly white wine went best with fish, but Ben didn't care for most white wines, too bitter for his tastes. He had read somewhere that the only rule with wine is that you enjoy what you are drinking. A tall man in a suit and no tie walked up to his table and sat across from him. He took his hat off and set it on the table. His hair was short, and he was clean-shaven. There were no laugh lines on the man's face. My name is Darren Flocker, he said. The trajectory Benny had programmed into the AI would take the ship once around Ganymede, losing altitude as it went, until it reached the space elevator again a few hundred meters above the alien base. He would detonate the device then, obliterating the base and killing any aliens who happened to be there. It would vaporize the bottom part of the space elevator's tether, which would shift the tether's center of balance and, he hoped, send the station careening off into space. We are looking for patriots, Mr. Clark. Patriots not just of a country, but of the world. Patriots like you. The survival of the human race is at stake. The mission was to sabotage the effort to make peaceful contact with the aliens and to strike a mortal blow against them instead, and Benny was the linchpin of the plan. It was up to him to detonate the device at a time and place that would cause maximum damage. He had almost panicked when he realized they were not in orbit around Europa. But he knew that even the best laid plans often went astray when they collided with reality. He would take out the base and station at Ganymede instead. He keyed the activation code into the detonator and eyed the red button. Why red? It was such a cliché. His arm throbbed, and he was having trouble concentrating. He was going into shock. But it didn't matter. Only the mission mattered. He was going to be a hero. He was going to die a true patriot. 10. James Braxton Cartwright, Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security of the Christian Republic of America, held a match to the nondescript pipe clenched between his teeth. The pipe was an affectation he had made part of his public persona many years ago. It was also one of the few truly enjoyable vices he insisted on keeping, despite his doctor's orders and his wife's gentle harangues. Getting old sometimes seemed like a long, slow process of ejecting from his life all things pleasurable. He was determined to hang on to a few of them to the bitter end. Scotch was one of those, his pipe another. A curl of smoke emerged from the bowl of the pipe, followed by two energetic puffs, suffusing the room with the scent of cherry tobacco that mingled with the scent of the fire in the fireplace and the scent of an ancient cedar, of which the private hunting lodge was built a century and a half ago. Six people were present for the meeting, five members of the Mansfield administration and one Supreme Court justice. They were there to watch a few seconds of vid. "'Show us what you've got, Mr. Franklin,' Cartwright said. Lee Franklin had ascended to the position of interim national security adviser after his boss was forced to resign in the face of allegations of insider trading. The young man was obviously in way over his head, but with proper grooming he might prove useful. Franklin started the vid— and a starfield appeared on a vid screen set up for the meeting. He used a pointer to draw their attention to a particularly bright star, one that almost resolved into a disk. This is the planet Jupiter, as seen from a satellite in Earth orbit. You can see three of its moons here, here, and here. 
He brought the pointer back to the first moon. This is Ganymede, the last known location of the Asimov. Several seconds passed, and then Ganymede flared almost as bright as Jupiter, and just as quickly dimmed again. The vid ended. Franklin got up to turn on the lights, but Cartwright stopped him. I'd like to see it again. They watched the vid again, and Franklin turned on the lights. Cartwright puffed thoughtfully on his pipe. That was a nuclear detonation? Franklin cleared his throat. That's what the texts say. Nuclear detonations have a distinctive energy signature that— I didn't ask you for a technical report. I asked you if you are sure it's a nuclear detonation. It's a yes-no question, son. If you are going to be of any use to this president, you'll have to learn to give him the answers he needs, clearly and succinctly. He assumes you did your homework, so don't waste everybody's time explaining how you got to your conclusions. The room was silent. Franklin cleared his throat again and sat down. His face and neck were red. It was a nuclear detonation. There was another pause, broken by the gravelly voice of Janice Ferguson, the Secretary of State. It would appear the aliens have initiated hostilities by attacking our peace envoy. That is one interpretation, Franklin said. She pursed her lips. What other interpretation is there? The Asimov might have detonated it, she snorted. The Asimov carried no weapons, certainly not nuclear weapons. It was on a mission of peace, a Hail Mary pass hoping to secure the aliens' help. John Burner, Mansfield's chief of staff, walked over to a window and pulled the curtains back, letting the light of the setting sun paint the room with an orange glow. He stood there for a few moments, and then turned to face the others. I believe a de facto state of war now exists between the aliens and humans. There were two CRA citizens on the Asimov. I am going to recommend to the president that he ask— No, that he demand that Congress declare war on the aliens. Does anyone disagree? Cartwright watched Franklin's face as it dawned on the young man that this had all been a foregone conclusion and that he was merely a pawn in a game he didn't fully understand. For a moment, it looked like he might object, but then he settled back in his chair, his body language signaling surrender. Cartwright smiled to himself. Yes, Lee Franklin had potential. Later, after everyone had left except Janice, he poured two fingers of scotch into a whiskey glass and handed it to her. He poured one for himself and returned to his seat. She took a drink from her glass and allowed herself to savor the burn as it went down. So, Jimmy, what is the next move? He relit his pipe and puffed it to life. The press will spin it as an unprovoked attack on an unarmed ship on a mission of peace. There will be a public outcry. Congress will have no choice but to line up behind the president— most of the world will fall into line, except maybe the Europeans or the Chinese. Some arm-twisting may be required. He watched a passable smoke ring float upward, gradually losing its form until it faded into the ceiling. On a related note, the CRA launched four armed spaceships a few months after the Asimov left Earth. They will reach Europa in two weeks. Their original mission was to look for alien tech in the aftermath of the nuclear detonation there. When the Asimov ended up at Ganymede instead, the task force rerouted one of its ships there to survey the aftermath of the nuclear detonation. The main force is continuing on to Europa, where it will attack the space station and base there. Hopefully they will come away with some alien technology we can use against them in the future. Ferguson stared at him. Her glass made a loud clunk when she set it down. Shit, Jimmy. That's a huge gamble you're taking. Nuking them with the Asimov was risky enough, but you're talking about an all-out offensive. Are you trying to start a war? War is inevitable. Sooner or later, they will come for us anyway. It's only a matter of time. By striking hard and fast, we might set them back disrupt their plans, give us more time to prepare. 
he allowed his large gray eyes to settle on her. This is an existential war. Either we destroy them, or they destroy us. I have spent most of my adult life defending my country against all threats, foreign and domestic. Terrorists, illegal immigrants, economic chicanery, corporate overreach, Republicans. They both smiled at the small joke. The Deathbringer is a whole other level of threat, an existential one. But my people tell me it is survivable. It won't actually hit us. It will pass near enough to wreak havoc with the planet, but we can survive that without help from an alien race. That fact of the matter is that the aliens are the real threat. I saw that when they first arrived seventeen years ago. He puffed furiously on his cigar, creating a cloud of smoke around his head. And you didn't mind taking out all the Alliance leaders, including Fitzgerald, not to mention Singapore? Unfortunate, but acceptable losses when you consider what was at stake. It was important to stop any dialogue with the aliens, and it did. We haven't heard from them since. It was just as important to stop the Jupiter mission. Janice, the aliens are not our friends, and never can be. They are the real threat to our existence. So, I repurposed the Jupiter mission to be a declaration of war. What happens next? I hope a one-two strike will buy us enough time to do two things. Build an international space force, using their own technology, and construct underground cities that can survive the Deathbringer. Isn't it possible that they have come in peace? It makes no difference. He stood and began pacing back and forth. I drove through the Rapahana Indian Reservation a few weeks ago. The poverty, the hopelessness. It struck me that this is what happens when a superior civilization encounters an inferior one. In our case, we invaded, wiping out most of the Native Americans who were here before us. That's just the way of the world. But as I drove through that reservation... I realized that those who survived the coming of the Europeans were in some ways worse off than those who died. They were once a proud people, a warrior people. Look at them now. They have lost their land, their independence, their culture, everything. The only emotion I could conjure up for them was pity. He puffed on his cigar again, replenishing the cloud of smoke following him around the room. Whether these aliens are hostile or not is beside the point. The outcome is the same either way. Our civilization dies. I intend to do everything in my power to make sure that doesn't happen. He sat, and they were quiet for a while. She said, What do you need from me? Madam Secretary, I need you to manage the Council of Enclaves, which is going to have a hissy fit when they figure out what we are doing. After she had gone, he wandered out to the dock on the pond behind the lodge. A wobbly reflection of the moon floated on the pond's surface. The evening symphony of frog songs had mostly died down, leaving only the occasional forlorn call of a lone male, still hoping to get lucky. Cartwright sat on a wood-slat chair on the dock, holding an empty whiskey glass in one hand and a forgotten pipe in the other. He was tired, tired of the fight, tired of the politics, tired of the games. Marie wanted him to retire, spend more time with the kids and the grandkids. He was more than ready to do that, but his country still needed him. Presidents came and went, as did party control of Congress. He, on the other hand, had held his position as Secretary of Homeland Security for nearly three decades and had become the most powerful man in America, maybe in the world. Most people attributed this to knowing where the bodies were buried, which was true enough. But his political longevity also owed a great deal to his ability to rise to the challenges and opportunities presented by the Great Collapse. As economic, political, and social chaos spread across the globe, national security became the country's overriding priority, and it fell to him 
to transform America into a fortress of freedom, as he liked to call it, a fortress that could survive the socioeconomic tsunami and come out the other side ready to reassert its preeminence on the world stage. Now he faced the two greatest challenges of his life, the Deathbringer and the aliens. It was no longer just America he had to save. It was the entire human race. He didn't know if he could pull it off, but he had to try. He would rise to the challenge one more time, because there was no one else who could. He would stand in the gap between his people and annihilation. The rest was in God's hands. The grandchildren would have to wait. 11. Captain John Hiram Grant sat impassively on the bridge of the destroyer Robert E. Lee, his eyes fixed on the three monitors in front of him, particularly the one that displayed the changing status of the ships that compromised his tiny fleet as they came alive after five long years. Not that it had seemed that long to him, or to any of the people under his command. They had all slept through it, unaware of the passage of time. Now they were waking up and preparing for war. The Robert E. Lee showed full battle readiness. Its crew had been the first to be awakened as they approached their targets. The frigate Carolina also showed full battle readiness status, though it wasn't expected to engage in hostilities. It was a reconnaissance ship, whose mission was to verify that the alien base on Ganymede had been destroyed. If they found any sign of alien activity, they had half a dozen nuclear missiles. The crew of his other destroyer, the Thomas J. Jackson, was awake, but not yet battle-ready. Between the two destroyers, Grant had at his disposal enough nuclear firepower to lay waste to any nation on Earth, and he was prepared to use that firepower against any aliens who got in his way. Grant was confident, but he was not given to hubris, nor was he inclined to underestimate an enemy. Any race that could travel between the stars would be more advanced than humans. How much more advanced? They were about to find out. The remaining ship at his disposal was the Lewis B. Puller, a troop carrier named for the American general who led a successful marine assault against larger entrenched Japanese forces at Guadalcanal. It was the largest of his ships and held a contingent of forty marines, led by Lieutenant Sam Puller, who happened to be a direct descendant of the famous general. The marines were still waking up and would not be battle-ready for at least an hour, but that was all right because the battle plan called for the troop carrier to stand off until the destroyers neutralized the enemy's defenses. Then they would go in, secure the enemy base, and begin the search for alien technology. That, of course, was the number one objective of their mission. Alien technology. One factor that weighed heavily on his mind was the fact that the enemy knew exactly where his fleet was and exactly where it was going, and there was nothing he could do about it. The laws of inertia and gravity saw to that. His fleet was like a billiard ball that had been put in motion years before and was now on a predetermined trajectory that was for all practical purposes, impossible to change this late in the game. The Carolina was locked into a course to achieve orbit around Ganymede. Grant's destroyers and troop carrier were locked into a course to achieve orbit around Europa. The science fiction trope of space battles with ships buzzing around this way and that, like airplanes in aerial combat, was simply not possible in space. No, the aliens knew where he was, and where he was going, and there was nothing he could do about it. The only saving grace was that he also knew where their space station and base were at Europa, and there was nothing they could do about that. There would be no sneak attacks or surprise maneuvers. The ball had been put in motion years ago. Everything else was down to Newton's law of motion. Incoming message from the Carolina, his communications officer said. Let's hear it. A moment later, he heard the voice of the commander of the Carolina. Robert E. Lee, this is Carolina. We have established orbit around Ganymede and passed over the alien base. There is no sign of activity. 
Nothing is left but a crater of slagged ice. It looks like a good deal of the space elevator tether was destroyed as well. The space station is nowhere to be seen, and there is no sign of debris. We are assuming it was thrown into space. Any sign of life underground? Even at the speed of light, there was a small but noticeable lag as their signals traversed the distance between them. Grant waited patiently. This was not his first rodeo, though it was his first rodeo in space. The expected lag came and went, and the silence stretched out with no answer to his question. He looked at the communications officer, who said, We've lost the signal, sir. What do you mean we've lost the signal? Get it back. The problem is not on our end, as near as I can tell. They stopped transmitting. The first officer looked up from his station. We have lost telemetry as well. Something has happened to them. Grant rubbed a scar above his right eye. Keep trying, he said. They can't have... Sir, the navigator said. The alien space station is coming into view. Let's see it. A graphical visualization appeared on the main screen. It showed the two destroyers approaching Europa. A bright dot sat on the horizon of the moon. Give me a visual, he said. The large screen split into two windows, one showing the graphical visualization and the other showing a live image. He didn't see the space station. Then the view zoomed in and the space station appeared. It was shaped like a fat disk, with several towers poking up from its top and bottom surfaces. An especially large tower rose from its center. A docking tower, perhaps, though there was no evidence that it was being used at the moment. A tether stretched down toward the surface of the moon. They had a space elevator. Two panels slid open on the edge of the station, and two small spheres emerged from each. Four more came around from behind the station, and the eight spheres assumed a defensive position between the station and Grant's fleet. Sir, activity on the moon's surface. Show me. A visual of the surface of the moon replaced the space station and zoomed in on an area that was deep in shadow. It's hard to see because it's in a shadow, the navigator said. I'll enhance it. The shadow became grayish-yellow, and several structures became visible. Now Grant could make out tractor-like rigs, leaving one of the structures that made up the above-ground part of the alien base. Mobile missile batteries? Grant asked. That would be my guess, his first officer said. The spheres surrounding the space stations are probably anti-missile defense systems. Open a link to the Jackson. One of the screens in front of him lit up with an image of the commander of the Thomas J. Jackson. Looks like they are ready for us, Zachary Vance said. So far it looks like a defensive posture. I agree, Grant said, but I wouldn't discount offensive measures as well. No, Vance chuckled. We're in for a fight for sure. We lost contact with the Carolina. We did? Lost telemetry, too right after they reported the destruction of the alien base on Ganymede. Vance rubbed his chin with his thumb and index finger. Several possible explanations. Jamming, equipment failure, out of line of sight. Sure, but it doesn't make any difference as far as our mission is concerned. The Carolina has no role to play in this battle. He hated how callous he sounded. What are your orders, John? I see nothing that would dictate a change from the original battle plan, so for now, we'll stick with that. Sound battle stations, and we'll get this show on the road. He tried to sound confident, but he had no illusions that they would escape this battle without casualties. Truth be told, he doubted any of them would live to tell the story. He looked toward his first officer and gave him a nod. Battle stations, battle stations, the first officer said into the ship-wide calm. All hands to your stations. Prepare for combat. Grant could hear the same orders from the bridge of the Jackson. The two destroyers were about to unleash the fury of hell itself on the alien interlopers. Target the space station. Conventional missiles. Launch on my command. He rolled his shoulders to release some tension, took a deep breath, let it out, 
and said, Fire Missile One. Fire Missile One, the XO said. Firing Missile One, the weapons officer said. The ship vibrated as an angel of death left it and accelerated toward its target. Missile One away. Time to target? Six minutes, the weapons officer said. Fire Missile Two, Grant said. Firing Missile Two. Again, the ship vibrated as the missile blasted out of its launch tube. Missile two away. The Jackson has launched its first missile, the XO said, and its second. Now they waited. Though they had nuclear-armed missiles, they were using conventional missiles. They did not want to destroy the station. They wanted to disable, so they could board and look for the tech. The enemy would have a missile defense capability, but only one of his missiles needed to get through. The graphical representation showed the locations of his ships, the space station, and the four missiles. He glanced around the bridge. Everybody was watching the missiles creep toward the space station. In war, any war, the waiting was the hard part. Either their attack would be successful, or their attack would fail. He had no control over the outcome now, but with each minute that passed, he felt a little more confident. The missiles had been accelerating all the way, and the difference was visible on the display. The closer they got, the faster they moved, and the more difficult they would be to intercept. After what seemed like an eternity, the weapons officer said, Thirty seconds. More time passed. The alien's window of opportunity was closing fast. Ten seconds. The first missile disappeared from the graphical display. Then the second, and the third, and the fourth. What happened? The weapons officer was busy at his station. I don't know, he said. Then, holy shit, talk to me. Lasers? They took them out with lasers. Show me. This is the last twenty seconds, he said. The image on the visual side of the main monitor adjusted, giving them a close-up view of a missile racing toward the space station, which was getting larger by the second. This is the first missile, as seen from the second missile, he said. The missile flared in a burst of white light and vanished. He replayed it in slow motion, and Grant could see the moment the missile was struck. Its midsection vanished in a cloud of vapor, followed by an explosion that obliterated the missile. A laser, you say? Only thing I can think of that would vaporize the missile's superstructure like that. The explosion that followed was the missile's fuel tank exploding. A long silence filled the bridge. Grant glanced toward the screen showing the bridge of the Jackson. He imagined the astonished expression on Vance's face was a mirror image of his own. He heard the Jackson's weapons officer say, It came from one of the spheres. It fired four times in three and a half seconds. One, two, three, four. And the missiles were gone. Very fast targeting. Very accurate. Very impressive. His last words struck Grant as singularly inappropriate given the situation, but he had to admit that he too was impressed. They knew the aliens had advanced technology, they just didn't know what form it would take. Now they knew. Vance said, We might be able to overwhelm them with sheer numbers of missiles. Only one has to get through to do the job. Grant looked at his own weapons officer who shook his head and said, Even if we could fire all our missiles at once, which we can't, I doubt any would get through. Their fire control computers are too fast and too accurate. They only used one sphere. They have eight of them. We should assume they are interlinked, so they don't all go after the same targets. Grant said, Comms, send a message to Earth, notifying them that Attack Plan Alpha-1 failed, and we are executing Alpha-2. He looked at Vance on his monitor. Railgun status? Vance looked to one side and then back. Charged and ready to fire. He looked at his own weapons officer. Charged and ready the officer said. Initiate attack plan Alpha-2 on my command. Each destroyer carried two railguns, 
Each railgun used a massive electromagnetic pulse to launch a projectile at high velocity and depended on its kinetic energy to destroy whatever it hit. Unlike a missile, which had to accelerate a relatively heavy payload to its maximum velocity, which wasn't particularly high, a railgun got its enormous velocity from the initial launch, and in the absence of friction in space, would not lose any of that velocity as it traveled. In theory, it would continue in a straight line at its original velocity until it ran into something. The projectile also had the advantage of being small, making it a difficult target to hit. And unlike the six minutes it took the missiles to cover the distance between them and the space station, a railgun projectile would reach its target in under a minute. He had never heard of one being intercepted. Let's see them shoot down one of these puppies, he said. Weapons, fire. An audible thump accompanied the simultaneous firing of the two railguns. The Jackson fired a second or two later. Then they waited. Forty seconds, the weapons officer said. On the graphical display, the projectiles were closing on their targets fast. Thirty seconds. Twenty seconds. A brilliant flash of light appeared on the real-time display. All four projectiles vanished from the graphical display. Grant's chest tightened. Talk to me. The weapons officer looked up. They're gone. What's gone? The projectile, sir. They're gone. How? That flash? As near as I can tell, instead of targeting each projectile, they fired a single widespread laser. It would be like running into an invisible wall of energy. It vaporized the projectiles when they ran into it. Missile launch detected, the tactical officer said. From the surface... Grant saw it on the graphical display. It's moving fast, he said. There was a pause before the tactical officer replied. Very fast, sir. Even climbing out of Europa's gravity well, its velocity is at least five times that of our missiles. Target? Coming right at us. Just the one missile? Just the one missile, sir. That was when Captain John Hiram Grant knew they had lost. Maybe if they had a dozen ships, like the Robert E. Lee, they could overwhelm the aliens' defenses with sheer numbers. But somehow he doubted they would prevail, even then. They were simply outclassed by the aliens' superior technology. He turned to Vance's image on his monitor. Commander Vance, break off and make a run for it. I'll try to provide cover. He held up a hand before Vance could voice an objection. That's an order, Zack. Vance's face fell, but he nodded and turned to his bridge crew to give the order. There was little room for maneuvering in orbit. The forces of gravity and the laws of orbital mechanics made anything other than minor course corrections impractical in terms of fuel consumption. But that didn't mean there was nothing they could do. Grant turned to his XO. Set a collision course for the space station and execute a hard burn. His XO gave him a questioning look and then spoke into the ship's intercom. All crew, prepare for emergency hard burn. I repeat, prepare for immediate emergency hard burn. He turned to the helm officer. Helm, set collision course. Maximum thrust. The roar of the Robert E. Lee's powerful main thrusters kicked in, reverberating through the ship. The acceleration slammed Grant into his chair as the ship began moving. He hoped that would raise his threat value and cause the aliens to focus on his ship instead of the Jackson, which was moving into a higher orbit. Open a channel to the Lewis B. Puller. A moment later, the captain of the Puller appeared on one of his monitors. Looks like we're outgunned, he said. What are your orders, sir? I have ordered the Jackson to run. I'm ordering you to do the same, Sam. Good luck. He watched the lieutenant give the order and then turned his attention back to the battle. There was nothing more he could do for the other two ships. Thirty seconds to missile impact. 
the tactical officer said calmly. Activate PDCs, the XO said. They felt more than heard the point defense cannon's rapid fire as they tried to shoot down the incoming missile. The Jackson was doing the same. Despite firing a thousand rounds between them, they failed to hit the missile as it passed between them in the blink of an eye. It was just too fast. Missed us, said the XO. No, sir, said Tactical. We weren't the target. It's going for the troop carrier. Grant watched in horror as the blip representing the missile on the graphical display board closed with the blip representing the Lewis B. Puller, which was trailing them at a considerable distance. The two blips converged and disappeared from the screen. Another launch, sir, the tactical officer said. Two missiles. Grant didn't have to ask what they were targeting. This was what must have happened to the Carolina at Ganymede. It galled him that they had inflicted no damage whatsoever on the enemy. They were being swatted away like flies. They had rolled the dice and lost. Zachary Vance's voice interrupted his thoughts. It has been an honor to serve with you, sir. Grant gazed at his friend for a moment, then straightened and saluted. The honor has been mine, Commander. Twelve. Twenty years before the end of the world. Holly woke with a start. Memories were waiting for her. The earthquake. The floor jerking one way, then another. The ear-piercing screech of metal on metal. The low, mournful wail. The ceiling had collapsed, raining rocks and ice down on her, crushing her legs, crushing her arms, crushing her chest, crushing her head. She heard her bones breaking, felt them breaking. Then came the pain, like fire rushing through her body, consuming everything. Something had rammed into her chest, and she couldn't catch her breath. She choked on the blood filling her mouth. Then, in a moment of perfect clarity, she knew she was dying. A sadness swept over her like a wave and carried her into the waiting darkness. But she wasn't dead. Her heart was thumping in her ears. Her chest rose and fell as she breathed. In and out. In and out. Such a wonderful thing, the simple act of breathing. She opened her eyes. The ceiling above her glowed with soft bluish-white light that seemed to emanate from everywhere and nowhere, providing just enough illumination to see by. She wiggled her toes. They were under something, something lightweight, like a sheet. Her gaze followed the ceiling to a wall and a low dresser at the foot of the bed. A yellowish-green sheet covered her, an ugly vomit yellow, but she could live with that as long as it meant she was alive. She shifted her body a little and discovered that the bed was both firm and soft. She wiggled her toes again. The sheet felt like satin, but didn't try to slide off onto the floor like every satin sheet she had ever owned. Well, she had never owned satin sheets, but Theo had. The light from the ceiling brightened when she sat up. She looked around the room. A door on her left stood ajar, revealing a bathroom, then a closet with a mirrored sliding door, and in the corner, another door, this one closed. Then the dresser and a corner desk with a tall, narrow vase, displaying a single white rose. The room could have been any mid-range hotel room in New Amsterdam, except for the large painting that dominated the wall to her right. Two meters long and a meter high, it was a seascape, the most bizarre seascape she had ever seen. In the foreground was a rocky shoreline, curving out and away on both sides, forming a bay with gentle waves rolling in. No plants or seaweed or any other signs of life were in evidence. Rugged hills rose in the red-hazed distance, in both directions, equally devoid of life. The sea stretched toward a too-near horizon under a red sky, streaked with scudding reddish-brown clouds caught in mid-flight by the artist's brush. A moon with an achingly beautiful set of rings hung just above the horizon. 
The waves rolled lazily up the rocky beach, and just as lazily back out. Oddly sluggish. Whoa! The waves were really moving. So were the clouds. It wasn't a painting. It was a vid of some place that shouldn't exist. She slipped out of bed and took a step toward the vid screen, then had to put her hand on it to keep from falling, because the gravity was lower than she had expected. Was she still on Ganymede? She looked at the vid again. The air was denser than she had first thought, like rust-colored fog. Standing closer had brought more of the rocky beach into view. She took a step back and sat on the bed, staring at the scene, her mind balking at the inescapable conclusion. The vid wasn't a vid. It was a window. A window looking out on an unearthly seascape. The ringed moon in the sky wasn't a moon at all. It was the planet Saturn, which meant she was on one of Saturn's moons, and there was only one moon in the solar system with an appreciable atmosphere. She was on Titan. It was... She couldn't find the words. A tiny disk in the red sky peered through a break in the clouds, another of Saturn's moons, though she did not know which one. Saturn had a lot of them. Searching the sky, she found two more. She was seeing with her own eyes something no human had ever seen before. Tears pooled in her eyes. The fragment had brought her here, of that she had no doubt, and had repaired her broken body and built this room for her. An unexpected giggle burbled up. He had built a house on Titan for her. It was wonderful, fairy tale wonderful. Wonderful in the truest sense of the word, full of wonder. She walked around the bed to the mirror on the closet door and examined herself. She ran her hands over her breasts, across her tummy, down her hips and thighs. There were no scars, not even the scar on her arm from an altercation with an electric carving knife one Thanksgiving with her brother's family. No moles, none of those odd little bumps and tags you inevitably picked up with age. Even the birthmark on her left thigh was gone. In the top dresser drawer, she found a supply of panties, bras, and socks. She ignored the lacy black panties and the racy red thong, which the fragment must have thought she would like, and chose a practical light blue pair. They fit perfectly, as did the matching bra. In fact, the bra might have been the most comfortable one she had ever worn. Bra makers on Earth who she suspected were all men, could learn a thing or two from the fragment. On the dresser sat a small box containing a variety of makeup items, which she ignored. Who was she going to impress on Titan? In the other drawer, she found two pairs of jeans and a pair of nice-looking slacks. She went for the slacks, which, of course, fit perfectly. In the closet hung a full-length dress, two skirts, several blouses, two t-shirts, and on the floor, several pairs of shoes. She selected a light blue blouse and black pumps with one-inch heels. She stood in front of the mirror and liked what she saw. Not bad for a thirty-two-year-old woman whose last memory was of being crushed to death deep beneath the surface of one of Jupiter's moons. How long had she been asleep? Long enough to travel from Ganymede to Titan, which was a long way. Saturn's orbit being twice as far out as Jupiter's. She had no idea what kind of propulsion technology the fragment had, but the Asimov would have taken another five years to travel that far. Ten if Saturn and Jupiter were on opposite sides of the sun from each other. Was she the only survivor? The closed door in the corner presented another one of those extraordinarily ordinary-looking doorknobs. She stepped out into a nondescript corridor, curving away in both directions. The door clicked shut behind her, making her jump. She opened it and peeked in, just to reassure herself that the room was still there. It was silly, but it made her feel better. Turning to the left, she immediately came to an archway, opening into a circular room. It was smaller than the room on Ganymede, but otherwise looked the same. The same burgundy carpet with blue swirls, the same brick fireplace, 
the same coffee table, though smaller, and with only two chairs. A hollowness formed in her chest as she considered the implications of that. The fragment, or rather his avatar, sat in one of the chairs, with one leg casually crossed over the other. He was reading a book. It looked like a real book, which it couldn't be. Or maybe it could. Who knew? In any case, the fragment could probably access any information he wanted in an instant, without resorting to anything so primitive as dead tree technology. It was an archaic affectation for her benefit, part of the human-alien interface he had created for her. He placed the book on the table and stood. Ollie, you look well. Can I interest you in a cup of tea? Yes, please. He disappeared into the kitchen and returned a few minutes later with a tray holding two cups of tea, a sugar bowl, and a small pitcher of milk. They settled into their chairs with their cups of tea. Am I the only survivor? she asked. I could not save the others, he said. I am sorry. A tear formed in one eye and rolled down her cheek. She hadn't known them all that well, only a few weeks before the long sleep and a single day after, but they had shared the greatest adventure humans had ever embarked on, and that was enough to make them family. Now they were gone, and she was alone. What happened? The Esimov was carrying a small thermonuclear device. Major Clark took control of... A what? A thermonuclear device. A bomb. That's not possible. How could someone smuggle a nuclear bomb onto the Asimov with no one noticing? It appears not everyone on your world is pleased with the presence of aliens in your solar system, and they took advantage of your mission to express their displeasure. She set her cup down. It did not surprise her that there were people who might want to do something like this, but it would require people on the inside, people high up in the space programs. They had to have gotten a nuclear bomb from somewhere, and somehow gotten it on board the Asimov undetected. Neither of those was trivial. And Benny was part of it? She pictured him at the training center's food court, laughing at something Gina said. He was like a kid who never grew up, a trait both endearing and irritating. But a suicide bomber? She couldn't find a place for that in her mental image of him. You're sure it was Benny? You saw Dr. Patil and Dr. Wang trying to escape the Esimov? That left only Major Clark on the ship when it pulled away from the station, resulting in their deaths. She shuddered. Her mind replayed the image of Kari trying desperately to get Lee into the space station airlock, the docking bridge tearing away, Kari being sucked out of the airlock, her face frozen in terror, Wang Lee's body tumbling head over heels after her. Those images would follow her around for the rest of her life. The fragment must have sensed she was struggling to process this and waited a few moments before continuing. When I realized Major Clark had put the Asimov in a descending orbit that would put it a hundred meters above the surface when it was over the mining base again, I ordered the three of you into an elevator that carried us deeper into the planet. Do you remember that part? Her memory of it was fragmentary, like a partially assembled jigsaw puzzle, but it was there. She nodded. He continued. When the nuclear device detonated, it vaporized a section of the space elevator's tether and sent the space station flying off into space. The force of the blast traveled down the main shaft into the moon's interior and obliterated my mining operation. Drones recovered the space station and towed it to another moon until I decided what to do with it. Had Major Clark waited half a minute longer, I could have rescued Dr. Patil and Dr. Wang from the station. Half a minute, just thirty seconds, and Kari and Lee would still be alive. But Benny hadn't waited. The section of the base we were in collapsed. Dr. Walker was decapitated and died instantly. Colonel Federov's injuries, though not as dramatic as Dr. Walker's, 
were beyond my ability to repair in that setting. You suffered extensive damage too, but I was able to stabilize you and induce a temporary state of stasis until I could bring in a ship capable of making the journey to Titan. I already had... Holly held up a hand to stop him. She remembered most of what he described, at least the conscious parts. She closed her eyes and tried to bring the last few minutes of it into focus. You threw yourself over me, she said, to protect me. Though not indestructible, this body is quite durable. Why not Tolia? He paused, as though he was thinking about how to respond. I realized I could try to save one of you, but not both. I chose you. He had not really answered the question, and she had the impression he was holding something back. Maybe he employed some kind of algorithm that determined she had a higher likelihood of surviving Mentolia. Or maybe he flipped a coin, and it was her lucky day. How long have I been asleep? Five hundred ninety-six of your days. A year and a half. A little more than that, but yes. If he was to be believed, he possessed propulsion technology capable of traveling from Jupiter to Saturn in a year and a half. Or less, depending on how long she was asleep after they reached Titan. That was astonishing, but she had experienced so many astonishing things in the last twenty-four hours, at least from her point of view, that she had run out of astonishment and had to make do with merely being amazed. She finished her tea and walked over to the fireplace. It burned brightly and smelled wonderful. Just another perfectly ordinary piece of amazing alien technology. She turned to face him. You went to considerable trouble to rescue me from an attack aimed at you by others of my race. Why? What you call the Deathbringer. Is that not why you sought me out? Our mission was to establish contact with you, she said, in hopes you can help us survive the Deathbringer. Can you? Please sit and let me tell you a story, he said. He refilled both their cups and stirred in her usual amount of milk and sugar for her. I discovered your species 11,734 years ago, he began. That was near... Wait, she said, holding up a hand. You discovered us 11,734 years ago? Yes. Earth years? I am older than I look. He maintained a straight face for a moment and then smiled. Holly couldn't help but smile back. His humor might be a simulacrum, but it was an awfully good one. That was near the end of your world's last ice age. Your ancestors were well on their way toward establishing themselves as the dominant species on the planet, having outcompeted most other hominids. It was obvious you had the potential to become an advanced species. You intrigued me, and I have been observing you ever since. He paused, which was a good thing, because she was still trying to wrap her mind around this revelation. Up to this point, she had thought of him as an alien who happened upon the human race and decided to introduce himself. This was true enough, but it turns out he had allowed twelve thousand years to pass before revealing himself. What was she supposed to make of that? How old are you? The question is not as easy to answer as you might think. I am what one of your speculative writers once called... An outside context problem, by which he meant something that exists in a context entirely outside your own, leaving few, if any, common points of reference by which to orient yourself to it. As a result, it defies any rational explanation. She paraphrased something he had said earlier. I lack the conceptual framework with which to understand something like you. As to my age... Let's just say I was alive when your planet was forming out of the accretion disk of a recently born star. My initial... Wait, she said, holding up her hand again. He was claiming to be at least four and a half billion years old, 
On that scale, the entire history of her species was barely the blink of an eye. Are you immortal? No, just long-lived. So not immortal, but maybe close enough to be a distinction without a difference. His lifespan was on the scale of the lifespans of stars. How could a being live that long? What would it be like to live that long? How did he avoid being bored out of his gourd? The whole thing was preposterous, although she herself had once written, Set aside your preconceived notions about what an alien might or might not be like. It won't be like anything you can imagine. Huh. That Holly Burton had no idea. Okay, she said, I do not know whether to believe you, but please continue. He smiled apologetically. At least, she would interpret it as apologetic, if it appeared on another human being's face, which was presumably what he intended, since the Avatar was a human-alien interface. Whether he experienced anything remotely resembling human emotions was a different question, one to which she suspected she would never have a satisfactory answer. He continued, My initial assessment of your species proved correct. You have dominated your planet and now stand at the edge of space travel. You have avoided destroying yourselves with thermonuclear weapons, though that possibility still exists among the many possible but as yet undetermined futures that lie ahead of you. You are in the grip of a global environmental catastrophe, brought on by the damage you have done to your world, which might or might not prove survivable. Now you face a planet killer which is not survivable. You are familiar with the Fermi paradox? The abrupt change in direction threw her. He was certainly taking a roundabout way to tell her whether he could save them from the Deathbringer. I am familiar with it, she said. Given the magnitude of the known universe, in both space and time, it seems unlikely that ours is the only technologically advanced species. In fact, there should be lots of them out there. The Fermi Paradox asks, Where are they? Why haven't we detected them? They are indeed out there, he said. The nearest one is only 237 light years away, a hop, skip, and a jump on a galactic scale. Unfortunately, their civilization died out some 65 million years ago, around the time the age of the dinosaurs on your world came to an end making room for the explosion of mammalian life that followed. That civilization called itself the Lormna. At a spatial distance of 237 light years and a temporal distance of 60 million years, you and they are practically next-door neighbors, though you will never meet. In my journeys, I have discovered the remnants of 157 advanced civilizations, three of which survived long enough to achieve spaceflight. That was interesting. One hundred and fifty-seven alien races, only three of which developed the technology to leave their home world and venture into space. And even they eventually perished. Why was that? Were all sentient species doomed to extinction by one means or other? He continued his story. Many civilizations have come before you. Many will come after. Some are emerging as we speak. When set against the backdrop of the entire history of your space-time continuum, your civilization has been here barely any time at all, and will disappear just as soon. This, then, is the answer to your Fermi paradox. Intelligent life is rare, and when it does appear, it is fragile. There are many ways for it to perish. The longest surviving civilization I have found lasted some 17,000 years. Internecine warfare brought them down, and they never recovered. Another civilization created a particularly virulent bioweapon that got out of control and wiped them out. Another polluted their planet so badly it turned into a greenhouse world, not unlike your neighbor Venus. External catastrophes cut others short. Brief but deadly flares in their sun's output, planet-killing asteroids, 
things like that. Which brings us to the death bringer. Finally, this was the only question that mattered as far as the Asimov's mission was concerned. Could he save her world? And if he could, would he? The death bringer, he said, is not an asteroid, as some of your astronomers think, or even a rogue planet, as others think. It is a failed star, a brown dwarf that wasn't big enough to ignite its core and become a full-fledged star like your sun. It is about the size of Jupiter, but sixty-five times more massive, and happened to pass close enough to your sun to be pulled into its gravity well, though it is moving too fast for your sun to capture it. So, it will pass through your solar system in an arcing orbit, swing around your sun, and leave on a new vector. As it passes, it will throw Mars out of the solar system, obliterate Venus, toss Earth into the sun, and take Mercury with it when it leaves. Her mind slipped mental gears as she tried to grasp this revelation. The inner planets gone? All of them? That just couldn't be true. But of course, it could be true, and according to the fragment, it was true. It took her several seconds to formulate the obvious question. Can't you stop it? Destroy it or deflect it or something? I cannot. Your world is doomed, and there is nothing anybody can do about it. Despite the preparation he had laid down leading up to this, it hit her with an almost physical force. Their mission had been for nothing. Humanity was doomed to disappear from the stage of history. A breath, a sigh, a brief cry in the night. We were here. Then nothing. She wanted to weep. To weep for Earth. To weep for all that might have been. To weep for all the unborn generations that would never be. But all she found inside herself was an emptiness, a numbness a hopelessness that could not even bring forth tears. The room was silent, except for the crackling of the fire in the fireplace. She finally asked, Why am I here? Why did you bother saving me? If my people are going to die, take me back to Earth, so I can die with them. He brought his hands together so that the fingertips of one touched the fingertips of the other, as if in prayer. I cannot save your world, but it might be possible to save a remnant of your people, enough to rebuild human civilization somewhere else. I would like very much to see your species survive, if only to see what it becomes. He paused. So, Holly Burton, do you want to save the human species? Her heart caught in her throat. Yes. It will require you to become a very different person than you are now. I don't care. Whatever it takes, I'll do it. Thirteen. Eighteen years before the end of the world. Chung Tung glared at the offending vid screen and swiped a hand over the virtual control board to clear yet another lost game of Min Sa. It was one of those solitaire games that was easy to learn, but infuriatingly difficult to master. The clock told him that two hours had passed since the ear tucks had departed with two scientists for the Rotunga Science Station at the Earth Moon L4 point. There were no other ships in or out of Tiangong Station on this shift. Another slow night on the Earth's busiest space station but regulations required two operators on duty at all times. At least they had gravity, now that the command center had been moved from the hub to the rings. He looked over at Song Guanyin. What are you watching? She looked up from her tablet. Hong Kong World. Really? Unlike you, I try to keep up on national and foreign affairs. She was ribbing him. She was as likely to pass the time playing Min Sa as he was. There had been a time when traffic passing through Tiangong Station was heavy enough that they didn't have time for games. Anything interesting? 
Another piece by Zhao Jinjing, demanding that the lunar base be shut down. Well, it is an expensive endeavor, and nobody will ever make any money off it. Think they'll shut down Tiangong? Eventually. She raised her hands over her head and stretched. Some people think getting off the planet is our best chance for survival as a species. Tung snorted. The Great Collapse put an end to that kind of thinking. Nobody can afford space programs anymore. Except maybe the CRA, and their space program focuses on military and scientific interests. What's that on your board? she asked. He looked at the blinking blue light. Huh. When is the last time we had an unscheduled arrival? Uh, like never? Want me to take it? Nah, I've got it. He brought the hailing channel up, looked at Guan Yin, and put it on the main viewer. The image of a woman appeared, seated in a dark green winged back chair that could have come from his grandmother's house. She looked to be around thirty, probably of northern European extraction, with dark blonde hair cascading over her shoulders. She wore a white blouse and white skirt. But what stood out most about her was the web of glowing fiber-optic cables radiating away from her in all directions, that and the neural cap perched on her head. She was directly linked with her ship. He had heard of such technology, but as far as he knew, it was still theoretical. Spaceship Gabriel's Fire calling Tiangong Station, she said. Repeat, Spaceship Gabriel's Fire calling Tiangong Station. She spoke Mandarin better than a lot of native speakers he knew. I'll check the registry, Guan Yin said. Tung waited a moment, activated his mic, and said in English, Gabriel's Fire, this is Tiangong Station. He glanced toward Guan Yin, who shook her head. We do not have a record of a ship by that name. Could you provide a registry number, please? The woman on the screen smiled and said in English, I'm afraid I do not have a registry number for you. Gabriel's fire is not from Earth. Tung looked at Guan Yin, who stared back with a what-the-hell expression. Guan Yin recovered her composure first. I'll wake the commander. Gabriel's fire? Tung said. Please stand by. Of course, the woman said. I imagine you need to wake someone up about now. Colonel Zhang Feng examined himself in the mirror and tugged at one of the several medals on his uniform to get it lined up with the rest. He was a veteran of six wars and had seen more than his share of death and ruin, mostly to no good end, as far as he could tell. Politicians declared wars. People died. Things went back to the way they were, and little changed. He had frown lines and gray hairs to show for his service, and the medals, of course, which he planned to put in a box and never look at again. Tiangong Station would be his last posting, after which he would retire and spend time with his children, grandchildren, and if fortune smiled on him, great-grandchildren. He replayed in his mind the message from General Hu. He was to prepare for the arrival of a VIP. The message did not say who the VIP might be or when he might arrive, but Hu's message suggested it would be soon and made it clear that this person was to be received with utmost honor and respect and assisted in every way possible. The honor of the People's Republic is at stake, Hu said. Feng closed his eyes and let out a sigh. When he was a younger man, he would have seen this as an opportunity, but at sixty-three years of age, he could only view it as a danger, an opportunity to mess something up. Danger and opportunity. Always two sides of the same coin. Such was life. The comm unit on his wrist vibrated. He tapped it. Colonel, this is Second Lieutenant Song Guan Yin, in the command center. We have been hailed by an unscheduled vessel, calling itself Gabriel's Fire. We have no record of a ship by that name. The pilot claims she has no registry number, because the spaceship is not from Earth. A spaceship, Lieutenant? 
or a space plane. She claims it is a spaceship, sir. I will be there shortly. In the meantime, you are to treat this visitor with utmost honor and respect. So this was the VIP General Hu had referred to, but in a spaceship, not from Earth? As far as he knew, there were no space docks anywhere else in the solar system, but that was someone else's problem. His job was to welcome this VIP with honor and respect, lend whatever help he could, and hope nothing went wrong. Ten minutes later, he strode into the command center. First Lieutenant Chung Tung and Second Lieutenant Song Guan Yin were on station. The image of the pilot of the mystery spaceship was still on the big viewer. He took in the woman and the neural network she was plugged into. I have command, he said. You have command, sir, Tung replied. Show me the ship. We are still trying to locate it, sir, Chung said. It is coming up behind us to match orbit, but we can't get an exact fix on it. Wait. Got it. The radar return is so faint, I would not have noticed it if I wasn't looking for it. Put it on the vid screen. Feng stared at the image of a spaceship unlike any he had ever seen. It was basically a spindle and wheel design, the same design used for Tiangong. The wheel, located near the forward end of the ship, had a diameter somewhat less than half the length of the spindle. It was not rotating, which meant no gravity. Fore and aft of the wheel were wide hexagonal sections, wrapped like collars around the spindle. With the forward sections extending only a short distance in front of the ring, and the aft sections extending half the distance to the end of the ship, where the main thrusters were located. At the point where the hexagonal sections aft of the wheel ended, a half-dozen silvery arches emerged from the spindle, curving out and then back toward the thruster cones. It reminded him of a squid's tentacles trailing behind it, though these were rigid. If he had to guess, he would say they had something to do with the ship's propulsion system, but he couldn't imagine what. The ship filled most of the view, but was nearly invisible against the background of space, more an absence than a presence. Reduce magnification to normal. He wanted to get a sense of its actual size. This is normal magnification, sir. That meant it was alarmingly close to the station, or alarmingly large, or both. Are you sure? Yes, sir. Range? Two thousand meters. It appears to be holding position relative to us. It was two kilometers away, and still filled most of the screen. How big is it? Chung hesitated. According to my instruments, it is five hundred meters long, and the ring is two hundred meters across. Half a kilometer long. Feng's heart rate picked up. The behemoth was bigger than his space station. How did it get so close, without setting off proximity alarms? I can answer that, Lieutenant Song said. Apart from presenting an extraordinarily small radar profile, it is using some kind of signal-absorbing technology. I have been pinging it across a range of frequencies, and nothing is coming back. I think the only reason we can detect it at all is because they want us to. Stop scanning immediately, he said. Your orders were to treat our visitors with respect. Yes, sir. Her face darkened. He brought the image of the ship's pilot back up and studied her face. She was definitely of northern European extraction. She was in her late twenties or early thirties, with shoulder-length dark blonde hair. He activated video from his side so she could see him as well. Gabriel's fire? I am Colonel Zhang Feng, commander of Tiangong Station. With whom do I have the honor of speaking? A pleasant-sounding alto voice came back. Colonel Zhang, I am Dr. Holly Burton, formerly of the spaceship Asimov. Chung and Song exchanged looks. Feng stared at the viewer at a loss for words. Lieutenant Song brought up an image on a secondary viewer. It was the crew of the Asimov before they left Earth. 
she zoomed in on Holly Burton. He looked back and forth between the two. It was the same woman. He rubbed his chin with his thumb and index finger. So, this was General Hu's VIP. He cleared his throat. Dr. Burton, on behalf of the People's Republic of China, it is my honor to welcome you to Tiangong Station. My orders are to provide any assistance you require. How may I be of service? Chung and Song exchanged another look. Thank you for your welcome and your hospitality, Colonel. I require no assistance at this time. I merely wanted to inform you I am going to park Gabriel's fire two kilometers away from Tiangong Station while I am on Earth. I assure you it poses no threat to your station. He was not happy with a colossal ship parked so close to his station, but his orders were clear. Certainly, and thank you for the notification. He paused. I wonder if you can make your ship more visible, so incoming and outgoing ships can avoid it? Oh, of course. The spaceship abruptly lit up, as though someone had turned on all the lights in a city skyscraper at once. One of their monitors began pinging its location. Will that be sufficient? she asked. Indeed. Thank you. One other thing, the woman said. Gabriel's fire is a warship. It is under the control of an advanced AI when I am not on board, and will defend itself if the AI believes it is being threatened. I advise you to warn approaching ships to keep their distance. A warship, the biggest spaceship he had ever seen, was parked two kilometers from his station, and it was a warship. Dr. Burton's assurances notwithstanding, he was definitely not happy with the arrangement, but there was nothing he could do about it. Understood. Do you require the use of a space plane for your journey to Earth's surface? A kind offer, Colonel, but Gabriel's fire carries its own space plane. Would you care to visit the station? It would be my honor to share a meal with you. Ah, well, no. I am on something of a tight schedule. But thank you for the offer. Perhaps another time? Of course, he said. If there is any way I can be of assistance in the future, do not hesitate to call on me. I believe I speak for the People's Republic of China in this matter. Thank you, Colonel Zhang. Until next time. She ended the call. Chung and Song were both grinning at him. He couldn't help but grin back. This would be one hell of a story to tell his grandchildren. Fourteen. Holly took in a deep breath and let it out again. Her heart was pounding and her hands were trembling. She had somehow managed to look and sound like she knew what she was doing, and as much as she would have liked a proper meal made by human hands, she wasn't sure she could maintain the illusion of self-confidence all the way through a dinner with Colonel Zhang. Besides, she really was on a tight schedule. An auspicious beginning, the ship's AI said. She said, The PRC does seem to be taking a positive position toward our arrival, but I doubt we will meet with the same response from all the alliances. Nonetheless, you acquitted yourself well. You mean I faked it pretty well. She understood imposter syndrome, had lived with it most of her adult life. But this emissary thing took it to a whole new level. She really was an imposter, pretending to be someone she was not and never could be. He should have sent an avatar instead, maybe even one that looked like her. A lethargy settled over her as the adrenaline rush wore off. Would you like me to adjust your body chemistry? the ship asked. She sighed. I suppose so. She could do it herself. She had some control over her nanites, or she could do some deep breathing exercises and eventually get the same result. But it was easier to let the ship do it. A few moments later, the trembling stopped, the lethargy abated, and she felt energized, ready to take on the world. Disengage neural net, she said. The flowing lines disappeared, 
and the neural cap lifted off her head. There was always a momentary feeling of emptiness when she disconnected from the ship, as though she had lost one of her senses. She released the harness that secured her in the chair and launched herself across the common area, which was modeled after the main room of the habitat on Titan. Prep Eos for departure, she said. I wish you would take a few guardians with you, the ship said. There are people on Earth who perceive you as a threat and will go to any lengths to stop you. She reached her private quarters. We've been over this, she said while she changed her clothes. The whole point of an emissary is to provide a non-threatening intermediary between the fragment and the human race. An alien warship in orbit will already have frightened them. What are they going to think if I show up with a cohort of alien killing machines? I can make them look and act human, you know. Yeah, like that would be easier to explain. She hung an amulet around her neck. It enabled her to communicate with Gabriel's fire from anywhere, and was one of the many places in the universe where the fragment maintained a presence, albeit a small one. Satisfied with the look, she headed toward the hangar bay. Holly, the ship said, three spaceships have come over the horizon. Their current trajectory will intercept ours in twenty-two minutes. She returned to the command chair and plugged back into the neutral net. A virtual three-dimensional image of the ships appeared in front of her. Zoom in. Details came into view. Their markings identified them as British. They were definitely spaceships, not space planes. Two had point defense cannons, missile launchers, and rail guns. The third had PDCs, but no offensive weapons that she could see. Analysis? Two are attack ships. High speed, high damage. Each is equipped with two PDCs, four missile launchers, two rail guns. The third ship is a troop carrier equipped with PDCs and breaching pods. The fragment had told her that some Earth alliances were building space-based military forces, including warships, so it didn't surprise her to see them. But what did they hope to accomplish? Had they learned nothing from Europa? Nukes? I detect no signs of thermonuclear devices. We are being hailed. All right, then. Let's see what they want. Voice only. A male voice came over the speaker. Alien vessel, this is Major Mike Reed, commanding the British warship HMS Churchill, Warnick, and Sheffield. You have entered Earth's space and are considered a hostile presence. Stand down and prepare to be boarded. He had to be kidding. Did they really expect her to let them board her ship? On the other hand, the British were close allies of the CRA, which had shown itself more than willing to initiate hostilities against the aliens. Can you rebroadcast this channel worldwide? She asked the ship. What a delightfully devious idea. Give me a moment. There. I have taken control of four communication satellites. On your command, I will broadcast this channel live to most of Earth's population in several languages. Do it. She unmuted the mic. Major Reed, this is Dr. Holly Burton, the only survivor of the Jupiter mission and the commander of Gabriel's Fire. The Council of Enclaves is expecting me, and has been informed that this is a peaceful mission— to establish a dialogue between the people of Earth and the aliens. It would be foolish in the extreme for you to engage me with hostile intent. I advise you stand down before you do something that might prove disastrous for the people of Earth. There was no hesitation on the Major's part. Negative, Gabriel's fire. My orders are to quarantine your vessel until we can ensure it is not carrying anything that would be harmful to the inhabitants of this world. Prepare to be boarded. Do not attempt to leave the— Another voice cut in. H.M.S. Churchill, this is Colonel Zhang Feng, commander of Tiangong Station. Major, your hostile intentions present a clear and present danger to this station. Beyond that— Dr. Burton is a guest of the People's Republic of China. 
I strongly advise you to stand down before you commit an act of war against the PRC. This time there was a pause before the Major replied, Colonel Zhang, with all due respect, my business is with Dr. Burton and the aliens we believe are on her ship. You would do well to stay out of it. Holly drew in a deep breath and let it out in a whoosh. The British were in bed with the Americans, and the Americans had some kind of irrational animosity toward aliens, even aliens offering to help avert an extinction-level event. But enough to risk war with an alien race and the PRC? Gabriel, can the station defend itself? She sometimes referred to the ship as Gabriel. It didn't seem to mind. The ship replied, I have accessed the station's security and military systems. Its defensive capabilities are limited to three-point defense cannons designed to destroy meteors and man-made junk floating around the planet. They would be minimally effective against missiles, which may have their own countermeasures. The station has no offensive capabilities. Recommendations? Try to dissuade them from attacking us. If that fails, and they persist in this hostile course of action, I recommend neutralizing the destroyer's offensive capabilities. There is a small risk that one or both destroyers will be inadvertently destroyed in the process. The troop transport can be ignored until it gets close enough to launch breaching pods. Even then, it is unlikely they can breach the ship's hull. However... It may become necessary to destroy the pods at some point. She waved her hand over the panel in front of her to activate the mic. Colonel Zhang, do whatever you think necessary to protect your station, but do not concern yourself with my well-being. Gabriel's fire is more than capable of defending itself. She muted the mic and said, Put some distance between us and the station. Let's try to keep them out of the line of fire. She unmuted. Major Reed, I want to be as clear as I can, so let me repeat myself. I am Dr. Holly Burton, formerly of the Jupiter Six. I am here as the alien's emissary, to establish diplomatic relations between Earth and the aliens, to support the transfer of advanced technologies that may enable humanity to survive the coming of the Deathbringer. In light of your aggressive stance and your threat to board my ship, I must inform you that hostile actions against Gabriel's fire or Tiangong Station will be answered with whatever force is required to repel the attack. Do not test me on this. She muted the mic. Are we clear of the station? I am moving us into a lower orbit, so the station will not be in anybody's line of fire. What are the British ships doing? The Churchill and Warnock are matching our new orbit. They are 120 kilometers away and closing. The Sheffield is moving toward our previous location. I suspect it intends to approach from above and launch breaching pods. She stared at the viewer for a few seconds. Go to battle mode. She imagined what Major Reed was seeing as Gabriel's fire prepared for war. A dozen dish antennae emerged from blisters located here and there on the hull. He wouldn't know what they were, but would guess they had to do with the ship's defenses. Four heavy-looking tubes emerged from the bow, which he would likely identify as railguns, especially when Gabriel's fire slowly turned to bring them to bear on the approaching ships. Two mean-looking guns emerged from the hull, one on each side, and pivoted toward his ships. Four missile launchers rose from blocks on the hull and pivoted toward his ships as well. A large, stubby gun with a short barrel appeared and turned toward his ships. He would have no idea what to make of it, and she hoped she wouldn't have to show him. There would be no doubt in the Major's mind that Gabriel's fire was a warship, preparing to engage his task force. What would he do? Nothing happened for several minutes. The destroyers had stopped a hundred kilometers out. The troop carrier had moved to within ten kilometers. What are they doing? Exchanging encrypted communications with each other. 
they are preparing a coordinated attack. The Churchill and Warnick will launch a full barrage of missiles and then railguns, hoping to surprise us and overwhelm our defenses. The Sheffield will launch breaching pods. You would think it would have occurred to them that deciphering encrypted messages would be trivial for an advanced alien AI. One would think, do I have your permission to respond to their assault per my earlier recommendations? Yes. Several more uneventful minutes passed. Then the ship said, they have launched missiles and are preparing to fire railguns. The image on the main screen showed eight red dots closing fast on her ship. The Churchill has fired its railguns. The Warnock is preparing to do the same. She felt the railgun's projectiles hit the hull. Two hits, no significant damage, the AI said. Gabriel's fire's tactical lasers flashed, and the Churchill's two railguns turned into slag. A moment later, the Warnock's railguns suffered the same fate. Then the Warnock blew apart, leaving behind an expanding sphere of debris. Holly had hoped to avoid loss of life, but it was not to be. A moment later, Gabriel destroyed the Churchill's four missile launchers, leaving it with no offensive capabilities. Four of the incoming missiles vanished from the graphical display, followed shortly by the remaining four. They were no match for Gabriel's fire's point defense lasers. She imagined Major Reed demanding that someone tell him what happened to his missiles and why his railguns were offline. The Sheffield chose that moment to launch its breaching pods. Holly unmuted her mic. Major Reed, I had hoped to avoid loss of life by targeting only your weapons. I regret the loss of the Warnock, but such is the way of war. You attacked me, and I responded. I appeal to you to order the Sheffield to recall its breaching pods. Otherwise, I will have to destroy them. The ship said, I am picking up increased communication traffic between the Sheffield, the Churchill, and a ground station in the Manchester Enclave. The London Enclave is being inundated with calls from other alliances, the general tenor of which is a demand that they cease hostilities. Well... I guess we have everybody's attention now. The People's Republic of China has put their military forces on high alert and moved their nuclear launch status to the highest level short of actually launching. The European Federation and the Russian Federation appear to be doing the same. I hope we haven't started a war. What are the British doing? They have not heightened their military posture, which, under the circumstances could be construed as a de-escalation. The same is true of the CRA. The Christian Republic of America and Britain were probably having a little tete-a-tete -tete about what to do next. She waited. After a while, the Sheffield recalled its breaching pods and began moving off. The Churchill is hailing us. Put him on. Dr. Burton, Major Reed said. I have received orders to stand down. With your permission, the Sheffield will conduct search and rescue operations in the wreckage of HMS Warnock. The connection dropped. Holly blew out a breath of air. Remain in battle mode until the Churchill and Sheffield have left the area. The ship said, Perhaps this has not been as auspicious a beginning as it first appeared. When had it learned sarcasm? 15. Adrian Verhoeven was partway through dinner when the house announced a call. You have an incoming call from Theo Peters. Fiona pressed her lips together. He had promised her a quiet, romantic evening at home and had instructed the house to hold calls. Theo was the only person whose calls had override priority. He couldn't have picked a worse moment to call. Well, two hours later might have been worse. His and Fiona's relationship was at that fragile stage, where they had to either take it to the next level or end it. He mouthed, Sorry. House, accept call. Adrian. Theo? Something has come up. I need you at the airport. 
Adrian reached for his earpiece. Fiona walked out of the room, abandoning the unfinished dinner. Now? I sent a car. Of course he did. Adrian looked out the window. Shit. Theo's car was already waiting out front. Great, he said, looking forward to it. He tried to insert just enough sarcasm into his voice to express how not forward to it he was looking, without sounding outright insubordinate. It was a wasted effort. Theo had already disconnected. The Honorable Theo Dreyfus Peters, Belgium's ambassador to the Council of Enclaves, was not the excitable sort. In fact, he was one of the most unflappable people Adrian had ever met. Whatever had him flapping must be important. Going to the airport meant they were flying somewhere. Adrian hated flying, which was ironic given how much of it he did. He had been lucky to get a job as Theo's personal secretary right out of grad school. He couldn't imagine a better way to learn the ins and outs of international politics. With record-breaking droughts, rising sea levels, the Great Migrations, and an unending supply of local and regional wars, NGOs were crying out for people who knew how to run not-for-profits. That's what Adrian had studied, and that's what he planned to do. Being with Theo provided him with plenty of contacts that would provide invaluable. He might not be able to save the world, but maybe he could save some little part of it. He wandered into the bedroom to confront Fiona. I probably won't be back tonight. I'll call when I know more. Whatever, she said. I'm truly sorry, but it's not like I can say no. She just stared at him. She didn't look angry, more like resigned. He would have preferred angry. Tomas was behind the wheel. Rather than sit alone in the back, Adrian climbed into the front seat. Tomas frowned at him before pulling away from the curb. So, Adrian said, what's going on? I don't know. He got a call. Then he made a bunch of calls and told me to pick you up and take you to the airport. This turned out to be his entire contribution to the conversation for the rest of the drive. Tomas was good at a lot of things, but small talk wasn't one of them. He was Theo's personal bodyguard, had been for many years. Adrian happened to know he carried a gun in a holster under his left arm, hidden from view by a lightweight jacket Adrian had never seen him without. It was raining and dark. Lights from oncoming vehicles reflected jaggedly off the wet pavement. An hour's drive brought them to Geneva International Airport, where they turned onto a utility road that took them to one end of the main runway. They stopped on an abandoned section of tarmac. Nobody else was there. Okay, Adrian said. What now? We wait. Right. It was an empty, creepy-looking place, the kind of place you would take someone to murder them and leave the body for a maintenance guy to find. After a while, headlights announced the approach of two SUVs. They pulled up a short distance away, and several people got out. Three of them wore body armor and carried assault rifles. They positioned themselves to watch for uninvited guests. Tomas produced an umbrella, which he and Adrian huddled under, as they walked over to Theo and a woman Adrian didn't know. Adrian, he said, glad you could make it, like he had a choice. So do you mind telling me what's going on? Ah, well, that will take some explaining, but we have a little time while we wait for Robert. This, by the way, is Anna Lindstrom, he pointed at the woman. Anna? This is Adrian, my personal secretary. They shook hands. It was difficult to make out her features in the dark, but he guessed her to be about his age. She wore a suit of sorts, black slacks, white shirt, open black jacket. She had an earpiece. Do you know who Holly Burton is? Theo asked him. Of course he did. Everyone knew who Holly Burton was. He said, Astronaut, expert on first contact scenarios? One of the Jupiter Six, who perished on Ganymede when a still unexplained nuclear detonation destroyed their ship. 
Well, she arrived at Tiangong Station a couple hours ago. Questions tripped over each other in his head. He picked one. In what? Okay, not the brightest question he might have come up with, but if you are flying from Jupiter to Earth, you have to be flying in something, and he was curious about what it was. It wasn't like there was a shuttle service running between the two planets. Theo raised a bushy eyebrow. In a spaceship, of course. A spaceship with some very advanced technology. A spaceship that has scared the crap out of some people who don't scare easily. Also, the biggest spaceship anybody's ever seen. She claims it wasn't built on Earth, and nobody is disagreeing with her. She has requested a meeting with her brother and myself. Adrian swallowed as he tried to wrap his mind around that. Let me see if I have this right. Holly Burton, who disappeared in the Jovian system two and a half years ago and was presumed dead, has turned up in an unidentified, high-tech, probably alien spaceship to have a spot of tea with you and her brother? Yes, just so though there is also a not insignificant meeting with a council of enclaves to discuss the future of humanity. I think she wants to meet with us first, because she's looking for allies. Her brother and I may be the only people on earth she trusts. Having been a diplomat for twenty years, Theo took nothing at face value. It was an occupational hazard. For his part, Adrian had no interest in ever becoming a diplomat. The Lindstrom woman had said nothing beyond their initial greeting, but seemed as interested in Theo's explanation as he was. Theo filled in the story. Holly Burton had contacted him. He had used his diplomatic connections to alert the Secretary General of the Council of Enclaves, who notified the heads of the alliances that she wanted to meet with them to deliver a message from the aliens. Out of curiosity, Adrian asked, how did she get hold of you? My cell phone. Your cell phone? He tried not to sound as incredulous as he felt. She tapped into a communications satellite, looked me up in a directory, and called me. He retrieved a cloth handkerchief from his pocket and wiped water off his glasses. It was unusual to see anyone wearing glasses these days. I was surprised, he added. Adrian swallowed a laugh. And then you just called up the Secretary General of the Council of Enclaves and asked if he could handle the arrangements? She wants to address the Council and the world. Dr. Madura Singer seemed like a good place to start. And then Madura Singer picked up the phone and made a few calls to, I don't know, the President of the CRA, the Prime Minister of Britain, the President of the People's Republic of China? Theo waved him off. We thought it wise to alert the council members that a representative of a race of aliens had sent an emissary to discuss diplomatic relations. Adrian was used to rubbing shoulders with the world's movers and shakers, but he had no idea you could just call these people up and have a chat with them. It seemed like it should be harder than that. Oh, Theo said, I almost forgot the most interesting part. Great Britain sent a small armada of armed spaceships from the new London station to commandeer her spaceship when it established orbit near Tiangong. Adrian could only stare agog at that. The whole thing was broadcast worldwide from her ship, Gabriel's Fire, which destroyed one of their ships and forced the others to withdraw. I'm surprised you didn't see the broadcast. The roar of a Chinese military jet brought the conversation to a halt as it passed low overhead, circled the airport, and came in for a landing from the other direction, using up most of the main runway before turning and taxiing toward them. It came to a halt about fifty meters from where they were standing. A tall, gray-haired man in a business suit disembarked and walked toward them. Theo stepped forward and shook his hand. Robert, this is Adrian Verhoeven, my personal secretary. And this is Holly's personal protection individual, Anna Lindstrom. Adrian, Anna, this is Robert Burton, Holly's brother. The man wore wire-framed eyeglasses 
perched on a long, thin nose. Apparently, he was old school, too. Throw in the beat-up satchel he carried, and you had the perfect caricature of an old-fashioned country lawyer. An hour later, a silver and black space plane the size of a commercial passenger plane came screaming in from the west. But instead of landing on the runway, it flew low over the control tower to the end of the runway, where they were standing, came to a halt above them, and descended to the tarmac on two vertical landing thrusters. Engines whined down, thrusters retracted, waves of heat poured off the body. It was wider than it was tall, which gave it a squashed look. Two nacelles stood off from the body near the aft end. Those would be the main engines. The plane was all curves, no straight lines anywhere. Two forward-facing windows, atop the rounded nose of the plane, marked the location of the cockpit. A flash of movement caught Adrian's eye, and then was gone. A minute or two passed. Then a door swung open just ahead of the nacelles, and stairs extended out and down to the tarmac. A woman appeared at the top of the stairs. She wore a simple white blouse and a white skirt with a thin black belt and an open black jacket. Dark blonde hair hung loosely over her shoulders. She paused and looked up at the sky. The Lindstrom woman jogged over to her and said something Adrian couldn't make out, then stepped back and waited. The woman, he assumed this was Holly Burton, looked around with a puzzled expression, as though she had never seen an airport before. In that moment, she struck him as... fragile. Sixteen. It was raining when Holly stepped out of her space plane and stood at the top of the steps. The glare of lights reflecting off the wet surface of the tarmac was disorienting, compounded by other confusing sensory assaults. The distant sounds of traffic, the smell of jet fuel and wet asphalt, the wind whipping her hair back. She shivered and pulled her jacket tightly around her. The year on Titan had been a cloistered life, in some ways a year of silence and solitude. The fragment's world was an orderly world, Hers was not. Her world was a disorderly riot of random smells, flashing lights, clashing sounds, weather. All things she would have to get used to again. She had received landing instructions from the tower, which had been expecting her, but ignored them and headed for a little-used section of tarmac where a black sedan and two gray SUVs waited. She used the plane's vertical takeoff and landing thrusters to bring Eos gently to the ground. A small party stood in the rain. Robert and Theo were there, along with Theo's ever-present man, Tomas, and a few other people, including some with assault weapons and wearing combat gear. Presumably they were Theo's people, but after her unexpected encounter with the British, she was feeling a bit paranoid. She tilted her head back and let cold raindrops pelt her face. It was an unexpectedly stimulating sensation. It made her feel young and alive. It made her feel like dancing in the rain. It made her feel... human. She had not known that standing in the rain could be like that. A woman she did not recognize detached herself from the group and walked briskly toward the plane. She wore dark slacks and a dark jacket over a white blouse. She peered out from under her umbrella. Do you require assistance, Dr. Burton? No, she said. It's a bit overwhelming, is all. Take your time. She said something into the mic of her headset and stood back a little. Holly carefully made her way down the steps, getting the feel of Earth's gravity. The nanites in her body had ensured that her muscles did not atrophy or her bones lose density in Titan's low gravity, but her gait was all wrong for Earth. It would take some practice to regain muscle memory. It has been a while since I have seen rain, she said when she reached the bottom of the steps. Real rain, I mean. It rains on Titan, but ethanol just isn't the same as water. The steps folded into the plane behind her, and the door swung shut. She said to the woman, Who are you? Anna Lindstrom, ma'am. I will be your PPI. 
They shook hands. The name and accent matched her Scandinavian features. She was a little taller than Holly, and about the same age. Heavier, too, though it looked like there was more muscle on her than fat. Shoulder-length blonde hair was tied back in a ponytail. She had a pretty face behind the rather severe expression. What's a PPI? Personal protection individual. I need a bodyguard? Tomas thinks so, ma'am. Well, if Tomas thinks so, who am I to argue? Shall we go? She started toward the group waiting by the vehicles, then stopped. Ms. Lindstrom? I would like to have guards posted around the space plane. 24-7. Not to protect the plane. Its autonomous defenses have been armed, and it will protect itself from perceived threats. The guards would be there to keep unauthorized people from getting too close and triggering its defenses. Wouldn't want to vaporize a couple of curious kids who sneaked in to get a look at the alien space plane. Lindstrom looked alarmed at the prospect. A ten-meter perimeter would be good. I'll see to it, ma'am. Please call me Anna. When they reached the vehicles, Theo put his arms around her and pulled her into a long hug, which was unexpected, but not unwelcome. She hugged Robert, then made like she was going to hug Tomas, who took an alarmed step backward. Welcome back, Dr. Burton, he said. You have been missed. Tomas, please call me Holly. As you wish, Dr. Burton. Some things never changed. She was glad. Their motorcade set out for a house Theo owned, an hour south of the airport, in the town of Vernier. She sat in the back seat with Robert. Anna sat in the front with their driver, who she introduced as Leon Benoit, her partner, which Holly supposed made him another PPI. He had a distinctively French face and a French accent to go with it. Theo, Adrian, and Tomas occupied the vehicle behind them. Their security team was in the vehicle in front of them. She and Robert used the time to catch up on his life, his family, and changes that had occurred on Earth while she was gone. They drove past fields, homes, shops, and a multitude of the other sights one would expect to see when driving through the Swiss countryside. The Geneva-Lausanne Enclave comprised the corridor along the north and west sides of Lake Geneva, anchored by Lausanne in the north and Geneva in the south. Holly caught glimpses of the wall that protected the enclave from the uncontrolled lands of southeastern France. They turned off the road, passed through an open gate with an unmanned gatehouse, and followed a tree-lined road to a driveway circling a small raised garden watched over by a gnarly, ancient-looking tree. Leon drove around it and stopped in front of the house. She stared. This was Theo's house? It wasn't a house at all. It was a mansion, complete with grounds and probably a full-time staff. The imposing face of the three-story window-lined building loomed over them as if to say, Enter if you dare. The incongruous presence of a hexagonal turret on each corner of the roof softened the fortress effect, but only a little. They looked big enough to contain their own rooms, and called out to the child in her to dash into the building, run up the stairs, which she imagined being a pair of staircases, curving up to the second floor from opposite sides of a large central room with a large chandelier, and climb into one of those fairy tale towers where she could look out over the estate. She settled for Theo's arm. He waved his other arm to encompass the building and grounds. Welcome to my humble abode. A number of ambassadors to the Council of Enclaves have residences in Vineyard. Nearly half of Vineyard's residents are foreign nationals, much to the consternation of the natives. They passed through an imposing double-door entrance and into a wide hall, that extended to the opposite side of the building, where a pair of glass-paned doors opened onto the grounds behind the house. There were no curved staircases in evidence, but the hall was lined with sculptures, paintings, and antique chairs, inviting her to stroll down the hall just to look at everything. Theo steered her into a room on the right. It was, she supposed, what one would call the drawing room— and it was an exercise in carefully considered style and color. The pink carpet, 
would have been the overwhelming feature of the room, were it not for the pale blue floral pattern that toned it down. Two settees and three upholstered chairs had been placed strategically around the room. A tall, wide, multi-paned window looked out on the drive, an otherwise mundane view softened by lace curtains. Red drapes had been pulled back on either side. The overall effect of the room was of luxury, falling just short of ostentatiousness. It was a side of Theo she had not known about. A faint scent of pipe tobacco hung in the air, and she quickly located the pipe resting beside an ashtray on a side table beside one of the chairs. The pipe shared the table with a few books that formed a short but precarious stack. For all its formality, the room felt lived in. Theo spent a lot of time here. He released her arm and gestured for her to sit while he pulled the heavy drapes over the window, blocking out the floodlit area in front of the building. She glimpsed Tomas directing the security team as they unloaded an alarming collection of weapons and other equipment from one of the SUVs. Robert and Adrian walked in. They claimed a settee and launched into a private conversation, which seemed to consist mainly of Adrian asking questions and Robert answering them. Her name was mentioned. The two of them presented a study in contrasts. Robert was a typical Pacquia, on the short side, a little overweight, exuding confidence and calmness, a self-made man at the top of his game. Adrian, on the other hand, was tall and thin, dark-skinned with short, black, wiry hair, brown eyes, full lips, and ears that stuck out a little too much. He was young, a man at the beginning of his adult life. They were different in every way, yet were conversing affably apparently about her. Theo claimed a chair. Anna appeared and stood behind and a little to one side of Holly's seat. You can sit if you like, Holly said. Thank you, ma'am. I prefer to stand. Apparently there were rules to this PPI thing. Holly could call her by her given name, but she would refer to Holly as ma'am. An older woman appeared with two trays, which she set on the table in the middle of the room. Oh, tea and bickies, Holly said, and helped herself. She expected everyone to pepper her with questions about the skirmish at Tiangong Station, or her adventures among the aliens, but Robert started them off in a different direction. So, Theo, he said, tell us about this house. Theo seemed pleased to oblige, and launched into a somewhat detailed description of the house's architecture and history. It was built in the early 1900s, making it a century and a half old. It had been in the family of an earl for most of that time, but when he could no longer afford to maintain it, he put it up for sale, and Theo bought it. It was in considerable disrepair, and he ended up putting nearly a million euros into it beyond the purchase price. At the time, I saw it as an investment, he said. I thought I would eventually sell it for a tidy profit. That was before the end of the world was announced. He smiled a little sadly. Real estate brokers like to say it is all about location, but in this case, it was all about timing. Maybe it is for the best, though. I think it will serve adequately as a temporary headquarters for the alien's personal representative on Earth. At least until we can find something more appropriate. The woman who had brought tea and cookies appeared— and announced that dinner was served. They moved across the hall to the dining room, where a formal dinner had been set for them. Tomas joined them. Even Anna sat to eat with them, though Leon remained standing near one of the doors. Dinner turned out to be a thoroughly sensual affair of sights, smells, and tastes. The fragments' culinary offerings were an excellent imitation of human food— but there was a kind of fullness to real food prepared by real people. At least it seemed like that to Holly. She closed her eyes for a moment and listened to the sounds of people sharing a meal, chatting, laughing, and for a moment she was overwhelmed by the normality of it, the simple humanity of it. Later, back in the drawing room, Theo made drinks— Holly took a sizable swallow of bourbon, scrunched her face, 
and launched into a coughing fit as the frontal assault of eighty-proof liquor made its way down her throat and esophagus. This engendered laughter once her companions determined she was going to live. I had forgotten how strong this stuff is, she said. She gave them a rueful look and took a more cautious sip, this time savoring the flavored heat as it made her way down her throat. Phew! She plunked her glass down on the side table beside her chair. Robert was grinning. Theo smiled benignly. That might have been worth the billion-and-a-half-kilometer trip all by itself, she said. After some general conversation, Theo said, Tell us what happened to you. She did. Beginning with the Asimov's arrival in the Jovian system, she described the alien space station, the journey to the alien base deep beneath Ganymede's surface, their encounter with a fragment, Benny's betrayal and destruction of the base, waking up on Titan, her preparation for returning to Earth, and her arrival at Tiangong Station. They kept interrupting her with questions, and by the time she finished her story, it was twelve-thirty in the morning. "'You have had quite the adventure, Dr. Burton,' Adrian said. She stifled a yawn. "'Call me Holly, please.' So, just to be clear, Robert said, there is only one alien, right? She nodded. He is an ancient explorer who has taken an interest in our affairs. And he calls himself the Fragment? That's not really his name. He doesn't have a name. He offered it as a concession to our need to call him something. Huh, Robert said. Everyone was silent for a few moments. I wouldn't spend too much time sussing out the meaning of his choice of names, she said. He is an alien, after all, and that means our respective frames of reference are not congruent. Our guesses about why he chose that particular name are more likely to lead us astray than provide any useful insights into his nature. I spent almost a year with him on Titan, and I can tell you... He is nothing like anything any of us has ever imagined, or ever will imagine. He is totally other. You keep referring to the fragment as he, Adrian said. She shrugged. Gender is a fundamental part of our humanity, but it is not part of whatever the fragment is. He has no gender. He presented as male, so it was easiest to go with that. Part of the human-alien interface, if you will. And he wants to give us advanced technologies to save us from the Deathbringer? There was a certain awe in Adrian's voice. With you acting as the go-between? Emissary, she corrected him. He seems to feel strongly about that. I am more than a go-between for transferring alien technologies from the fragment to the human race. I am his personal representative on Earth. So how are you going to transfer that knowledge to the people who need it? Hang on, Robert said. It's past midnight, and Holly looks like she is about to nod off and fall out of her chair. Why don't we call it a night and continue in the morning? You are absolutely right, Theo said. I apologize to all of you. Let me show you where your rooms are. Theo's house had a lot of rooms. Holly, Robert, and Anna followed him up the stairs, which opened off the hall. Anna's room was the first one on the right, but she accompanied them into the second room, which was Holly's. It was big, bigger than her entire apartment in Amstelveen had been. The four-poster, king-sized bed seemed almost decadent, with its deep green canopy, four large white pillows, and a dark blue duvet with a white floral pattern. Theo seemed partial to floral patterns, or at least his interior decorator was. The headboard and footboard were made of a rich dark wood. A round table sat in one corner, along with three chairs with green floral designs. On the other side of the room was a dresser that looked old, and an equally old-looking wardrobe, which was empty. She foresaw a shopping trip in her future. Or maybe not. She doubted she would find anything that fit as well as the fragment's clothes, 
or looked as good on her. She had brought them with her. A door led into the bathroom, which included a full-sized bathtub and a separate shower. She eyed the tub and imagined a long, hot soak. There was a second door on the other side of the bathroom. Anna's room, Theo said. So she would share a bathroom with her PPI. When they talked about close protection, they weren't kidding. Robert's room is further down the hall, Theo said. Tomas's and mine are across the hall. I'll give you a full tour of the house and grounds tomorrow. As much as the bathtub called to her, she decided not to risk falling asleep in it and drowning. That would be embarrassing. She stripped off her clothes and crawled into bed. It had been a long time since she had slept in normal gravity. It felt good. Seventeen. She woke the next morning to sunlight streaming in through lace-covered French doors. She stretched luxuriously in the decadently luxurious bed. The room was like something out of a fairy tale. She knew Theo was financially well-off, but this, this went beyond well-off. This was aristocratic wealth. A light knock came at the bathroom door. Come, she said. Anna walked in, dressed in what looked like the same outfit she wore the previous day. Either that or she had a collection of identical outfits, which, come to think of it, made sense given her profession. Breakfast in thirty minutes, she said. Holly had slept in the middle of the bed and had to crawl to one side to get out of it. I am jealous, Anna said with a smirk. Mine is only queen-sized. Yeah, well, this much room in a bed for one person seems excessive, don't you think? I imagine it is intended for two. Knock on my door when you are ready to go down. She retreated back through the bathroom. Really? She needed a bodyguard to accompany her downstairs for breakfast? They would have to sit down and talk about the rules. At least Anna seemed willing to let her take a shower and get dressed by herself. She opened the French doors and stepped out onto a small balcony, overlooking a large, well-kept lawn that ran the width of one end of the house and almost the same distance across. A neatly trimmed hedge enclosed it with an arched gate on each side. A stone path began at one gate, curved out toward a gazebo in the middle of space, and drew a mirror image curve to the opposite gate. Like the house, it exuded wealth. A noise startled her. She turned to see Anna step into her room from the bathroom. She had a gun in her hand. The door to the hallway burst open, and two soldiers charged in, assault rifles at the ready. Are you all right? Anna said, eyes scanning the room. Uh, yes? Anna noticed the open French doors. Stand down, she said to the guards. False alarm. Let's give the woman some privacy. They backed out of the room and closed the door behind them. Anna holstered her gun. Holly felt like a complete idiot. It has an alarm, doesn't it? Every door and window in the house has an alarm. When you open the French doors, you set off an alarm in the guardroom on this floor, as well as this. She held up her cell phone, then grinned. Ma'am, I wish you could see the look on your face. She closed the French doors and showed Holly how to disable and re-enable the alarm. A knock came at the hall door, followed by Robert's voice. Everything all right in there? Everything is fine, Holly said. We'll be down in a few minutes. Breakfast was in the breakfast room, looking out on the park-like backyard. A servant brought them eggs benedict, roasted potatoes, toast, and mixed fruits. A coffee pot was available on a side table. She took some minor ribbing about her encounter with the security system. After breakfast, they moved back to the drawing room, where Theo returned to the question of Holly's plan for saving the human race. My only plan, she said, is to meet with a council of enclaves and offer to make available to them the advanced technical knowledge they will need to save us from extinction. Then what? What do you mean? What do you expect them to do? I expect them to take the fragment's gift and spearhead the greatest construction project in the history of the world. 
my role will be to provide the requisite knowledge to the people who need it. Their job will be to use that knowledge to get the job done. Suppose the Council doesn't accept the offer. You have enemies, you know. Enemies who believe you and the aliens represent an existential threat to the world that is every bit as serious as the coming of the Deathbringer, which, by the way, many believe will be a survivable event. Some of those people sit on the Council. The CRA in particular wields considerable clout. They would have to be complete idiots to turn down this offer. When has that ever stopped politicians from making stupid decisions? I will just have to convince them. In any case, Robert said, you are going to need some kind of organization. Why? The Council already has one. Sis, you are about to become the most important person in the world. Even if you offload the bulk of the work to others, you will at least need a public relations organization— to handle the flood of mail you are already receiving, even if... Wait, I have mail? I have been here less than a day. How can I have mail? I don't even have a current vid mail address. Theo held up both hands. For now, your mail and calls come to me. You will have to hire a personal assistant to handle them, not to mention your calendar. Someone will read my mail before I see it? And managing my schedule? Think about it. People high up in an organization or the government don't read their own mail. It gets screened by a personal assistant. Death threats, for example, would go directly to security. You would never see them. The same with prank messages and vids, requests for autographed pictures, marriage proposals. If these aren't filtered out before they reach your desk, they will overwhelm you. Please tell me I am not receiving death threats. Not yet, but you will. That's crazy. It only seems that way because you haven't been the most famous person in the world before. Now you are. You will quickly develop a fan club and a hate club. The same goes for your calendar, Robert said. Your schedule is going to become very busy, and your calendar very full. You will need someone to manage that for you to schedule meetings, calls, vids, to contact people to reschedule a meeting when something more important comes up. If all goes well, you are going to be overwhelmed with meetings. For example, you will have to meet with hundreds of people who need the knowledge you bring. Maybe thousands. Somebody has to plan and schedule all that. Theo said, You are going to be the face and voice of the fragment— People won't be able to relate to some kind of trans-dimensional alien they can't even visualize, but they can and will relate to you. The fragment understood that when he made you his emissary. You need to focus on the things that only you can do and let others do everything else. It dawned on her that they must have stayed up talking about this after she went to bed, which was mildly irritating. This was why she needed people like them around her, but it rubbed her the wrong way to know they were talking about her behind her back, planning details of her life that she might never even know about. She picked up her teacup and discovered the tea was lukewarm. She hated lukewarm tea. In fact, she detested lukewarm drinks in general. Hot drinks should be hot. Cold drinks should be cold. Anna noticed. Let me take care of that, ma'am. She took the cup out of Holly's hands, left the room, and returned with a clean cup. When she started to make the tea, Holly objected. I'll let you be my bodyguard because that's something I can't do for myself. But I can damn well make a cup of tea, thank you very much. Anna looked surprised and retreated to her corner. Sorry, Holly said to her. That was uncalled for. No problem, ma'am. But it was a problem, wasn't it? She didn't play well with others. Never had. If you wanted something done right, you did it yourself. Now she was being told she couldn't do everything herself, that she would have to trust other people to make decisions for her, decisions she might not even know needed to be made. Robert must have guessed what she was thinking. There is too much at stake for you to go it alone, sis. You need help. Our help. 
That's why you asked us to meet you when you arrived, isn't it? Well, here we are. Let us help. You are going to need more help than we can provide, Theo said. You will need dozens, hundreds, maybe thousands of people before this thing is done. As much as you hate it, you are going to have to get used to delegating most things, sometimes important things, and trust that the people around you won't screw up. You will have to listen to people, confide in people, trust people. You have been a lone wolf your entire life. That has to change. You are going to have— Stop, she said, holding up her hand. You are making me out to be some kind of corporate CEO or world leader or— I don't know, superhero. But that's not who I am. I'm an academic, a researcher, a college instructor. I write books, books for other academics. The closest I ever get to politics is the occasional departmental kerfuffle. She was vaguely aware that her voice had risen in pitch and volume. What you are describing is not who I am. That's why I need to hand this off to the Council. They have the organizational infrastructure to do something with the Fragment's technology. They have the leadership and expertise to get the human race off the planet. They can focus the world's resources on this endeavor. I can't do any of that, and I am more than happy to sit in the back row and let them take the credit for saving humanity, assuming they do. She stopped when she noticed two things. First, her eyes were wet and her hands were trembling. Second, they were staring at her like she had sprouted a second head. I need a timeout. Theo, where is that tour you promised? 18. Two days later, in a room on the second floor that she thought of as a library, who had libraries anymore? She watched Theo pace back and forth in front of a tall window. He was talking to someone in another country. Belgium, she thought. It had to do with money, though the details eluded her since she could hear only one side of the conversation. She ran her hand over one of the curved wood armrests of her chair. The fragments' chairs adjusted themselves to fit her body, which made them incredibly comfortable, but it was different in normal gravity. Here she could feel her body settle into the chair in a way it didn't on Titan. The room was inviting, casually and exactingly laid out, like the drawing room. But this room had more of a library feel to it, especially with the two floor-to-ceiling bookcases containing actual books. A light brown carpet with dark brown swirls covered the floor. There were upholstered chairs, side tables, a desk— even a world globe on a stand. Lamps rather than overhead lighting provided illumination. One of the side tables held a chessboard with ornate wood pieces. A hard-backed chair stood ready on each side, waiting for someone to sit and play. It had immediately become her favorite room, a place she could retreat to when she needed to get away from people. There were a lot of people in Theo's house, herself, Theo, Robert, Adrian, Tomas, Anna, a dozen security guards who had converted the basement into a barracks, and a household staff that included Gerard, the groundskeeper who lived in a separate cottage with his wife Molly, who was the cook, and at least two servants. Theo's raised voice drew her attention back to his conversation. I don't give a damn what Giselle wants. It's my money, and I'll do whatever the hell I want with it. No. Drake? Listen. I spelled out my intentions as clearly as I could. Just write it up with all the required legalese and send me the documents. Post haste. And make sure it's locked down tight. No loopholes. No, I do not want a meeting with them. Send them copies if you must. Fine. Thank you. He dropped the connection and stood looking out the window, which looked out over what would be a backyard for most houses, but in this case was more like a park. Curved beds of flowers and shrubs and trees wandered around the well-maintained lawn. A tall gazebo-like tower made of stone 
stood two-thirds of the way across the lawn toward a green belt that marked the edge of the property. A birdbath had been built into the base of the tower, which had been colonized by birds for many years, maybe decades. Theo returned to the chair he had been sitting in when the call had interrupted them. He put on his glasses and started writing in a small notebook he always carried with him. She was glad that had not changed. He had aged since she had left Earth. Not a lot. It was only seven years, but enough to notice. There was more gray in his hair, and his receding hairline had receded a little further. He carried more weight than she remembered, and maybe a few new wrinkles here and there. Still, at forty-five he was as fit and attractive as ever. Maybe more so. She, on the other hand, had not aged at all. Not physically, anyway. In fact, the fragment had reconstructed her body so that she looked more like twenty-seven than her real age of thirty-six. Now, millions of nanites patrolled the highways and byways of her body, looking for defects to repair and invaders to destroy. They ensured her body would remain a young and healthy twenty-seven for a long time. The fragment was vague about exactly how long that might be. He said he couldn't make her immortal, but could slow the aging process, extending her natural lifespan. When she pressed him on this, he became evasive, saying only that one human lifetime would not be enough to ensure humanity's survival. She had told Theo and Robert about the nanites, and they both seemed to take it in stride. But had they really? Did Theo still see her as a woman, or as some kind of cyborg? He put the notebook away. Sorry about that. What was it about? she asked. A minor business matter. Nothing you need to be concerned about. It was rare for Theo to lie to her. She was pretty sure the minor business matter had everything to do with her. He might be wealthy, but even he did not have a bottomless bank account. Her presence here was costing him a lot of money, and she suspected the call had to do with rearranging his finances to account for that. She had stepped into his life after a long absence with the expectation that he would receive her with open arms and do whatever he could to help her, and that was exactly what he had done. She couldn't help but feel a little guilty about it. Tell me, she said. He held up his hands in mock surrender. I am rewriting my will. You're rewriting your will for the end of the world? His laugh was quiet, assured, the laugh that always made her feel like all was well in the world, even when it wasn't. He retrieved his pipe and a tobacco pouch from the pocket of his suit jacket. She watched him fill the bowl of the pipe and tamp it down with his finger. He was buying time to think. He walked over to the fireplace, extracted a wooden match from a matchbox on the mantel, lit it, and held it over the bowl of the pipe while he puffed on it. He extinguished the match with a shake of his wrist and tossed it into the fireplace. It was a ritual she had seen him perform many times. He stood there, with pipe in hand, and looked at her for several long seconds. Theo was a man never in a hurry, an unflappable man if there ever was one. Troubled times are coming, he said. I don't mean the end of the world, but the time between now and then. More troubled than any of us have seen in our lifetimes. I hope to be here at the end. I am not yet ready to cast off this mortal coil. But the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune do not always fly in the direction we might wish. Theo wasn't much given to poetic expressions, but he could produce them when he wanted to. It helped that he read and reread Shakespeare. There are not many people I hold dear, but I want to be sure those I do care about will be provided for, should something happen to me. He drew smoke from the pipe and exhaled it in a dense cloud. You are one of those people. That doesn't seem right, she said. I'm not your family. He had mentioned Giselle on the call, his sister. He smiled a little. Trust me, my family will be fine. 
That evening, after she had beaten Robert at chess a second time, she announced she was going to take a long, hot bath and retire for the night. Twenty minutes later, she was immersed in water as hot as she could stand, afloat in the scent of lavender, jets of water flowing over and under and around her, caressing her skin. There were some experiences you just couldn't replicate in a low-G environment. This was one of them. Sure, you could take a bath, but it wasn't the same without Earth's gravity. It was nearly midnight when she slipped under the covers and let her body sink into the bed. The clean, crisp sheets rested on her sensitized skin, feeling almost excruciatingly sensuous. She lay awake, listening to the sounds of nature's nightlife through the open French doors, the security for which she had disabled. There was something comforting about it, something normal. God, she had almost forgotten what normal felt like. Not that there was anything even remotely normal about her, not since that year on Titan. Nor was there anything normal about what she had come back to do. When the digital clock on the nightstand showed half-past one, she got up to use the bathroom and then crossed the hall to Theo's room. She knocked gently. Several moments passed with no response, and she turned to go back to her room. The door opened behind her. Holly? Theo said. Is everything all right? She turned to face him, noticing that he still wore pajama bottoms and no top. Yes. I'm okay. She felt like a teenager who had gotten caught trying to sneak out of the house for an illicit late-night tryst. Actually, I'm not. I mean, I am, but... Well, I'm not sure why I'm here. This was a lie, of course. She knew exactly why she was knocking on Theo's door at one thirty in the morning. He did, too. He guided her back to her room where he carefully closed the door and turned to face her. She had left the bathroom light on and belatedly realized that she was standing between him and the light, wearing a sheer white nightgown. His eyes moved over her body, and he said nothing for what seemed like a long time. Did he not find her attractive anymore? Was he going to patiently explain why this was a bad idea? You look beautiful tonight, he said. Her heart was suddenly in her throat. Thank you, she whispered. I'm afraid I don't have condoms, he said, though I imagine the guards down the hall could come up with one or two. A giggle burbled up from somewhere, and she said, We don't have to worry about that. One question, though. Will the fragment be listening? Her hand leapt to her mouth. Oh, my, she said. I hadn't thought about that. She pulled the amulet over her head. This keeps me in touch with Gabriel's fire and the fragment. If I'm not wearing it, neither one is listening. She wasn't sure that was true, but it sounded good. She placed it on the nightstand. He closed the distance between them and cupped her face with both hands. Then he kissed her. It was a soft, undemanding kiss, and it sent shivers down her back, her legs— all the way to her toes, which curled into the carpet. He pulled away a little and looked into her eyes. She put her hand on the back of his head and brought his lips back to hers, which parted so their tongues could begin an ancient dance. She was trembling. She broke the kiss. God, I feel like a sixteen-year-old girl doing it for the first time. He grinned and grasped the bottom of the nightgown with both hands and drew it up. She lifted her arm so he could pull it over her head. It fell to the floor. His hands found her breasts, and she shivered again. Then they wandered around to her back and down until he was cupping her bottom. She had forgotten how good this could feel. He drew her against himself, and it was obvious he wanted her as much as she wanted him. She dug her fingernails into his shoulders and let out a tiny, oh, when he planted a kiss between her breasts. Her head dropped back, and she clung to him as though her life depended on it. 19. James Cartwright wouldn't call Dawson a friend, exactly, 
but he had been in his office a few times. Its smallness always struck him as inconsistent with everything else he knew about the man. Jedediah Dawson was an expansive man in every sense of the word. He was obese, though he projected the image of a big man rather than a fat man. He had a big personality that took up a disproportionate amount of emotional space in whatever room he happened to be in. He was the seventeenth wealthiest person in the world, give or take a place or two, depending on who was counting and when. His appetite for the finer things in life was insatiable, an insatiability that extended to certain personal proclivities that many people would find shocking. He was also a generous man, subscribing to the old-fashioned concept of noblesse oblige, which was ironic, since there was nothing noble about him. Cartwright had once asked him why he had such a small office. There's only one of me, he said. How big an office do I need? Like everyone else Cartwright had ever met, Dawson was a collection of contradictions. James Braxton Cartwright, he said as he came around the desk. It has been a while since y'all slinked into my office. How are you, Jed? He shook the outstretched hand and took a seat as Dawson walked over to the liquor cabinet. Cognac? It's the only reason I visit you. I can't afford the good stuff on my government salary. And dollars grow on trees. He handed Cartwright a heavy crystal glass, a third full of what he assumed would be a very good cognac. The big man settled into his chair, and they had both sampled what was indeed an excellent drink. Dawson eyed him with a characteristic sideways look. I hear the DHS has got itself a couple of big projects going on, in out-of-the-way places. Projects Congress don't know nothing about. His pattern of speech was an affectation that harkened back to his childhood in Texas, but he held a master's degree from Duke and could speak uninflected English as well as anyone. It should not have surprised Cartwright that he knew about the sanctuaries. People like him traded in information more than anything else. Planning on saving the world, are you? Well, not the whole world. Just enough folks to reboot civilization. I take it you are disinclined to believe the end of the world will actually be the end of the world. I believe the Deathbringer will pass close enough to wreak destruction upon the Earth, unlike anything it has seen since the time of the dinosaurs— but Earth will survive, and after a few dark, cold years, will once again be livable. The trick will be to get through the destruction part and the long winter to follow. Ergo, underground cities. Six of them, each holding up to twenty thousand people, along with enough seeds and animals to rebuild sustainable ecosystems. How long will they have to hunker down? Two or three years, I'm told. Maybe longer. We're planning for five. Expensive project. That's what Cartwright liked about Dawson. The man had a razor-sharp mind, and once he understood a situation, he would make a decision without further ado. Fifty billion will reserve ten slots for you, your family, and whoever else you want to bring along. That's a lot of money. I'd have to spread it over a few years. The markets are jittery enough as it is. Cartwright nodded. Dawson drained his glass. Make it fifteen slots and you got yourself a deal. Done. Cartwright finished his drink. There is one other thing. Oh? Holly Burton. Ah, yes. The woman who somehow survived the destruction of the Asimov and then shows up claiming to be the alien's representative. He refilled both their glasses. The Brits screwed the pooch on that one, didn't they? I tried to dissuade Weatherford, but you know how he can be when he gets an idea in his head. In any case, I suspect Dr. Burton is going to be a problem. She will hit a wall in the council, but if I know Theo Peters, he will find a way around it. What can she do without the council? What indeed? Cartwright downed half his drink. She might bypass the council and appeal directly to the individual enclaves. By dangling a few new technologies in front of them, she may well persuade them to climb in bed with the aliens. 
and that would be a disaster for the human race. Let me guess, Dawson said. You need a contingency plan for neutralizing her while maintaining plausible deniability for yourself. Yes. Dawson's voice took on an icy quality Cartwright had not heard before. Dead or alive? The headquarters of Alexander Taylor Ministries International was impressive, with clean, modern architecture, futuristic spires and arches, the latest technology. The auditorium seated 2,500, and they had opened up the spacious foyer to seat another hundred. A few hundred more were in another room, taking part via closed-circuit television. Another six million or so throughout the Western Hemisphere watched live. A similar number would watch time-delayed broadcasts later in the day, as Taylor's voice followed the sun around the world. Cartwright paid three people a thousand dollars each to give up their seats near the back of the auditorium for him and his bodyguards. Taylor was wrapping up his sermon. And so, the death bringer comes. He paused and lowered his voice. Is this how the world ends? Is this how Adam's race ends? He lowered it to a whisper spoken close to the microphone. Is this how you and I end? He looked out over his congregation. You could hear a pin drop. Taylor had certainly inherited his father's gift. His voice climbed in volume again. No, this is not how the world ends. The word of God tells of a very different end to the world, and I have chosen to stake my life on what the word of God says. For God does not lie. The crowd came alive, rising to their feet and raising their arms in the air, shouting, Amen and Hallelujah and Thank you, Jesus. And you, his arm describing a broad arc encompassing his audience, you too have staked your lives on what the word of our God says. People were clapping and stamping their feet. The band kicked in with some music. And so, he held up both hands, quieting them down. And so the death bringer comes, not to destroy us, but to test us. Back to pin dropping silence. Even Cartwright was not immune to the pull of Taylor's charisma. My friends, we must choose, you and I. We can panic, like so many around us who have no faith who do not know the Lord God and his power to save, or we can trust that he who created the heavens and everything that is in them stands between us and the death-bringer and will not allow it to pass. I do not know how he will save us. I only know that he will, and so do you. He waited for his congregation to settle down again. But the death-bringer, is not the only test of our faith. With the Deathbringer come the aliens. It is surely no coincidence that they have arrived at the same time. Can they save us? Their emissary is already among us, promising just that. She offers us hope. But it is a false hope, my friends. These aliens are an antichrist, come to deceive the faithful— and their emissary is a whore of Babylon. She will turn many away from God and lead them to put their trust in an alien species instead. Taylor raised his voice as he continued. Beloved of God, do not be deceived. Stand firm and wait for the Lord. Stand fast and see the salvation of the Lord. It will be glorious to behold. To the sound of much clapping and shouting, he turned the rest of the service over to a worship leader. Another of the ministers would dismiss the crowd. Cartwright decided to beat the crush of people who would soon be leaving. He made his way to Taylor's office in a separate wing of the compound. Cartwright had known Alexander Taylor for a long time. He had known his father, too, though he had always thought of the senior Alexander as something of a showman a little too full of himself, which made him easy to manipulate, but unreliable. The old man was worth some sixty million when he passed on. 
Alexander Jr. was not like his father. Oh, he had the old man's gift for manipulating people, but unlike the old man, the son was absolutely sincere, a scandal-free man of God with little interest in power and wealth. When he took over his father's ministry, he got its financial house in order and took the unprecedented step of making the multi-million dollar ministry's finances open to the public. Most of the money that flowed into its coffers went to a foundation that focused on getting affordable medicines and vaccines to the poorer enclaves and the outcasts. His personal net worth was estimated at a million and a half dollars, which included an unpretentious home in Roanoke, Virginia. His foundation was worth several billion. As near as Cartwright could tell, the man was the real deal, uncorrupted and probably incorruptible, which wasn't to say Cartwright couldn't use him. He was looking out a window at a wetland bordering the church's property when Taylor walked in. I thought that was you in the back, he said. Cartwright turned and grinned. It is hard to remain incognito with two large bodyguards following me around everywhere I go. Yeah, they're entertaining Jennifer. Coffee? Sure. Cartwright would have preferred something stronger, but Taylor didn't drink anything stronger than the occasional glass of wine. Taylor stuck his head out the door and said, Jens, would you mind getting us some coffee? Thanks. They sat at a table in one corner of his study. An older woman delivered two cups of coffee and left, closing the door behind her. Cartwright tried the coffee. It was good and freshly made. She must have started a fresh pot after she let him into Taylor's office. Jennifer had been Taylor's administrative assistant for years, and his father's before that. Taylor set down his cup. So, Mr. Secretary, what brings you to my humble house of worship? A faint smirk formed around his mouth, and his eyes twinkled. Somehow I doubt you have come seeking spiritual counsel. Unlike the father, the son could be disarmingly self-deprecating. It sometimes seemed as though he just couldn't be bothered with taking himself seriously. Indeed, Cartwright said, making a show of looking around the room. I need your help with something. Well, I don't need your help, but I would like to have it. My, my, James Cartwright wants my help. I suppose I should be flattered, but I suspect you are about to try to entangle me in something morally dubious. He smiled to assure Cartwright that he need not be offended. It has to do with a deathbringer, Cartwright said. I'm sure you know that scientific opinion is divided on how much of a threat the Deathbringer is to Earth. I also know, Taylor said, that you, and therefore the Oxum administration, side with a minority that thinks the danger to our world has been exaggerated and that all we have to do is hunker down and ride it out. Cartwright leaned back in his chair. The people I trust tell me the Deathbringer's sweep through our solar system will push the Earth into an orbit a little further out from the sun than it is now, but otherwise leave it intact and livable. Not quite the end of the world, then. Not the end of the world. Of course, it will not pass unnoticed. Its gravity will cause tectonic shifts, worldwide volcanic activity, massive tsunamis, that sort of thing. Enormous amounts of ash and dust will be thrown into the atmosphere, causing a global winter that will last for several years. Most animal and plant life will die, along with most of the human race. A frown formed on Taylor's face as he took this in. He had heard all this before, but seemed surprised to hear it from Cartwright. So, an apocalypse unlike anything since the Great Flood? Cartwright released a sigh of relief. Taylor got it. As I recall, Cartwright said, not everyone perished in the flood. Some survived in that ark Noah built. Taylor thought about that for a moment. I don't suppose you have one of those lying around in some undisclosed location? Cartwright tried to conceal his smile, but couldn't quite pull it off. As a matter of fact, I do. The government has been busy these last few years, 
busy building an underground sanctuary. Six of them, actually, located in the most tectonically stable parts of North America we could find. Each of them is large enough to sustain enough people, plants, and animals to repopulate the Earth. In theory, only one of them needs to survive for humanity to reboot itself. But a couple backups can't hurt, and might make all the difference in the world. Our tax dollars at work, Taylor said. Funny you should mention tax dollars. I'm sure you can appreciate that a project of this size and complexity is expensive, made more so by the need to keep it quiet for as long as possible, even from Congress. Hell, especially from Congress. Unfortunately, they will find out about it soon, anyway. I'm surprised we have kept it from them as long as we have. They will start poking around to find out where all the money's going. Then, they will pull in the reins of the spending in order to get some say in how the project unfolds. Taylor sipped his coffee and motioned for Cartwright to continue. I am asking some of the wealthiest people in the world for contributions, significant contributions, in exchange for a few places in an ark. I suppose you could say, I am selling tickets for a front-row view of the end of the world at a billion dollars a pop. I don't have a billion dollars. You have a worldwide viewing audience from whom you pull in nearly a billion dollars annually. According to your public records, most of that goes to your foundation, which channels it into a variety of global charities. You want me to redirect those funds into your ARC program. I want more than that. More? Taylor echoed. When this goes public, I want you to appeal to your followers to give more, much more, more than they have ever given before, knowing that it will go towards saving a remnant of humanity from destruction. Think of it as the greatest charitable cause in history. Taylor drained his cup and called for Jennifer to bring refills. Cartwright waited while she brought more coffee. He had learned long ago how to recognize the precise moment when he had someone hooked and needed only to reel them in. Taylor was examining the hook. The most important thing was not to spook him, and the best way to do that was to say nothing. Taylor took a few sips of the hot coffee while gazing out the window. You want me to take on the mantle of a modern-day Noah. And just like that, Cartwright had him. He said, The sanctuaries have to be self-contained and self-sufficient, able to support people, plants, and animals for several years until it is safe to return to the surface. That fact alone constrains the number of people each sanctuary can support. Each one will hold 20,000 people. More than that, and they may not survive. Less than that, and we may not have enough to multiply and be prosperous. He mangled the scripture reference, but Taylor didn't seem to notice. For the most part, we will use a lottery system to select from the best and brightest, after ensuring they satisfy certain parameters, like age, health, ability to procreate, lack of genetic diseases, and so on. For the most part, Taylor repeated, that's the carrot you are dangling in front of your billionaires. They get to bypass the lottery and certain parameters for themselves and a few others, the exact number depending on how many billions they cough up. Cartwright nodded. Taylor laughed. You had me worried for a minute there. I thought you might be thinking along egalitarian lines with the lottery thing— it is strangely reassuring to be reminded that some things never change. He was being facetious. Anyone else might have been offended. The two of them held very different value systems. Cartwright maintained the relationship because Taylor was sometimes useful. He imagined Taylor maintained it for the same reason. That and the fact that he and Taylor's father had been friends for many years. Deep down... He suspected Taylor also held out hope that Cartwright's soul was still salvageable. Cartwright had long ago lost interest in that question. Let me ask you a question, Taylor said. These parameters, 
I don't suppose they include race or ethnic origin. As I said, we will carefully select the best and brightest. In exchange for your help, I offer sanctuary for you and your extended family. I'll also give you thirty tickets for each billion you raise for the project. I want some of your people to survive. I might not be much of a Christian, but I understand the importance of religion for a stable and orderly society, and that is what we will build. Not that I'll be part of it. I'm too old. But I am recruiting leaders who can take up the task of building the new humanity. So choose carefully. He wanted Taylor to understand and commit to the bigger picture. He wanted him as an ally, not just a fundraiser. Rebuilding a civilization after the apocalypse would not be easy. He needed natural leaders, leaders like Taylor. I will help you, Taylor said. One more thing, Cartwright said. This Holly Burton woman is presenting herself as the alien's emissary. She's selling the notion that the aliens can give us the tech we need to survive the Deathbringer. I can't have her running around selling a competing plan of salvation. She will siphon off money and resources. So I have started a propaganda campaign to discredit her. Distasteful, I know. But we're talking about saving the human race here, and the more people who believe her, the more difficult that becomes. What do you want me to do? Taylor asked. I want you to continue doing what you are already doing, portraying her as the whore of Babylon. It has a nice ring to it, and the obvious advantage of being something you happen to believe anyway. 20. Adrian was worried. Three weeks had passed since the emissary's arrival, and the Council of Enclaves had not yet agreed to meet with her. Theo couldn't even get her a meeting with the secretary-general. At every turn he met with delays and excuses. They were stonewalling her. But why? It wasn't like they didn't know who she was and why she was here. The confrontation at Tiangong Station had drawn global attention to the arrival of an emissary from the aliens. A media encampment had sprung up outside the gates of Theo's estate— with vans and campers and a flock of drones buzzing around the grounds. Theo hired more private security to man the gatehouse 24-7 and threatened to shoot down any drones flying lower than a hundred meters over his house. The space plane garnered considerable interest, drawing crowds of people hoping to get a look at an alien spacecraft. The Swiss Army established a 50-meter barbed wire perimeter around the plane and erected a massive tent over it, hiding it from view. The crowds mostly disappeared after that. However, the opportunity to see an alien craft up close proved too much of a temptation for the Swiss internal security apparatus. Two officers from the Ministry of Internal Security showed up at the army encampment one night. They had a letter from the Minister of Internal Security authorizing them to examine the space plane. Lieutenant Albrecht, who was in charge of the detachment guarding the plane, had no choice but to let them in, though he insisted on accompanying them. They brought scientific instruments with them and began scanning the plane from one end to the other. Everything was fine until one of them actually touched the plane. An antenna on top of the plane emitted a bolt of lightning, which struck the man, knocking him off his feet. A second bolt struck the other man, Lieutenant Albrecht backed out of the tent and called his superior. Are they okay? the man asked. I don't know. They were both unconscious when I left. If you want someone to go in and find out, send them over. I am not going anywhere near that plane, and neither are my men. Eos had, of course, alerted Holly when the officers entered the tent, and she had called Theo and Adrian into her room to watch the incursion on her tablet. The two officers regained consciousness after a few minutes and made their way out of the tent, dazed, but apparently undamaged. Adrian, Theo said, why don't you go up there first thing in the morning and have a little chat with Lieutenant Albrecht? See if you can smooth things over. The next morning, Adrian found himself facing an angry lieutenant, who was at least ten years older than he. 
The man launched into a rant about the harm done to the men. No one was harmed. And the inappropriateness of an electrified plane. Technically, Adrian had no authority here and was frankly intimidated by Albrecht. He did, however, represent the emissary, and everybody knew she was not someone to be messed with. He held up a hand, interrupting the lieutenant mid-sentence. Three things, he said in a quiet voice. First, the emissary sent me here to assess the situation and determine the extent to which her security protocols were breached. The man frowned. Second, Eos monitors everything going on around it, and captured images of your intelligence officers examining the plane. It is difficult to see this as anything other than a blatant violation of the sovereignty of the alien's emissary. We have forwarded the vid to your government with an official complaint. The lieutenant started to say something, but Adrian held up a hand. Third, the emissary warned your people that Eos has autonomous defenses and will defend itself. Fortunately for the two men who violated its security perimeter, the AI attached a low-threat profile to the incursion and responded with non-lethal force. Had they, for example, tried to force their way into the plane, it might have killed them. He didn't know if this last part was true, but it sounded good. I realize you had no choice but to let them in, so you likely bear no responsibility for the incursion. The emissary appreciates the job you are doing protecting people from the Eos. His hands were shaking when he got into his vehicle and headed back to Theo's house. He had gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with an angry lieutenant in the Swiss army and backed him down. Even got an apology, which he promised to pass on to the emissary. But he was a conflict avoider at heart, and this experience had pushed him well outside his comfort zone. Things like this are bound to keep happening, as long as the emissary's status remains ambiguous, he said when he got back to the estate. And the failure of the council to even acknowledge the emissary's existence has created an information vacuum that all manner of confusion, rumors, fear-mongering, and other mischief are crowding into. We need formal recognition by the council. And soon. Robert said, She has received inquiries from several enclave leaders requesting private meetings. Maybe we should take them up on it. That would be problematic, Theo said. If you meet with individual enclave leaders, you will create the appearance of favoritism, which will complicate things later on. In my view, it is best to be patient and wait for a meeting with a full council. Will that happen before or after hell freezes over? Adrian said. He agreed with Theo in principle, but three weeks in a PR vacuum was not a good place to be. Other voices were filling that vacuum with their own narratives, not all of which were favorable to the emissary. Initial public reaction to her arrival had been overwhelmingly positive. She was a hero, the lone survivor of the Jupiter mission, sent back by the aliens with an offer of advanced technologies. Her handling of the incident at Tiangong Station in particular won rave reviews on social media and received favorable coverage by most of the big news feeds. In a restrained but decisive action, she had put Major Reed in his place— and by extension, the CRA and the UK, neither of whom was particularly popular these days. It didn't hurt that the emissary was photogenic, not beauty contest material, but an attractive woman nonetheless. But then, public attitudes toward her began to change. Journalists dug into her past, and what they found was not pretty. The news feed started talking about a sexually promiscuous woman with a drinking problem which, as near as Adrian could tell, was more or less accurate. They interviewed some old flames who confirmed this image. Two former colleagues appeared on talk shows to describe a difficult and petty woman who gleefully eviscerated students who dared challenge her, and whose research methods and work ethic were questionable. In parallel with this, a fresh wave of anti-alien sentiment was building. The Singapore incident was resurrected and analyzed all over again. 
always leading to the suggestion that maybe the aliens had intentionally lured the world's leaders to Singapore to murder them with a nuclear bomb, not caring that they had also killed thousands upon thousands of innocent people. Chatter about the nefarious intentions of the aliens flooded social media. Conspiracy theories were rampant, some with just enough truth to be believable, as long as you didn't look too closely. Others so fantastic that Adrian wondered how anybody could take them seriously. But people did. At Adrian's request, Tomas brought in a cybersecurity expert who spent a few days tracking down the negative social media. It turned out that two-thirds of it came from an army of bots originating in the CRA, Great Britain, and Australia. The world-renowned Reverend Dr. Alexander Taylor emerged as the leading voice of the anti-alien crowd, using his global-spanning daily program to attack the emissary and the aliens. His message was a simple but effective one-two punch. On the one hand, he offered people a way to channel their fear and anger in the face of the existential threat of the end of the world, a threat they were powerless to do anything about. He linked the aliens and the Deathbringer together, pointing out how unlikely it was that both should appear at the same time. In his view, the aliens were responsible for the Deathbringer, which they were using to frighten people into looking to them for help. On the other hand, Taylor offered hope. He framed the aliens and the Deathbringer as a test of faith as the last days neared. He called on his followers to reject the false hopes offered by the aliens and turn instead to God, who would not allow the Deathbringer to destroy his people. This was where he leveled his fire at the emissary, portraying her as the whore of Babylon, the greatest temptress found in the book of Revelation, who drew people away from God with a false promise of alien salvation. It was a persuasive message delivered by a persuasive man, and people bought it. The more strident he became, the more his audience grew. Three weeks after Holly's arrival, his regular viewing audience had grown to encompass a third of the world's population. All of this worried Adrian. It was not in his nature to make waves, nor was it his place to contradict Theo, who was his employer. If Theo said they should ignore public opinion for now and focus on the council, that should have settled the matter. But it didn't. The more he thought about it, the more convinced he became that Theo was wrong. He couldn't do an end run around Theo and take his argument directly to the emissary. She would just ask Theo what he thought. Besides, he was more than a little intimidated by her. Not her personally, but who and what she represented. Still, he couldn't just sit around and do nothing. He went to Tomas. They met in the security room, which doubled as Tomas's office, and the nerve center of the security organization he was slowly building around the house and the emissary. A half-dozen monitors hung on the wall, rotating through cameras placed in various strategic locations, including drones. I am concerned about the negative trend in public opinion toward the emissary, Adrian said. There is a public relations war going on, and the emissary is losing, mainly because she isn't even in the fight. Frankly, she is getting slaughtered on the battlefield of public opinion. He was pleased with the military metaphor. Tomas, not so much. That's a bit melodramatic, don't you think? You aren't concerned? My job is to keep her safe, not to make her popular. He couldn't fault Tomas for that. He was responsible for the emissary's security. It made sense that his primary focus would lie there. But it was too narrow a viewpoint. I think there is a correlation between public opinion about the emissary and her security. Don't you? Tomas was quiet for a moment. I hear what you are saying. What does Theo say? He says we should ignore the bad PR for now and focus on getting her in front of the Council of Enclaves. Tomas rubbed the short goatee he was growing. You don't agree with him? I agree that the most important thing is to reach the Council. 
But that doesn't mean we have to ignore the public relations front in the meantime. So, what do you want from me? I want you to help me change Theo's mind. I'm a bodyguard, not a war planner, he said with a chuckle. When Adrian didn't respond, he said, Let's sketch out some ideas. The next morning, Adrian called everyone together in the drawing room. He stood to address the little group. Theo had a puzzled expression on his face. Robert had his impassive lawyer face on. The emissary sat expectantly with her head tilted a little to one side. Anna remained expressionless. Tomas appeared to be counting ceiling tiles. I am concerned, Adrian began. There is a coordinated public relations campaign going on against the emissary and the fragment, or rather the aliens, since the world doesn't know anything about the fragment. This was met with nods. They watched the feeds, too. It is a sophisticated, well-orchestrated attack using multiple media streams. Most of it originates from the CRA and their allies. Its aim is to discredit the emissary before she speaks to the Council of Enclaves. I have spoken to a few people I know at the Council, and they confirm that the CRA and their allies are behind the wall of silence we have hit. They are undermining her before she even tries to make her case. Theo pressed his lips together. He saw where Adrian was going with this. They are winning. By the time the emissary speaks to the Council of Enclaves, public opinion will have swung against her, and that is going to affect how her message is received. The world's leaders may all be autocrats of one sort or another, but they cannot afford to ignore public opinion. Nor are they immune to the pressure the CRA and its allies are putting on them. In short, unless we change public opinion toward the emissary and the fragment, I fear her words will fall on deaf ears. He sat down. Theo was frowning and looked like he was about to speak when Tomas did something uncharacteristic. He offered an opinion. I agree with Adrian, he said, from a security standpoint. The threats to the emissary's life are growing as public opinion turns against her. The last time she went out to see the Waldendorf play, we were met by a mob of angry protesters and had to turn back. Frankly, I can no longer ensure her safety beyond the estate grounds. If the world turns against her, I don't know how she can accomplish her mission. A tense silence followed. Theo stared at Tomas with what could only be described as astonishment. Adrian, Robert said, what do you think we should do? Adrian remained seated. I am not a public relations expert. We should hire one. In the meantime, I think the emissary should hold a press conference where she lets the world see her and tells the world about the fragment and what he is offering. That allows her to take control of the narrative, which to this point has been controlled by her enemies. It might also light a fire under the Council's collective ass. A faint smile crossed Theo's face. He said, I received an interesting call last night from an old friend, Sinta Alejandre. She berated me for being a tired old guard politician who was out of touch with the times and shamefully unaware of the power of social media, a characteristic with which I took no small umbrage. After subjecting me to a few more insults, she said much the same thing you are saying, Adrian. I believe her exact words were, at least hold a press conference to get her out in front of people. You've got to get control of the narrative. If I didn't know better, I would be tempted to think you drafted her as an ally behind my back. He glanced toward Tomas. Not to mention my PPI. He rolled his eyes dramatically. What is the world coming to? Oh, wait. The world is coming to an end, isn't it? I suppose that explains a lot of otherwise inexplicable behavior. He stood and walked over to the window as though he could see past the closed drapes. Turning to face them, he said, I understand Adrian's concern, and he is not wrong. However, if we do as he suggests, 
We risk embarrassing the Council of Enclaves. These are men and women who do not take well to being publicly embarrassed. Some of them have disappeared people for less than that. My advice is to keep working the Council of Enclaves track and try to avoid making things any more difficult than they already are. Eventually, they will come around and invite Holly to speak to them. What do you think, sis? Robert asked. Adrian looked at the emissary. Hers was the only opinion that mattered in the end, but she had remained silent throughout the exchange. She looked around the room with a forlorn expression. At least, it seemed like that to him. I've seen the change in public opinion toward me, she said. It is difficult not to take it personally, especially since some of the attacks contain at least a kernel of truth. More than a kernel in some cases. But I don't see how a press conference or a public relations counterattack will change any of that, and I don't want to offend the very people I need to win over. She looked at Adrian. Thank you for bringing this up. I will think about it. Adrian noticed his hands were shaking a little. Not enough for anyone to notice, he hoped. His chin had developed a small quiver as well. He had openly opposed Theo, who had countered with a persuasive argument. Maybe he was wrong, and Theo was right. For the first time in his life, he understood what it was like to stake out a position with no certainty of being right. Theo did this all the time, projecting confidence and certainty, though Adrian knew he was often far from certain. It was part of what made him a leader and not a follower. An epiphany of sorts struck him. He wasn't Theo, and never would be. Theo was comfortable with ambiguity comfortable making decisions based on incomplete and possibly incorrect information, comfortable living with more questions than answers. Adrian had watched world leaders up close, and that was how it was for most of them. They never had all the information they needed, and they knew it. When the time came to make a decision, they made the best one they could based on the available information and moved on. Adrian wasn't made that way. He was fine as an administrator, implementing other people's decisions, but to be the decision-maker, never knowing if his decisions were right or wrong, and then accepting the consequences of those decisions, that just wasn't who he was. It was a sobering realization. Two days later, the emissary asked him to set up a press conference. 21. Polite applause greeted Holly as she walked to the podium. The hotel was used to handling press conferences and had a space dedicated to that purpose, but they were unprepared for the horde of reporters that showed up for the emissary's first public appearance. Hundreds of media representatives from around the world had already been in Geneva, waiting to see what would unfold in the standoff between the aliens' emissary and the Council of Enclaves. According to Adrian, an overflow room was packed as well. Her security team was swamped, trying to screen everyone before letting them into the main room. Anna stood on the left side of the small stage, eyes scanning the crowd. Leon stood on the opposite side, also scanning the crowd. They both wore suits with body armor under their shirts. Tomas had tried to talk her into wearing a bulletproof vest, but she refused. Two more security people stood between her and the first row of journalists. She had been told that in the event of trouble, they would provide cover while Anna and Leon got her out of the room. They had even rehearsed it, so she would know what to expect. She felt silly doing it, and couldn't quite bring herself to believe it would ever come to that. It was just too surreal. She cleared her throat and took a sip of water from a bottle on the podium, and gave a nod to Sinta Alejandre, who was in the front row. Holly had insisted she get a front row seat and the first question. She owed her that much. Good evening, she said, a little surprised at how forceful and confident she sounded. Thank you for coming. I will read a brief statement and then take questions. Other than the rapid-fire stutter of cameras, the room was quiet, which she found unnerving. Her prepared remarks appeared on two teleprompters, one to the left of center 
and one to the right of center. Theo gave her a thumbs up from the side of the room where he stood next to Anna. She began. My name is Holly Burton. I am the alien's emissary. She paused for dramatic effect. Let me begin by correcting a misunderstanding about the alien. There is only one alien, not many. She paused again to let her audience absorb that revelation. He is an ancient explorer who has been wandering the furthest reaches of the universe for a very long time. Around the time our last Ice Age ended, he happened upon our world and took an interest in us. He has been watching us ever since. He calls himself the Fragment. The room was quiet. Even the cameras had stopped chattering. She had dropped two bombshells in the first thirty seconds. The Fragment has asked me to be his representative on Earth. I feel utterly unqualified for this task, which I neither asked for nor wanted. But who am I to argue with an ancient alien explorer? This produced some smiles and a smattering of chuckles. Twenty years ago, the Fragment initiated first contact with us in Singapore, using an unmanned, unarmed spacecraft. He requested a meeting with our world's leaders, intending to warn them about the Deathbringer, which we were not yet aware of. He hoped this existential crisis would force the people of Earth to pull together to meet the challenge of saving our species from extinction. A thermonuclear detonation ended that meeting before it began. Our astronomers eventually discovered the Deathbringer on their own. At first, the world's governments tried to hide that knowledge while they cast around for a way to deal with it. There was none. Perhaps if we had begun earlier, when the Fragment brought his warning, there would have been time to develop the technologies necessary to save our species. But we never heard the Fragment's warning, and by the time we discovered the Deathbringer for ourselves, it was too late. Rumors about a killer asteroid spread, as more and more astronomers, both professional and amateur, spotted the Deathbringer in the heavens. Sinta Alejandre broke the story in an interview with me, and also revealed that three space agencies were working together to build a spaceship that would carry a team of astronauts to Europa, a moon of Jupiter, where the Fragment had constructed a base. That spaceship was the Asimov. The program was called the Jupiter Mission. Its purpose was to engage with the aliens, who we believed to be more advanced than us, and to seek their help. I was one of the Jupiter Six who made that journey. She paused. The green lights on the cameras reminded her she was speaking to a larger audience than those in the room. Adrian had told her that several of the media giants would broadcast it live, and that the live audience could reach a billion and a half people. She hoped so. The entire world needed to hear what she had to say. All of this you already know. Now let me tell you the rest of the story. She took a sip of water. When we awoke from deep sleep on the Asimov, we discovered we were not at Europa, our intended destination, but Ganymede, another moon of Jupiter. The fragment had entered a course change into our navigational system during the voyage, while the crew was in deep sleep. Commander Tolya Fedorov, communications specialist Gina Walker, and I traveled to a base on Ganymede, where we met the fragment. It turns out there was a saboteur on the Asimov. Major Benjamin Clark, our pilot. There was also a nuclear device we did not know about. Major Clark took control of the Asimov, brought it into an orbit skimming the moon's surface, and detonated the nuclear device directly over the alien base. A year and a half later, I awoke on Titan, one of the moons of Saturn, a gas giant twice as far from Earth as Jupiter is. I was the only survivor of the attack on Ganymede. The fragment patched me up. His medical technology is literally out of this world and sent me back as his emissary to offer the human race the advanced technologies that will enable us to save ourselves. She stopped and looked around the room. I will take questions now. 
She pointed to the front row. Ms. Alejandre. She had caught Alejandre and everyone else off guard by ending so abruptly, with so much left unsaid, but the journalist recovered quickly. Dr. Burton, can you tell us more about the alien? Uh, for example, what does he look like? I don't know what he looks like. We humans live in a four-dimensional world made up of three spatial dimensions and one temporal. The fragment lives in more dimensions than that. All but the tiniest sliver of him exists outside our three-dimensional space-time continuum, and therefore outside our ability to perceive. Two hundred years ago, a school teacher named Edmund Abbott came up with an analogy that I find helpful for understanding higher dimensions. Imagine a two-dimensional world. Abbott calls it flatland. It has length and width, but no height. Imagine this world is populated by two-dimensional people. Let's call them flatlanders. Now, suppose a three-dimensional creature, like you or me, comes along and wants to interact with the flatlanders. How would he show himself to them? He might stand in a flatland pasture, but the flatlanders would only see a thin slice of the bottom of his feet, because they can't see in a third dimension. Furthermore, the feet would appear to be disconnected from each other, like two different creatures, and certainly wouldn't be recognizable as feet. Were he to touch the ground with a finger, it might appear as a dot, or maybe a circle, and would seem to have no connection with the feet. The Flatlanders might say, show us what you really look like, but he already is showing them what he looks like. The Flatlanders simply lack the capacity to see him as he really is. So it is with us and the Fragment. When we first met him on Ganymede, he chose to appear as an avatar, a man who would seem as human as anyone in this room. At first we thought he was human. Is that what he really looks like? No. But it provided a way for our two species to communicate. Beyond that, I can tell you he is extremely intelligent, has an in-depth understanding of us, having observed us for most of our species' history, and has chosen to make himself known because he is curious about what we would become as a species if we weren't about to become extinct. She took another sip of water. A man next to Sinta Alejandre stood and said, Vladimir and Alexei, Moscow International News. Dr. Burton, the Jupiter mission was predicated on the assumption that the Deathbringer is going to destroy our world, and there is nothing we can do about it without some help. I am sure you know that not everyone sees Earth's destruction as inevitable. There are some who believe we can stop it, or at least deflect it, on our own, without the help of the aliens. Others believe we can hide in underground bunkers and emerge after the Deathbringer has passed. We've all seen the end of the world vids, right? Indeed we have, she said with a smile. I wish this was one of those. She looked directly into one of the cameras at the back of the room. I want to be absolutely clear about this. The Deathbringer will destroy our world completely and irrevocably. When it leaves our solar system, Earth will no longer exist. Let me show you why that is. She brought up a diagram of the solar system on the screen behind her. The planets were represented by blue dots and were labeled. The scale required to show all eight planets made the inner system seem small and crowded. A prominent red dot appeared between the orbits of Neptune and Saturn. The red dot represents the Deathbringer. It is currently about two billion kilometers from Earth and is falling into our sun's gravity well, gaining speed as it does. At first, astronomers thought it was an asteroid, though it soon became apparent that it was too big to be an asteroid. It had to be a wandering planet, a Jupiter-sized one. There are lots of rogue planets wandering around our galaxy. Unfortunately, it is not a rogue planet, either. If it were an asteroid or a rogue planet, even a Jupiter-sized one, destroying or deflecting it might be a possibility. But it is neither. It is a star, 
specifically a brown dwarf, an aborted star that did not have enough initial mass to ignite its thermonuclear furnace and become a full-blown star like ours. This one has been wandering around for at least ten billion years, slowly cooling, getting darker and darker, which is one reason we didn't notice it until it was well into our solar system. It is about the same size as Jupiter, the largest planet in our solar system, but sixty-one times more massive. And therein lies the problem. Think of an automobile driving down the street at normal speed. It would take a fair amount of force to stop it or deflect it, but it could be done. Now imagine it is a runaway, fully loaded tractor-trailer rig. It would be a lot harder to stop, wouldn't it? Though still within the realm of possibility. Now imagine it is a runaway locomotive, barreling down the track at top speed. The Deathbringer is that locomotive, barreling down the track toward us. It is more massive than all the planets in our solar system put together, and it is coming at us at an incredibly high speed. There is nothing we can do to stop it, or even deflect it. It is simply too massive and has too much momentum. Were we to detonate all the nuclear weapons in the world at one place on its surface, it would hardly notice. Even the fragment cannot stop it. He may be more advanced than us, but he is not a god. There are things that even he cannot do, and this is one of those things. The Deathbringer is coming, and it brings with it the end of our world. A red line extended from the red dot, raced into the crowded inner system in a curving trajectory, arced around the sun, and left the solar system at a ninety-degree angle to its approach. As you can see, the Deathbringer's trajectory will bring it into the inner system, where it will swing around the sun and leave on a different trajectory. Its effect on the outer planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, will be negligible, because it will not come anywhere near them on its journey to the inner system. The inner system will not be so fortunate. She zoomed the view in on the four inner planets and the asteroid belt. The blue dots are the planets Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. You can see the asteroid belt at the outer edge of this view. It is located halfway between Mars and Jupiter. Now watch what will happen when the Deathbringer passes through the inner system. A red line entered from the left, clearing a path through a section of the asteroid belt. It passed by Mars, dragging it out of its orbit and throwing it out of the solar system. Earth was on the other side of the sun as the red line crossed its orbit, so Venus was the Deathbringer's next target. It collided head-on with the shrouded planet, leaving nothing but rubble behind. As it swung around the sun and headed back out into space, it swept past Earth, which it tossed into the sun, before leaving the solar system with Mercury and some rubble from Venus in tow. The inner system was gone, except for a storm of asteroids flying every which way. She ran the simulation backward and then forward again. The room was deathly quiet. A woman somewhere in the middle of the crowd said, How can the fragment save us from that? This was the question Holly had been waiting for. Up to this point, her presentation had been a dispassionate explanation of the situation. Now she began her appeal for action. The fragment can save some of us, but not all of us. She paused to let that sink in. It should be obvious by now that if we as a species have a future, it is not here. It is out there. She pointed toward the ceiling. If we are to survive the end of our world, we have to leave. The fragment will not intervene directly to save us. He has a kind of non-interference clause built into his moral value system that prohibits him from interfering with a natural course of events. Don't ask me to explain that, because I can't. However, he is willing to bend the rules a little and give us a small technological boost, something we likely would have achieved on our own if we had another hundred years or so and didn't spend it fighting among ourselves. 
something that will make it possible for a few of us to leave Earth before the end of the world. This technological boost will not solve our problems by itself. We will have to do the hard work of using that knowledge. The nations of the world will have to set aside their tribalism and animosities, pull together, and pour all their effort and resources into the greatest project humankind has ever undertaken. Anything less than this, and we will fail, and our species will become extinct. She looked around the room, then back at the cameras. Where will we go? We have two options. We can colonize the moons of Jupiter and Saturn, or we can leave our solar system and colonize worlds in other star systems. The fragment can recommend a few. In either case, it will not be possible to evacuate three billion people along with the supplies, animals, plants, infrastructure, and everything else we will need to start over somewhere else. Like Noah's Ark, only a few will be saved. A man in the back shouted, How many are a few? One hundred twenty thousand. This produced some murmuring. The man stood, held up his tablet, on which he had presumably done the math, and said, That's zero point zero one percent of the world's population. Yes, it is. What about the rest? They will die when the world ends. She expected a barrage of questions in response to this. Instead, she got more silence. Sinta Alejandre stood. Have you met with a council yet? Sinta no doubt knew the answer to this question, but she was giving Holly a chance to address it on her own terms. I have made several attempts to arrange a meeting with the Council of Enclaves, but have received no response, not even an acknowledgment that I am here. It is my understanding that two powerful alliances are stonewalling. She gave them a moment to absorb that. Everyone knew which two she was talking about. Frankly, that is why I am holding this press conference. The fragment has offered us the technology we need to survive as a species. This is too important to leave in the hands of a few politicians and strongmen, huddled behind closed doors, more worried about saving their piece of the pie than saving the species from extinction. This is a matter for the entire world to decide. This is a matter for you the citizens of the world, to decide. I call on you to demand that your leaders meet with me immediately so we can get on with the business of saving the human race. We do not have the luxury... The doors at the back of the room burst open, and a crowd of people dressed in black and wearing balaclavas forced their way into the room, shoving cameras and cameramen aside, hitting people with batons as they made their way toward Holly. She heard Theo's voice. Anna, get her out of here. 22. Holly froze, staring blankly at the chaos unfolding in front of her. Then Anna and Leon were beside her. Anna grabbed her arm with one hand, pushed her head down with the other, and proceeded to fast walk her away from the podium. Leon had his hand on her other arm. They picked up speed when they got to the hallway, forcing her to jog to keep up. It was uncomfortable, just like in the run-through, but at least she knew what to expect. Tomas fell in beside them, his head pivoting this way and that. He had a gun in his hand and was talking into his headset. Alpha team, meet us at the back entrance and form up around the principal. Get the car ready. Beta team, see to the secondaries. Overwatch, check our route. She only vaguely understood what he was saying, but three heavily armed men and women appeared seemingly out of nowhere and crowded around them as they moved out of the building and into the parking lot. She felt like a football in a rugby scrum. A car was waiting for them. Somebody opened the back door, and Anna unceremoniously shoved her into the back seat, then followed her in. She was vaguely aware of Leon climbing into the front passenger seat. Buckle up, Anna said as she pulled the car door shut behind them. She slapped the driver's shoulder and said, Go! Then she tapped her headset. Principal is secured and away. Holly was thrown back into the seat as the vehicle sped away from the site of her press conference, which had gone somewhat differently than she had expected. 
she fumbled with the seat belt until Anna reached over and locked it for her. What about the others? We have a team assigned to them. They'll be fine. Who were those people? Suddenly she burst into tears for no apparent reason. I'm sorry, she sobbed, covering her face with her hands. Anna put a hand on her arm. It's all right, ma'am. It's just adrenaline overload. You're safe now. We had a contingency plan for this situation, and— The driver interrupted. Overwatch is redirecting us. Anna tapped her headset and listened for a few moments, which gave Holly time to get herself under control. Here she was, the fragment's emissary sent to save the world, hunkered down in the back seat of a car, crying her head off. How great was that? Not to mention embarrassing. Overwatch? She didn't really care, but it seemed like she should make some effort to understand what was going on around her. She was having trouble keeping her eyes open and felt like a limp rag. Ma'am, Anna shook her shoulder. Ma'am, are you all right? Her head cleared, and she found herself wide awake and alert, almost euphoric. The nanites must have flooded her bloodstream with something. Anna was peering at her with a concerned look. So was Leon. Yeah, I'm okay. Sorry about that. They both looked relieved. To answer your question, Anna said carefully, Overwatch is a team in a helicopter, our eyes in the sky. There is an accident on Highway 1, blocking all lanes. Overwatch is redirecting us to an alternate route. Are we going back to the house? Yes. What about the others? She had already asked this question. Why was she repeating herself? Anna answered calmly with no sign of reproach. They will meet us there. Another wave of clarity washed over her. The nanites must be working overtime to keep her from going into shock. She put her hand on her amulet and formed a thought. Gabriel. I am here, the A.I. said in her mind. What can you tell me about the accident on Highway 1? It is a diversion to force you onto an alternate route. Anna, she said as calmly as she could, doesn't it strike you as odd that a major accident would happen on our planned route, just as we made our getaway from an attack at the hotel? Leon jerked his head around to look at her. Anna gave her a searching look. Do you know something we don't? It just seems like an unlikely coincidence. She tapped her headset. Overwatch, this is Lindstrom. How likely is it that the accident is a diversion? She listened for a few moments. The primary asked. A few more moments passed, then the SUV made an abrupt sharp turn down a side street, throwing Holly against the car door. Another turn a few blocks later threw her the other way, almost into Anna's lap. They pulled into a parking lot, throwing gravel in a wide arc as the vehicle spun around so that it was facing the driveway. They were in a park. The sun had gone down, but the park was well lit. There were children playing, hovering mothers turned as one to face the offending vehicle. What's going on? she asked. She wished she had a headset. We are going to wait here while another team checks out the alternate route, Anna said, just to be sure. There sure were a lot of teams. Anna listened to her headset some more, frowned, and glanced at Holly. You were right. Two vehicles were waiting for us three miles further on. They fled when they realized they were up against a heavily armed security team instead of the fragment's emissary. She grinned. Who are you talking to? Tomas. He told us to go with your hunch. She gave Holly another searching look, but Holly just shrugged her shoulders. Can we go home now? I'm exhausted and just— Leon interrupted. Overwatch says an unidentified vehicle is approaching our location at high speed. Holly peered at the front window into the growing darkness. A vehicle whipped around the corner and headed for the park. It was moving fast. Overwatch, this is Lindstrom, Anna said in a calm, almost casual voice. We have an incoming threat. How far away are reinforcements? I see. We're going to make a break for it. What do you advise? Got it. Can you run interference for us? 
Leon said to the driver, Showtime, Harry. Bump and run. Everybody buckle up and hang on, the driver said. Things are going to get interesting now. Things were already way past interesting as far as Holly was concerned, but maybe the people charged with protecting her had a different scale for measuring such things. An unexpected chortle bubbled up from her throat. She slapped her hand over her mouth. Gravel spat out behind them as the vehicle's wheels spun. Holly was thrown back into her seat when the wheels found traction, and they accelerated toward the oncoming headlights. Both vehicles reached the driveway of the park at the same time. The other vehicle made a wide turn to avoid a collision. Holly's driver turned toward it at the last moment and rammed it just behind the back wheels. Holly was jerked to the left and then to the right as they bounced away and onto the road. Apparently, that was the bump part of a bump and run, and now they were doing the run part. She wasn't sure, but she thought the other vehicle was left doing donuts in the gravel lot. She hoped nobody in the park got hurt. Anna looked out the back window. They are pursuing. She nodded at something someone was saying through the headset. Leon said, Nice job, Harry. That's what they pay me the big bucks for. What? You get big bucks. I'm going to have to complain about that. About me getting big bucks? No, about me getting mediocre bucks. Gosh, Leon, I'm real sorry to hear that. Holly guessed they were doing fifty when they reached the intersection with the main road. Her driver didn't bother slowing down for either the stop sign or the turn, but barreled around the corner alternated between the brake and the accelerator to execute a turn that Holly would not have thought possible at that speed. For a moment, they seemed to move sideways. Then the vehicle straightened out with a jerk, and the engine whined as they picked up speed. Harry glanced at the rearview mirror. Pussies! He had a German accent she had not noticed before. Maybe it came out when he was under stress, or was having fun. She craned her neck around to look out the back window. Their pursuers were far behind them. Apparently, their driver hadn't been willing to take the corner as fast as her driver had. Here comes the cavalry, Leon said. Two sets of headlights appeared in front of them and sped past in a blur. They'll handle our pursuers, Leon said. Let's get the primary back to the compound. Holly caught Harry's eye in the rearview mirror. That would be you, ma'am, he said. She tried to smile, but suspected it came out more like a grimace. Don't encourage him, Anna said. He's having altogether too much fun as it is. Holly made a wild guess that this was not the first operation they had worked together on. They eventually reached the turnoff for Theo's estate and turned into the drive that led to the mansion. The media encampment was deserted. Presumably, they were all at the hotel. Two police officers manned the gatehouse. Her driver slowed to a stop about ten meters from them. Anna, he said. Anna was quiet for a moment. I don't like it. She tapped her headset. This is Lindstrom. There are two police officers at the gatehouse. Our security is not in evidence. The police officers pulled their guns, took aim with both hands on their guns, and flexed a little at the knees just like real police. Vehicle behind us, Harry said. Holly started to turn around to look, but Anna reached over, released her seatbelt, and pushed her into the footwell. Stay there, she said. She took out her gun. Overwatch, Anna said. We are trapped on the road into the estate. Two gunmen dressed like police officers in front of us. An SUV behind us. Three people have gotten out of the SUV, weapons out, one has a long gun. She listened and said, Understood. Then, Let's do it, Harry. The car jumped forward, and Holly heard bullets pinging off the windshield. Then they were out from under the trees that lined the road and into the open area in front of the mansion. She felt the car spinning. Then it stopped. Anna opened the door and rolled out onto the gravel driveway, coming up on one knee with her gun out in front. She fired three times in quick succession. Holly was vaguely aware that Leon was out of the car on the other side, also firing his gun. Then, 
loud automatic gunfire erupted, seemingly right above them, followed by an explosion. The car rocked violently, as though someone had rammed it. The gunfire stopped. Anna stood, swinging her gun this way and that. You okay, ma'am? It was her driver, Harry. He was looking down at her from the front seat. I think so. Looks like it's over, but you should stay where you are until Anna says it's okay to get out. He seemed totally calm. She was anything but calm. Her mind kept replaying bits and pieces of the car chase and the firefight in no particular order. She said, It was just supposed to be a press conference. What was that, ma'am? Nothing. Just talking to myself. Hey, whatever brings you back to ground. Anna appeared at the car door. You can sit up, ma'am, but I'd like you to stay in the vehicle. Holly crawled onto the seat and looked around. A helicopter circled above, a heavy caliber gun pointing out an open door. There were three pockmarks on the car's windshield, which was apparently bulletproof. A vehicle was on fire at the edge of the trees. There were bodies on the ground, and the smell of gunpowder and burning flesh in the air. Whoever they were, she said, I guess they picked a fight with the wrong people. Harry laughed, a little louder than seemed necessary. Maybe it was part of his getting back to ground, whatever that meant. That they did, ma'am. That they did. Anna slid in beside her and closed the door. Leon stood outside with his gun still out. Another SUV came down the road, maneuvered around the burning vehicle, and drove up behind them. It disgorged four heavily armed men who assumed a defensive perimeter around her vehicle, assault rifles out and at the ready. They looked like they meant business. Another vehicle drove in, and four more armed security people climbed out, including Tomas. He wore body armor like the rest of them, and carried what looked like a short-barreled shotgun. She reached for the door handle, but Anna stopped her. We wait for Tomas to give us the all-clear. Tomas did a slow 360 scan of the immediate vicinity and sent three men into the house. Ten minutes later, they returned and talked with him. He tapped his headset and said something. We can get out now, Anna said. On my side, if you don't mind. Anna holstered her weapon and stepped out of the vehicle. Holly followed, feeling more than a little intimidated by all the firepower on display. All for her. A movement on the roof caught her eye. It was a man with a rifle. Fear flashed through her. Sniper, Anna said. One of ours. She took a deep breath and let it out slowly. This was definitely not what she had expected when she got out of bed this morning. Anna gently took her arm and walked her through the entrance and into the entry hall. Leon was right behind them. He had put his gun away. Holly started down the hall. Ma'am, where are you going? Anna said. She turned around to face her. The ladies' room, if that's all right with you. And my protection detail. And the sniper on the roof. Should I get permission from Tomas? It came out bitchier than she had intended, powered by a surge of anger. She wasn't sure where it came from. There was no reason for her to snap at the people who had probably saved her life. Anna seemed not to notice, or, more likely, decided to ignore it. I'll come with you, she said cheerfully. I could use a bio-break after all that excitement. When they got back to the drawing room, they found Tomas, Theo, Robert, and Adrian engaged in a heated conversation. Leon was nowhere to be seen. Inside information, Theo was saying a little too loudly. They knew our primary and secondary routes. They had backup contingencies. Tomas's calm voice replied, We don't know that. Our primary route was obvious. Our secondary route might have been a good guess, or maybe they had several alternate routes covered. In any case, Theo said, it was a well-planned, well-executed attempt on the emissary's life. Should we move her someplace else? Robert said. I don't know where. They stopped talking and turned to face her when she walked in. They were all standing. She walked across the room with as much dignity as she could muster. Her legs were rubbery. 
and sat in the corner chair she was coming to think of as her own. Maybe someone should ask the primary where she wants to be kept, she said. Though I suppose any old bunker will do, as long as I can get pizza delivered. Anna took her usual place behind and to one side of her. We were just talking about how to keep you safe, sis, Robert said. Things have escalated to a whole other level. Holly snorted. I already have so much security I'm feeling claustrophobic. I can't even go to the bathroom without an armed guard. She waved a hand in Anna's direction. So if you all don't mind, I'd like to stay where I am. She held up a hand to forestall objections. I can't do what I need to do if I'm hiding. I need to talk to people, and people need to talk to me. That includes everyday normal people on the street, and press conferences and meetings, and world leaders, business and industry leaders, and religious leaders. She stopped to catch her breath. That means I am going to be in harm's way, and that's just the way it is. Besides, I want to go shopping tomorrow. She paused to take in the horrified looks. You'll all just have to make sure nobody gets a clear shot at me. She smirked, though it wasn't really funny. Apparently, there were people out there who would like nothing better than to see her dead. She felt lightheaded. Whatever her nanites had done to get her through the crisis was wearing off. She turned to Anna. I'd like to go to my room. She stood. Now, if you gentlemen will excuse me. Anna caught her arm as she stumbled, but she managed to remain on her feet. She was absolutely not going to faint in front of everyone. 23. Anna accompanied the emissary upstairs to her room. Robert followed them into the room, but Anna gave him a meaningful look. Let me know if you need anything, he said as he retreated back into the hall. The emissary waved her hand in his direction without looking and sat on the edge of the bed. She began unbuttoning her blouse, looked down at her shoes, and then up at Anna. Can you help me with my shoes? Anna tugged her shoes and stockings off and helped her out of her blouse and skirt. She crawled under the covers, and a few minutes later her breathing became slow and regular. Anna sat on a padded chair near the French doors. The emissary was a cipher. According to the dossier Tomas had given her, she was a strong, confident, self-sufficient woman who rarely needed help from anyone and did not readily ask for help when she did. A classic overachiever, successful in everything she attempted, chosen to be one of the Jupiter Six, recruited by an alien being to be his representative on Earth, tasked with convincing the world to abandon what it had been doing for the last ten thousand years and start doing something else. Yet she needed her PPI's help to get undressed. Not that she held that against her. This was probably the first time in her life she had experienced anything like what happened today. All things considered, she had acquitted herself well. Now that the threat was over, she had crashed, physically and emotionally. An adrenaline overload could do that to you if you didn't know how to handle it. It was no surprise she was sound asleep now. Her body knew what she needed. This was not Anna's first assignment. The job sometimes required her to be more than a bodyguard. In many ways, it was an intimate job, if only because of her constant proximity to her principal. A PPI saw every side of the principal, the good and the bad alike. That made for a difficult balancing act, how to be there for the principal, while still maintaining the professional distance needed to do your job well. Social media was awash with rumors and conspiracy theories about the emissary. In the absence of facts, people made stuff up. One particularly persistent rumor claimed she was not human at all, that she was some kind of android impersonating the real Holly Burton, that the real Holly Burton had died with the rest of the Jupiter Six at Ganymede. Anna was a skeptical person by nature, and generally dismissed conspiracy theories out of hand for the simple reason that they were almost always wrong. She also considered herself a good judge of people, and was pretty sure the emissary was the real deal. The woman put on a good face in front of others, 
but behind the persona, she was as vulnerable and flawed as anyone, maybe more so than most. Things had gotten a little wild today, and she'd had a few bumpy moments, but she had held it together. Anna did not know whether she was disappointed or reassured by this. Her charge was more fragile than the people she usually protected, less experienced with a cutthroat world of movers and shakers, less hard-nosed, not so tough-skinned. She was also an emotionally wounded person. That much was obvious from even a cursory reading of her dossier. Brilliant, to be sure, but damaged. Anna was older than her principal. She had never had children, but something about this woman made her want to protect her, the way she imagined a mother would protect her children. It was turning out to be a more complicated assignment than she had expected. A knock came at the door. Her hand went reflexively to the weapon at her side. Who is it? Theo and Robert. Come. They let themselves in. Robert walked over to his sister and stood over her sleeping form. Theo sat on a chair on the other side of a small table from Anna. How is she? She's fine. The anxiety of the press conference, the stress of a high-octane car chase, bullets flying, and explosions, it all put her into a serious fight-or-flight mode. She must have gotten some training somewhere on how to manage that, because she handled it better than I would have expected. She held it together until we got back here. Then the emotional bottom dropped out from under her. Nothing unusual about that. Sleep is the best thing for her. He nodded absently. Robert joined them. After a while, Theo said, Robert and I are going to the council building tomorrow morning to confront Madura Singe about why he is stonewalling us. I'm pretty sure I know the answer, and I suspect the press conference shook things up over there. I want to get the lay of the land before we do anything else. Anna didn't say anything. He was not soliciting her opinion, and he certainly didn't need her permission. He was just informing her they would be away from the compound in the morning. There is something you should know about Holly, he said. He looked at Robert. Robert said, We decided you should know that the fragment gave Holly millions, maybe billions, of microscopic nanites that patrol her body looking for things to fix and invaders to kill. There probably isn't a disease or poison in the world that can harm her. Their primary purpose is to keep her healthy. And young. I'm sure you noticed she looks younger than she is. That's the nanites. Only Theo, Tomas, and I know this. And Holly, of course. And now you. Okay, she said. She has an army of teeny-tiny alien machines running around inside her. I think I get that. She didn't, but it didn't matter. It was what it was. They also keep her internal chemistry in balance. I suspect that's what you saw, right after we left the press conference, when she lost it for a moment, and then seemed to pull herself together. The nanites balanced her internal chemistry, to keep her alert, and to keep her from going into shock. The fragment has not left her without resources. Are you sure she needs a PPI? He smiled at this. The nanites are pretty much limited to taking care of her physical body. She still needs protection. I doubt her nanites could do anything about a bullet through the head. She is also going to need friends in the days ahead, Theo said. And, as you have probably surmised by now, she does not make friends easily. We are hoping you will become her confidant, maybe even her friend. She looked toward the sleeping form on the bed. I have come to the same conclusion. It's a tricky thing to balance. If I lose professional distance, it will reduce my effectiveness as her PPI. What does Tomas think? Tomas thinks you are up to it. Okay, then. Friendly PPI it is. After they left, Anna turned out the lights and moved through the bathroom to her room. She got herself ready for bed and brought up her personal feed. There was a vid mail from her mother. It was only a few hours to Stockholm by air, then two hours by train to Norshopping, where she grew up and where her mother still lived. 
but it had been a few years since she had been home. Her parents had never understood why she joined the Army and then the Special Operations Group. Whenever she returned home on leave, she found herself defending her decision all over again. It got worse when she left the Army and became a contractor. After a few more painful visits, she stopped going home. Even vidcoms were minefields. They only communicated by vidmail these days, and that not very often. The message was brief, her mother pleading for her to come home, and finally breaking down in tears. Funny how a little thing like the end of the world could change things. Anna had already decided this would be her last assignment. Then she would go home. But that wasn't likely to happen soon. Her assignments normally lasted anywhere from a few weeks to a few months. Then she would take a vacation and move on to the next assignment. She was good at what she did, and her services were in demand. She had protected all sorts of people—athletes, politicians, celebrities, actors, billionaires. She prided herself on being able to understand her clients on their own terms, to get inside their heads— to be able to predict what they would do in any situation. This assignment was different, though. The emissary wasn't like any of the other people she had protected. She represented humanity's last, best chance to survive. She alone could provide the knowledge they needed to build ships and space stations and whatever else they needed to escape the doomed planet, and her task would not be finished until 120,000 people had left Earth. A remnant of humanity. The future of the human race. In the meantime, she needed a protector. A protector for the end of the world. She opened a connection to her mom's house. It pinged for several seconds. She was probably in bed. She was about to disconnect when a voice spoke on the other end. Anna? Her mother's image filled the screen. Hi, Mama. I was so worried. I saw you on the feed, at the woman's press conference. Uh, Hillary or something. Holly, Mama. Holly Burton. Yes, well, is she really an emissary from the aliens? Yes, she is. Is what she says about the end of the world true? Yes, it's all true. My goodness, that's just... What happened at the end? All I saw was you and her and a crowd of armed men rushing you out of the room. Are you and this Burton woman all right? We are fine. It was just some thugs who decided to break up a press conference. Well, they certainly did that, didn't they? People are so rude these days. We got the emissary back to the compound we are staying at. She is sleeping now. You should be, too. Her mother frowned. I take it you are one of her bodyguards or something. Though there were a lot of people with guns around her. Even Nielsen doesn't have security like that. Anna laughed. It felt good to laugh with her mother. Actually, he does, Mama. They maintain a low profile, so you don't notice them. So what exactly do you do? I am her PPI, her personal protection individual. I make sure she is safe at all times. I go everywhere she goes. Her bedroom and mine share a bathroom. Is it dangerous? Yes, it is. She paused. I am very good at it. She and her mother stared at each other for a few moments. You look good, her mom said. That was unexpected. So do you, Mama. When are you coming home? That was the question she didn't want to deal with, but it was the reason she had called. I don't think I will come home soon. I hope to come home before the end, so we can be together at, you know, the end. There was another pause. A tear ran down her mother's cheek. It's this emissary woman, isn't it? Right now, she may be the most important person in the world. I can't walk away. Not with all that is at stake. Can she save us? Some of us. Will she save you? Anna had not thought about that. It was a good question. 
Presumably, the emissary would go with the few who would leave Earth, and it was reasonable to assume that she would take her key people with her to help her establish Humanity 2.0. She would have to ask about that. Maybe she could take her mother with her. Anna? Sorry, Mama. I don't know if I will be among those who leave. I don't even know if the emissary will go with them. She's the kind of person who might decide to stay behind with the rest of humanity. I haven't asked. Right now, I'm just doing my best to keep her safe. They sat in silence for a few seconds. Then her mother said, I am tired, dear. I think I'll go back to bed now. Mama, do you understand? Yes, Anna. I understand why you can't come home just yet. Keep that emissary woman safe. I am proud of you. And Anna? Yes. I love you. I love you too, Mama. 24. Two days later, Holly found herself sitting next to Secretary General Gavesh Madurasinghe in the Council of Enclave's chamber. Her press conference had the desired effect. The attack on her personally, which went viral, probably didn't hurt either. According to Madura Singe, some members of the council were unhappy with the emissary for forcing their hand, but they were here, and so was she, and that was what mattered. The circular seating arrangement of the council chamber was loosely modeled after the old United Nations Security Council chamber. The leaders of the alliances were present. Together, they spoke for fifty-four enclaves, representing a billion or so people. The remaining two billion people on Earth lived outside the enclaves, and had no voice on the Council for the simple reason that none of the warlords could speak for more than the few thousand outsiders they happened to rule over at any given time. The enclaves made trade agreements with nearby warlords, and Holly hoped she could persuade the enclaves to include some of them in the remnant of humanity that would leave Earth. It would be a tough sell. There were two seats behind each of them, and three seats behind those, forming two concentric circles around the council members. Theo and Adrian sat behind Holly, Robert, Tomas, and Anna behind them. There were no empty seats. In theory, weapons were not allowed in the council chamber, but nobody checked for weapons when they came in. They weren't even scanned. Holly assumed each world leader present had one or more armed bodyguards in his or her contingent. Tomas and Anna were certainly armed. Hopefully, the adage, an armed society is a polite society, would hold true in this setting. Inside the circle, in a space called the Pit, five men and women sat around a table in front of terminals. They handled administrative and clerical functions. Holly's tablet was connected to the local network so she could pass information to them, such as images she might want to put up on the large vid screen on the wall behind her. Dr. Madurasinga spoke into his microphone. I call this meeting of the Council of Enclaves to order. Without objection, we will dispense with a reading of minutes from the last meeting, as well as all other business except the matter that has brought us together today. He looked around and said, So ordered. There are two items on the agenda for this session. The first is to receive Dr. Holly Burton's credentials as the Fragments Emissary. The chair recognizes President Deng Wei of the People's Republic of China. President Deng was a young-looking man, five seats to her right. Thank you, Mr. Secretary-General, he said, then bowed his head toward Holly. Dr. Burton, I bid you a warm welcome from the People's Republic of China, whose space station was honored to be your first point of contact upon your return to Earth. He nodded to someone in the pit, and an image appeared on the big screen. It also appeared on a vid screen built into the desk in front of Holly. It contained the wording of his motion— which he read aloud. The People's Republic of China moves that the Council recognize Dr. Holly Margaret Burton as the emissary of the fragment, 
the alien who currently inhabits the moons of Jupiter, and that she be granted credentials of full ambassadorship to this body, which ambassadorship includes this body's recognition that she will speak for the fragment and will convey back to the fragment the deliberations and decisions of this body. He sat down, and Madura Singa said, The chair recognizes Prime Minister Galal of the African Federation. Thank you, Mr. Secretary General, said the short, bald-headed man seated to Holly's immediate left. The African Federation seconds the motion and moves for a vote of unanimous consent. Objection! The deep and distinctly British voice came from three seats to Holly's left. The chair recognizes Prime Minister Weatherford of Great Britain. Holly looked back at Theo, who leaned forward and spoke into her ear. At this point, everything is pretty much scripted. Everyone knows the CRA opposes any form of official recognition, and that its objection would come either through the Brits or Aussies. Arguments for and against will be laid out, and a vote will be called. They will approve your credentials by a vote of nine to three, or possibly eight to four. But before that, everybody gets to say their little piece, mostly for the folks back home. Why am I even here for this part? she asked. To practice sitting through long, boring meetings. A skill you will have to cultivate in the months and years ahead. It's a lot of bureaucratic bullshit, if you ask me, she said. Prime Minister Galal, sitting to her immediate left, tried to suppress a smile. Weatherford said, Great Britain objects, on the basis that we have no proof that Dr. Burton can speak for the aliens. This provoked a somewhat heated debate that began civilly enough, but soon degenerated into a shouting match. After twenty minutes of vitriol, only some aimed at her, Holly had had enough. Theo must have sensed what was coming, because his hand came to rest on her shoulder. Please, don't do anything rash, he said. She glanced at him and stood. The president of the Russian Federation happened to be speaking at that moment. He noticed her and stopped talking. The room was quiet. Forgive the interruption, President Novikov. She looked around the circle of world leaders, suddenly aware that her legs were trembling. Adrenaline rush time. Maybe she should have remained seated, but it was too late for that now. With all due respect, ladies and gentlemen, this is bullshit. I don't have time for it, and more important, neither do you. She took a deep breath and let it out slowly to calm herself. The fragment sent me back to Earth with a proposal for giving us certain advanced technologies that will enable us to save our species from extinction. Time is of the essence. Already you have wasted three weeks of my time and the world's time by stonewalling my appearance here. This is not the time for business as usual. Every hour spent in meetings like this brings the Deathbringer an hour closer and reduces the time we have to prepare and the number of people we can save. You, the world's leaders, need to decide whether you want to save the human race or continue playing petty power games. You can't have it both ways. Several people started to speak, but she held up both hands to stop them. I didn't ask to be the Fragment's emissary. That was his idea. Frankly, I don't give a damn whether you formally recognize me as his emissary. I don't need your recognition. I don't need your honorifics. I don't need credentials. That spaceship up there in orbit is all the credentials I need. That, and the knowledge I offer that just might save our species. So you can continue doing whatever it is you think is more important than the business of saving humanity, but I have better things to do. I will be at Ambassador Peter's home when you are ready to have a serious conversation. She turned to her delegation and said, We are leaving. They recovered their composure and stood with her. Madura Singe was on his feet. He placed a hand on Holly's arm and said, Dr. Burton, please. The voice of President Vasquez of Patagonia rang out. This is an outrage. I demand an apology. Vasquez, sit down and shut the fuck up, said Marna Acker, a short, overweight woman. 
Mr. General Secretary, I move to end debate on the motion before us. Madura Singe quickly said, Is there a second? Someone shouted, Second! Those in favor? Holly turned to face the council. Hands went up. A young man at the table in the middle of the circle stood and did a quick count. Eight votes in favor, he announced. Opposed? Madura Singa said. Four hands went up. The Christian Republic of America, England, Mexico, and Australia. Four opposed, the young man said. The motion is carried. Holly sat down and drained half a bottle of water someone had placed on her desk earlier. Madura Singa said, Motion to end debate is carried. We will now vote on the motion to recognize Dr. Burton as the fragment's emissary. All in favor? Eight hands went up. Opposed? Three hands went up. Abstain? The President of the Republic of Australia raised his hand. The motion is carried with eight in favor, three opposed, and one abstaining. Theo said into Holly's ear, My God, Holly, there were half a dozen ways to accomplish that, and you just had to pick the most offensive one. I wanted to make sure they did not think this was just another business-as-usual meeting of the council, and that was the only way I could think of to do it. Well, I think you have their attention now. Madura Singa leaned toward Holly and placed his hand over her microphone. Dr. Burton, would you like to take a short break at this point? It would give everyone a chance to cool down. Before she could answer, Theo said, The emissary's proposal is brief. It will take only a few minutes. Perhaps she should present it now, and then we can adjourn to give everyone time to review it. What do you think, Madam Emissary? That sounds good to me she said. After the break, I can entertain questions. Pertaining to the proposal, Theo interjected, nothing else. Madura Singa addressed the council. The emissary will now present the proposal from the fragment, after which we will adjourn for one hour. When we return, she will entertain questions pertaining to the proposal. He turned to her. Madam Emissary, the floor is yours. Holly transferred a copy of the proposal from her tablet to the local network, and a moment later it appeared on the big screen behind her. The document she and the fragment had come up with was titled Agreement for the Transfer of Technology from the Fragment to the Human Race. There was no doubt in her mind that every article in the proposal would offend them. Theo and Adrian had made several suggestions to make it more palatable, all of which she had rejected. She began. I am sure you have all seen the vid of my press conference, where I spelled out the existential threat the Deathbringer represents. Let me emphasize that there is nothing we can do to save Earth from annihilation. The only hope for our species is to leave Earth and venture into space. We do not currently have the technology to accomplish this on our own, nor do we have enough time to develop it on our own, which is where the Fragment's proposal comes in. The Fragment will not save us, but he will give us the knowledge we need to save ourselves. On the screen behind me is the agreement under which the Fragment will make this knowledge available to the human race. It is spelled out in six articles which I will read. Article 1. Dr. Holly Margaret Burton hereafter known as the emissary, will be the single point of contact between the fragment and the human race in all matters, including, but not limited to, the transfer of alien technology. She paused and looked up from her desk. A hand went up. If you don't mind, she said, please hold questions until the end. I pause only to give you time to absorb the full import of each article. The hand went down. Thank you she said. Article 2. All hostile actions toward the Fragment and his emissary will cease. The Council of Enclaves will assume responsibility for ensuring that any future hostilities are dealt with promptly and decisively. In the event that the Council is unable or unwilling to enforce this provision, 
the emissary will do so as she sees fit. She looked up at her audience again. Theo was right. She had their attention. Article 3. Alien technology will be provided to the human race on an as-needed basis, the schedule to be determined by the emissary. Article 4. Alien technology will be provided freely to the entire world. No preference will be given to any enclave or alliance of enclaves. There will be no hoarding of knowledge. She paused at the sound of people shifting in their chairs. She knew all six articles would be controversial, but Article 4 was likely to be the one they would have the most difficulty accepting. It meant nobody would have an advantage over anybody else. Article 5. The human race is responsible for the effective use of alien technology to save itself from extinction. The fragment will not save humanity from itself. That one would raise some questions. Article 6. Matters not spelled out in this agreement will be resolved by the emissary as she sees fit. She looked up. All eyes were on her. When we return from the break, I will answer questions pertaining to the proposal. Please bear in mind that this is the fragment's proposal. While I am willing to consider changes, I am unlikely to accept them. She turned to Madura Singha. Thank you, Mr. Secretary-General. Madura Singha called for a recess.